pleasure and the, and the honor to welcome you all to this uh, PhD day. This is actually the first PhD day that gathers together all four PhD courses of the University of Urbino. Um, before starting, please let me thank all the people who made this conference possible. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Dean of the University, Professor Giorgio um, Calcagnini, who has greatly supported this initiative. I would also like to thank the coordinators of all, uh, of all four doctoral courses of the, of the University of Urbino. I would also like to thank the teaching managers and the four PhD representatives and all the PhD students who have been involved in the organization of this meeting. Um, I would also like to uh, welcome Professor Eliana Lumiento, who is here and uh, who will um, uh, introduce, uh, I mean, who will, is here to uh, bring her greeting, uh, greetings. And um, she is the Dean's Delegate for Higher Education. I also would like to thank um, Professor Elena Viganò, Vice Dean for Sustainability and Inclusiveness and Valorization of the Differences. Last but not least, I'd like to thank and acknowledge all the technical and administrative staff, and in particular, I'd like to thank our webmaster, Dr. Donatello Trisolino. Um, Let's start. Today is a very busy day. Um, I have the honor now to hand you over to uh, Professor Vieri Fusi. But before I do this, I just take a little bit of time for a brief introduction. Um, this day is dedicated to PhD students. Getting a PhD is much more than getting a final degree. It's a um, process and a journey that uh, is about the pursuit of knowledge, but also about personal growth and discovery. You know, driven by the love of hunt for new ideas, the purpose of a PhD should be um, uh, to add something new to your field. And to do so, you need to ask new or different questions and approach subjects from different perspectives. In this way, through research, you will eventually succeed in filling some gaps in your discipline. Um, as part of this journey, sharing your research and discuss your results with peers, it's fundamental learning opportunity and getting feedbacks on your research and build collaboration, a network of, of collaboration and see what other people are working on is really important. Today's conference aims to connect PhD students from different research areas. Like I said, this is the very first opportunity where all the, the PhD courses of the, the University of Urbino are gathered together. Um, so today, the students uh, will have the opportunity to share and present their work in short talks as well as posters. Before start, starting, let's just, um, uh, rem uh, like just to remind you that smoking is forbidden, also in the garden area. This is something that we really care about. Now, um, okay, now let's move on. I have the honor now to hand you over to Professor Vieri Fusi. Thank you very much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. Um, I'm here to, to bring you the greetings of the university, of our rector, Professor Giorgio Cancanini, obviously my personal greetings. Um, when I <coughs> was coming here, I just uh, go to remember my PhD time, and so yesterday, no? <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I, and I, I was ex very, really excited in, in, the, in, the, in that time. So I, I wish you the, the same, uh, to be enthusiastic to have this uh, occasion. And, and this is really an occasion, an occasion for you. No, no, no more. I, I saw that the, the, the schedule is re really intense. So. Uh, have a good day, uh, full of uh, sharing idea, and uh, buona giornata. Thank you very much for joining us today, Professor Vieri Fusi. Um, I'd like now to hand you over. We are honored to welcome Professor Liana Lumiento. Dean's Delegate for Higher Education. Thank you very much. 
<coughs> magnificent rector who is ideally <laughs> with us, uh, esteemed vice-rector, esteemed doctoral course coordinators, dear doctoral students, I'm very pleased to be able to greet you and wish you well on the occasion of this meeting of all the doctoral students of our university in my capacity as rector's delegate for higher education. The ambitious aim of this day is to facilitate interaction between the disciplines that are the subjects of research in the doctoral courses hosted by our university. PhD of biomolecular and health sciences, including a wide range of disciplines and areas out of life science and physical sciences and engineering. The PhD of global studies, economy, society and law, which focuses on the economic, social, political and legal aspects of globalization processes. The PhD in, uh, of humanities, focusing on languages, literature, philologies, historical and philosophical disciplines, cultural and communication disciplines, pedagogical and psychological disciplines, in the frame of a broad span of time from the ancient Greek world to contemporary societies. The PhD of research methods in science and technology covering the three research areas of chemistry, earth sciences and formal models, data analysis and scientific computing, this latter also covering big data management. On this day, therefore, doctoral students will meet whose research, which in fact is underpinned by the same scientific method, spans disciplines that are very distant from each other and seemingly difficult to bring into di direct dialogue. It is an enthralling challenge which will perhaps help to make the barriers between knowledge less rigid. In a perspective of inter and transdisciplinarity, as well as to foster sharing and awareness of the wealth of insights that reality can offer to research, and the appropriateness and beauty of each research. With the hope, therefore, that today's occasion will turn into a creative occasion precisely because of the sharing and confrontation, I thank the magnificent director who has been a convinced promoter of the organization of this event and our young colleagues, the doctoral students, who today will be the animators and protagonists of it. Thank you all and good work. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's now um, time to hand you over to the coordinators of the doctoral schools of the University of Urbino. Um, let's start with the first doctoral course in biomolecular and health sciences. Uh, unfortunately, Professor Marco Rocchi couldn't be here today, so I hand you over to Professor Elena Barbieri. Thank you, thank you, Manuela. It's a real pleasure for me to be here today. Marco uh, cannot be here at the moment. Uh, he will be here later on, and I bring uh, the, his uh, greetings for the day. Today is really explore, share, inspire, and is uh, the day for the PhD students. We start last year with the first uh, event, it was the zero event, supported by the dean of the Ateneum. He asked to organize an event that could involve all the courses from the Ateneum. Today, in particular, we will have the support of the communication office and um, the PhD, they will be live story. Live story with the social channels. So I really thank uh, the support for the communication office and um, there are connection with the social channel uh, channels uh, of the university. And um, that is something important also for the young PhD researcher that um, uh, they know that uh, YouTube will follow all their single presentation. 
So thanks again and uh, good luck for uh, this day. You are the protagonist and uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor Bocciard Thierry uh, as a coordinator of the course of Humanity. He's also the Vice Dean of Teaching and Communication. Thank you. Thank you. So good morning everyone. Um, I'm very glad that with the first uh, university PhD day that we all organized together, thanks to the support of, for, of our university, but especially thanks to the work of our students. And I am glad about this opportunity, both as the coordinator of PhD in humanities and as the director for teaching and communication. I believe it's very important to organize public moments to explore, share, and inspire the scientific path that uh, students uh, follow in our PhD and the research work that they are doing. Indeed, it is uh, only in the constant confrontation with the scientific community that we can make knowledge grow as an experience that is not solitary, but built as a continuous exchange even between generations. For this reason, days such as today's represent an appointment to be repeated periodically hosting colleagues from other universities and scientific institutions with whom we can compare ourselves in the name of the free circulation of knowledge and the growth of new generation of scholars as part of a larger community. Good work and thanks again for organizing this initiative which clearly indicates the direction that we as the University of Urbino intend to follow. Thank you and good works. Okay, we now have the pleasure to um, have the other two um, doctoral course coordinators who have joined us online. So I hand you over to Professor Alessandro Boiolo, who is the coordinator of the doctoral course in research methods in science and technologies. Thank you very much and uh, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, very grateful, first of all, uh, to the PhD program in uh, biomolecular and health sciences for uh, having conducted last year a very successful experiment uh, by organizing uh, their own PhD day. Uh, it was a true success. I attended the day and it was uh, wonderful. Uh, and that's a thanks uh, to the success of that event that today the entire University of Urbino and all the PhD programs uh, are organizing uh, this day. So having uh, this kind of a PhD day is a great opportunity um, because as you proceed uh, deepening uh, your understanding uh, in a specific field and even uh, providing uh, your own contribution to that field, it becomes more and more difficult uh, to communicate uh, your achievements uh, and to communicate with other students, uh, with other researchers uh, that are following other paths. So the true multidisciplinary nature uh, of this event today is really a great opportunity and a great challenge uh, that I'm very proud that uh, all our PhD students have decided uh, to take. So I really hope that uh, all of you will enjoy this day and take advantage of it, take full advantage of it. And I'm also proud of the fact that all PhD students have been truly engaged in organizing and taking part in this event, because this is a very busy period. In spite of the summer, this is a very busy period for PhD students. Most of them are uh, attending uh, summer schools or uh, taking exams or attending uh, conferences, workshops uh, abroad and so on. And that's a great uh, occasion uh, to do something uh, in the same university where they are studying to disseminate the research, to make some uh, new effort to communicate it effectively and to understand what other uh, fields of research uh, are uh, conducted by other PhD students uh, to establish possible relationship uh, and uh, widening uh, their understanding of the world. So thank you very much and enjoy the day. Thank you very much, Professor um, Boyolo. I now hand you over to Professor Antonello Zanfei, 
the coordinator of the doctoral course in Global Studies, Economy, Society and Law. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I couldn't make it to be there in person, but I intend uh, to join later on in the day. Uh, I, I just wanted to uh, thank everybody and stress a couple of points. One, one is that uh, actually I'm very convinced about the, the possibility of uh, finding a good balance between um, specialism and interdisciplinary approaches. And it, this is something that is really a challenge that we are trying to undertake also in our PhD program, uh, which actually combines different social sciences, economics, uh, politics, and law, and sociology. So this is per se a mission we have as a PhD program, but I, I'm really very much um, and I have the feeling that it is very, very important to uh, to have a broader interaction. I, let me say that uh, society and economy in particular not only calls for, but needs a, an interaction with hard sciences and humanities. Uh, I um, I have a personal experience as a, a student student of, of economics of the approach that was carried out by a distinguished professor whose name is Nathan Rosenberg from, from uh, Stanford University. And he, he had very frequent and continuous interaction with the world of technology and science and entrepreneurship in order to uh, understand and, and have a greater a, a feeling of what the problems were and of the real challenges were to, to, to be addressed. And he also stressed that uh, science is never in, ex exogenous. Science is the result of a continuous interaction with society and with uh, industry. And it's really something that is... Uh, comes out from the experience and from the study of the history of technology. The second and final point is that uh, I believe in the virtues of communicating in a, in synthesizing our research uh, results and approaches uh, in a very, very rigorous, but uh, simple enough way and I think uh, this is actually another important opportunity that you have today. Uh, we tend to say that the best things, the best ideas can be actually told and discussed over breakfast. And I think even in an uh, elevator as the new uh, way of naming this uh, could be a, an interesting approach. Thanks, thanks very much. Very, thank you very much for this. Um, actually, I'd like to thank all the four um, coordinators who have brought really very important messages to this uh, conference. Thank you very much, really. Um, well, I now have the pleasure to host Dr. Rosa Fioravante, who is the General Secretary of the main PhD Students and Young Research Association in Italy, which is ADI, ADI. Rosa, thank you very much for joining us today. She will briefly talk about the current challenges for PhD candidates in Italy and how to overcome them within the national scenario. Thank you very much, Rosa. Good morning. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for such an important day of an acknowledgement of the utmost importance of the PhD community. Thanks to the governance of the university for future and greater achievements uh, to do together. I want to thank you on behalf of Adi. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, as national secretary, I've been introducing PhD days all over Italy this year, and no greater honor is the one uh, of uh, being here where uh, I did my PhD and I'm continuing my path in research, so I will try to get not too emotional, I promise. 
Urbino is a great university. You all know that. Uh, small town, very high level of internationalization. We have here opportunities that colleagues from way bigger universities do not have. And we should be really grateful for this. We should cherish it. And we should take all the opportunities that this great university gives us. Nonetheless, although let's say logistically challenged, Urbino is no happy island in the troubled water of the sea of Italian academy. And I will briefly talk about that, the sea that surrounds us. And I will give you some bad news and hopefully some good news on how to navigate them. We are among colleagues, so I should start with um, some data, let's say. But before a question, who is doing innovation? PhD is the first step in a career in research and innovation. And we talk a lot about innovation. Rarely, we ask under which conditions innovation is done. Under which conditions for individuals and for society. So here are some of the conditions. Nature told us that 3,000 among the tenured professor in very high Ivy League uh, universities and campus in the United States have done their PhD in Italy. This is cause for proud, this is cause for concern. Italy has the, one of the worst record in spending in higher education among European countries. We have a low record, record number of graduate students, therefore we have a low record number of PhDs. And it's not only about the title. It's not only about the title. In a recent survey, but this is no news because we all know that, in, uh, as Adi, we run a survey every year on the conditions and uh, let's say the way we live within young scholars. In this survey, it was clear that half of us cannot live on the scholarship. You all know that. And even though Urbino has not yet, I hope, the rent crisis, we have been in the tent with students all over Italy to claim for more dignified conditions and more investment in the sector. And I'm not talking about luxury expenses that we want to do. We are talking about the fact that usually we cannot afford a dentist, a travel to go to see a sick parent or a sick, someone sick in the family and help them. We do not have resources to repair our laptops. Colleagues abroad have a longer PhD period, usually four up to five years. They have uh, higher compensation. They are considered workers in training and education. Here we are still considered barely students. And this is not only about the status, because once you get the title, you actually have a PhD. Then you are not considered a knowledge worker, which we are yet, even when you have the title. Europe has condemned Italy for using assegno di ricerca. And we passed a reform in last June that will grant us with a contract, then again, like knowledge worker, postdoc contract, like all over Europe, and yet the reform is still waiting to be implemented. And uh, we know from another survey by Adi that assegnisti di ricerca on most of the time, and I'm talking 70%, 80%, they uh, withdraw or uh, delay their family planning because they cannot imagine a future. It's not about the only the juridical status, it's about imagining really a future and being able to, to live it. Um, one big, big uh, university in the north of Italy this year put it uh, black and white, told the truth. They said in the call for PhDs that since the cost of living is higher than the scholarship, people who want to pursue this path have to have their own resources, I'm quoting. A selection based on own resources is not a selection based on merit. It's a class selection and of the worst kind. And this strikes us a lot. Then again, I'm not saying something very new to you. Uh, on the recent survey, we know that 50% of us, 50% means a higher percentage for women and lower for men, because then again, we have a gender issue in academia as well. We suffer from mental health problem. I'm talking about experiencing two up to three times a week symptoms of depression, anxiety, and I'm not talking about imposter syndrome, which is very good companion to all our activities. 
And finally, 80% of us, 80% of those who have a gradu uh, who graduates from PhD, they will not have the opportunity to stay in academia. And while I paused, I know that each of you has thought that I will be in the 20% who stays. So why am I saying this to you? And I'm going to close. PhD can be a very lonely path. So here are some tips to do it together. Together with the governance, together with professors, supervisors, the administrative staff, because we all have the same aim. We all share the same aim. Precarity and bad working conditions are not only harming a researcher's life. They are harming research itself, its quality, its depth, its freedom. And it is up to us to uh, safeguard this, its quality and its freedom. And all of this can change. We have raised multiple times the PhD scholarships. We have obtained the possibility to have the unemployment salary at the end of the path. I really hope nobody has to go to, through that, but still. And we work a lot on knowledge transfer. We work with, as Adi with private enterprise to sensibilize them, to raise awareness on the fact that the PhD graduates do not only have the skills to go to conferences and write abstracts, but we know how to do European projects. We know how to work in groups. We have gone through such a time that we know how to cope with stress very well. And we try to monitor and uh, uh, change when the public administration processes do not foresee the PhD title and do not recognize it as something that can be valuable for working positions in the public administration as well. Lastly, we are working on the reform of the Abilitazione Scientifica Nazionale. As all evaluation systems, even the Abilitazione Scientifica Nazionale is not only an evaluation system, it's performative. It is performative on what we do for research. And it is too late to deal with that when you are at the middle of your career. You should start thinking about that right in the middle of your PhD if you want to pursue a career in academia. So, why do we do that? And we do this as volunteers. Why do we do that? Because here's the bottom line. Academia is governed, but has a great deal in governing itself with all its bodies and all the people who work within it. And academia has been born, is led, and flourishes in confrontations among peers, which is what we are doing today, which is what our job is about. And when we do research, we do it because it betters our life, right? And it does. It has a great deal in doing it. But while we do it, we are also bettering other people's life. Because research is the main driver of innovation, which is the main driver of economic prosperity and growth. So we are trying to better lives for us, but also for other people in and outside academia. And so that's the trick, that's the bottom line. The point is that we do an amazing job and we do a very important job, but sometimes we have to think about the fact that what it is most important is not only our scientific discoveries, our contribution to push further the frontiers of knowledge is also how we do it. So here it is to uh, explore, share, inspire, but do it together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Raza. This was a very, very interesting uh, speech. You have actually raised very important points. And uh, hopefully, you know, these are, these are, this is the time, these are the occasions to talk about this as well. And like you said, to share these um, concerns among peers, but also among the governance. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Really, I couldn't have said it better. Thank you. Thank you once again. Actually, we have a <laughs> present for you. Okay. Well, it is now time for the keynote speaker of the day. Um, I invite Ludovica Montesi, one of our PhD students, to introduce Professor Gianni Ciofani. Thank you, Ludovica, and of course, Good morning. Good morning to everybody. 
Today, we have the privilege of being in the presence of Professor Gianni Ciofani. Prof. Gianni Ciofani is senior research tenor at the Istituto Italiano di Tecnologia, where he is the principal investigator of the Smart Bio Interfaces Research Line and coordinator of the Center for Material Interfaces. In January 2010, he obtained his PhD in Innovative Technology with honors from the Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna. His main research interests concern smart nanomaterials for nanomedicine, complex in vitro models, and biology in altered gravity conditions. He is coordinator of several projects. In particular, he was awarded an IRC starting grant and two IRC proof of concept grants. Thanks to the grants for the Italian Space Agency and the European Space Agency, he had the opportunity to carry out the experiment in the International Space Station. Gianni Ciofani is author of about 170 papers on international journals, and he is co-founder and scientific advisor of Kidaya Bioscience, an Istituto Italiano di Tecnologia spin-off company dedicated to the preparation and characterization of cosmetic and nutraceutical products based on natural derived active ingredients. He also co-founder and member of the executive committee of IRC in Italy, a no-profit association of IRC awardees, worked to promote fundamental and frontier research in Italy. Furthermore, he is Knight of the Order of Merit of the Italian Republic, appointed by the President of the Italian Republic in December 2022. Uh, Prof. Gianni Ciofani today is presenting the lecture uh, titles Bar Nanomaterials, Innovative Tools for Earth and Space Medicine. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Gianni Ciofani. Good morning to everyone again. Thanks a lot for this kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Ludovica, for the wonderful introduction. And uh, today, uh, I would like to make uh, a brief inter um, overview of uh, our research activities at the Italian Institute of Technology, and uh, in particular with a focus on uh, smart nanomaterials that can be exploited for medical application, both on Earth but as we will see also in space. Uh, is it working? No. Okay, no problem. No, it's not working the uh, slider. Okay, I, I can make it manually with the, with the mouse, it's not a problem. Important the pointer is working. Pointer is working. Okay. Okay. So just a, a few words about uh, Istituto Italiano di Tecnologia, Italian Institute of Technology, that is a relatively young research institute. It has uh, its uh, headquarters in Genova and uh, several centers that are spread all around the Italian territory. And uh, I am the coordinator of the Center for Materials Interfaces that is located in uh, Pontedera, a small town close uh, uh, to Pisa. At the Center for Materials Interfaces, now it's working by the way, <laughs> I am the uh, principal investigator of the Smart Biointerfaces Research Line. What are we studying? Essentially, we are a nanomedicine laboratory. We are studying uh, materials at uh, the nanoscale, but what is mostly interesting to us uh, is uh, uh, the smartness of uh, these nanomaterials. What is smartness? Is uh, the property of these materials to react to external physical stimuli and then to act as a real nanotransducers. 
So we are studying these nanoparticles uh, to perform drug delivery or delivery of uh, diagnostic agents, but uh, these uh, materials are active. In which sense they are active? Uh, I will provide you some examples. We are in particular focused uh, on these uh, four big families uh, of uh, nanomaterials. For example, magnetic nanoparticles. Magnetic nanoparticles, as uh, the word itself explains, are reactive to magnetic fields. So we can exploit magnetic nanoparticles, for example, to simply target a drug. With an external simple magnet, we can move these nanoparticles towards a precise target and so deliver the drug in the intended site. But magnetic nanoparticles can be also responsive to electromagnetic fields, alternating magnetic fields. And so they are developing heating, they are increasing the temperature. And by this uh, local increment of temperature, for example, we can perform hyperthermia and uh, improving uh, chemotherapy and killing uh, cancer cells. Or we are studying nanoparticles that are responsive to the light. Also in this case, we are illuminating the nanoparticles. The nanoparticles are producing a local increment of temperature, and we can exploit this local increment of temperature for therapeutic purposes, again, hyperthermia in cancer cells, or if this local increment of temperature is within physiological ranges, we can exploit it as a physical cue to activate cells. As we will see, we are able, for example, to induce muscle contraction or activation of neurons and so on. Then piezoelectric nanoparticles. What is piezoelectricity? Uh, I'm sure some of you will know. Piezoelectricity is uh, the physical property of some materials to convert mechanical energy into electrical energy and vice versa. And we are using, we are exploiting this property at the nanoscale in order to obtain a real nanotransducers that can transform a mechanical vibration, ultrasound, some kind of mechanical stress into electrical cues. And we exploit, again, these electrical cues to stimulate electric sensitive cells like neurons, muscles, bone cells, but also to perform cancer therapy, because also cancer cells are sensitive to electrical stimulation. And then, and I am going to the, the, the focus of the, the lecture of today, we are studying nanomaterials that, uh, depending on the pH values of the microenvironment where they are located, they can behave as uh, very, very powerful antioxidants. So they are able to scavenge, to clean reactive oxygen species, free radicals, and so they can improve some pathological situation that are occurring in, in our body, in the living organism. Uh, so um, some words more about oxidative stress. Oxidative stress can have different uh, Etiology is different origin, both uh, intrinsic of the organisms or external to the organisms, like hair pollution or uh, UV light uh, or ionizing radiation, or smoking, and so on. But oxidative stress is uh, also at uh, the base, or at least is a co-cause of uh, several kinds of pathologies, from uh, a simple inflammation to a more uh, aggressive and dangerous pathologies like cancer or neurodegeneration and general uh, degenerative uh, diseases. And uh, if we have some powerful tool that is helping us to counteract this high level of oxidative stress, so this high level of production of a reactive oxygen species, can be a very, very good, let's say, weapon against many kinds of pathologies. So uh, nature can help us because uh, uh, some of the uh, natural and the mostly occurring antioxidants are uh, vitamin, like vitamin E, vitamin C, that can be very powerful in counteracting some uh, uh, excessive levels of reactive oxygen species. But in some circumstances, these uh, natural compounds, organic compounds, are not enough. And those nanotechnology can help us. Uh, there are some kind of nanomaterials that uh, I mentioned uh, in, the, in the first slide that can behave uh, like uh, nanozymes. 
like uh, replicas of uh, enzymes that we have uh, in our cells. And uh, this is uh, one of the most famous in the literature example of uh, this kind of nanomaterials, nanoceria, cerium oxide nanoparticles. These are <clears throat> ceramic nanoparticles that uh, because of some defects on uh, their crystalline structures, they can uh, behave uh, as uh, catalysts, like uh, real enzymes, and they can attack and uh, uh, destroy uh, dangerous uh, reactive oxygen species like uh, hydrogen peroxide or uh, the oxygen singlet. So they are very, very powerful, and uh, because they are uh, behaving like enzymes, uh, they are self-regenerating. So conversely to more uh, natural uh, compounds like vitamins, that once that uh, they have accomplished their task, they are not working anymore, and so they, their uh, life is quite, quite short, these kind of nanoparticles virtually can work forever. So with uh, a single administration, you can achieve long-lasting results. I will not go into details. People that are interested or are studying this topic will find a lot of references uh, along uh, my, my presentation. So you, you can find uh, details. But uh, this is very, very uh, important to know that how these nanoparticles are working. So because these effects of the crystalline structures, they are able really to behave like enzymes and they are able to attack and uh, uh, scavenge uh, reactive uh, oxygen, uh, oxygen uh, uh, species. This is very important for a lot of uh, health pathologies, terrestrial pathologies, but we proposed the, the application of uh, these uh, uh, nanozymes of these antioxidant materials, even for astronauts, and this is why for space medicine. Why space medicine? Because uh, space is a very, very harsh environment. Uh, astronauts that uh, uh, are performing long-lasting missions in space, in particular on board of the International Space Station, they are experiencing a very, uh, very stressful uh, situation because of the microgravity, because the human body uh, was born to live on the Earth with the 1G uh, gravity acceleration. So in space, uh, it is something that is not physiological. Our, our uh, body is not uh, used to live uh, in a microgravity condition. And uh, a lot of uh, systems are affected, the circulatory systems, skeletal muscle system, uh, immunolo imm immunological system, and, and so on. And then we have also the presence of uh, uh, radiation, space radiation, that uh, the walls of uh, the vehicles, of uh, uh, the spacecrafts, are not able to totally shield. And so these uh, radiation are arriving to the, the organs, to the tissues, to the cells, and can induce uh, heavy damages. And once uh, again, one of the finger uh, mark of the marks of uh, this uh, damage is uh, oxidative stress. So uh, the cells are developing following this uh, bombing of uh, uh, space radiation uh, a large amount of uh, reactive oxygen species. And so they are developing uh, uh, oxidative stress. Muscles are particularly affected by this situation, in particular because of the lack of terrestrial gravity, of the microgravity. Uh, I am quite sure that most of you realize that when astronauts are coming back, barely they can walk, they have to be sustained, and uh, they have to undergo uh, long weeks, months of uh, rehabilitation in order to come back to the physiological situation that uh, they had before their the, uh, space travel. So muscles are undergoing atrophy, bones uh, are lacking mineralization, and uh, all of these situations uh, present uh, uh, symptoms that are also typical of uh, terrestrial pathologies. I was mentioning earlier with some of you, osteoporosis for example, 
It's uh, like uh, astronauts are undergoing a reversible osteoporosis uh, process. Of course, when they are back on the Earth, they can recover. It's not like uh, the, the pathology, the of pathology. But the symptoms and also the biological markers are very, very similar. So with the, the space medicine, we can achieve two goals because we can help astronauts that in the future maybe they will experience even more permanence in space. Let's think, for example, to travel to Mars, Mars at least one year. But we are also helping to understand what is happening in the terrestrial pathologies, like muscle atrophy, dystrophies, osteoporosis, and so on. We can so investigate also better the biomolecular mechanism at the base of these pathologies, and why not? we could also find some uh, new drugs, new molecules, a new nanotechnological platform to counteract these, uh, uh, these uh, pathologies. And so we performed different experiments on board of the International Space Station. The first of these experiments was carried out in uh, 2017. Uh, it was in the framework of a project granted by the Italian Space Agency. The project was named uh, NanoROS. And uh, we brought on board of the International Space Station a culture of uh, muscle cells. Muscle cells that were differentiating, so they were already forming uh, contractile myotubes. And we tested our nanomaterials, antioxidant nanomaterials, on these cells after a short uh, uh, travel on board of the International Space Station. Uh, this is quite interesting. This is the, uh, the equipment and uh, the laboratories that we exploited on board of the ISS, of the International Space Station. Of course, the astronauts cannot work under the hood and changing the medium with the pipettes and so on. So everything should be uh, as most uh, automatized as possible. So we cultured our cells inside these experimental units. They are bioreactors, fluidic bioreactors, completely automatized. And they are allowing to change the, the medium after a central amount of days, of, of hours, it is up to us. At the end, uh, we can perform a washing step in a saline solution in PBS. And then lastly, we can fix the cells with a kind of uh, paraformaldehyde, something that is safe for space travel because PFA is not allowed uh, in space. And these uh, bioreactors are moved in a freezer because also on board of the International Space Station, there is a freezer, it is called Melfi, and is allowing to store the biological samples at minus 80 until they are back to the Earth. During the running of the experiment, these bioreactors are inserted in an uh, incubator, because there is an incubator that is maintaining the temperature at 37, and uh, the incubator is allowing all of the automatic process that uh, I described. So when the package is arriving, the astronaut just uh, is taking these objects, inserting here, and at the end of the experiment, is he will move the bioreactors from the incubator and he will put in the freezer. When there is a, a vehicle that is coming back to the Earth, he will move everything all the package on this vehicle, and we can recover then the, the sample once they are back on, on, on the Earth. This was the, the timeline of the experiment. It was a short duration experiment just for, for three days. Some of the cultures were treated with nanoparticles, as I said. Some of the cultures were the, the control group, so without uh, uh, nanoparticles. Uh, the NanoROS experiment was uh, performed by an Italian astronaut, uh, Paolo Nespoli, I, I think that uh, many of you uh, know, uh, know him. And uh, the, the mission was uh, carried out in uh, August uh, uh, 2017, as, uh, as I said. And here I have a video that uh, I hope it works. We recorded at uh, the Last Kennedy one. Space Station in uh, Cape Canaveral. So our cells uh, were delivered on board on the National Space Station by a SpaceX uh, vector with the Falcon 
a launcher seven, and with the, a, a six, dragon uh, five, cargo. Four, so our cells three, were here. Two, one, zero. Lift off at the back. And then it was a very nice experience because for almost one month, we moved at our biological lab to the Kennedy Space Center, where we prepared the cell culture, we collected the nanoparticles, we propagated the cells, and so on. NASA gave us a fully equipped uh, uh, laboratory. And then uh, we prepared all the package for the astronauts. Uh, we gave it to the SpaceX uh, uh, crew, and uh, it was delivered on board of the International Space, uh, uh, Space Station. And then after a couple of months, cells came back. They were very healthy, uh, very nice cultures, and uh, as you can see from these very simple, uh, bright field uh, images, and uh, we performed a series of uh, analyses. I will not go into details. So we performed essentially transcriptomics because it is allowing us to recover a lot of data despite the small amount of samples. Why small amount of samples? Because uh, there are uh, very, very strong uh, uh, restrictions in terms of space on board of the International Space Station. We have not uh, uh, available a lot of uh, space inside that cubic incubator that I showed you, so we have to maximize the, uh, the data that we can obtain from these uh, simple experiments. And the end are very, very simple experiments because just culturing cells with nanoparticles and checking what is uh, coming out, but they are extremely informative. These are all uh, the data, all the results that uh, we collected, but uh, they were very interesting because uh, we could analyze with the genes are switched on or switched off uh, in microgravity condition, and which of these genes and nanoparticles are contributing to uh, make back, to, to send back to physiological expression level. So it was very, very nice work that uh, we could publish despite the, the low amount of samples that uh, we, we had in, in our hands. And then a couple of years later, we performed another mission on board of the International Space Station. This was the NOIMI project. It was granted by the European Space Agency, in this case, and by Fondazione Cariplo for what concerning the uh, ground uh, activities, the ground, ground experiments. In this case, uh, the experiment was, uh, experiment was uh, a little bit more complex. Uh, we tested not only the permanence uh, on board of International Space Station in terms uh, of effects of microgravity and uh, space radiation, but uh, we had access also to a centrifuge on board of the space station that is allowing us uh, to recapitulate uh, the terrestrial gravity. Why this is important? Because can, uh, it can seem aware we are going on space to make experiment at 1G, at the same gravity that we have here on the Earth. But conversely, it is extremely important because uh, experiments that are performed in space, but in the centrifuge, are allowing us to decouple the effects of the radiation from the effects of the microgravity. Because the cells that are in the centrifuge that is running at 1G in space are experiencing the radiation because you cannot shield them, but they are not experiencing microgravity because they are still at 1G. So in this case, the experimental classes were four in, in the space, two with the treatment with the nanoparticles, two without treatment of nanoparticles, two of them in the centrifuge, and two of them again in uh, microgravity in the incubator that uh, I, I showed uh, you, you earlier. Uh, we had also more replicates, so the data that we could collect were much more reliable with respect to the first pilot experiment performed with, uh, uh, with the NanoRoss project. Uh, in this case, uh, the launch occurred in May 2019. The, uh, the launch uh, was uh, during the, the night, so, so particularly spectacular, as you will see here. And here again, uh, we, could, we were able to record a video from the uh, visitor center of the Kennedy Space Center in, um, in Cape Canaveral. Just a, a few 
second. And the third. Again, in the Dragon Vector, our sales started the travel until the International Space Station, where they arrived a couple of days later. This is a, an image of the, of the capture of the Dragon by the robotic arm of the ISS. After the capture, all the cargo is put inside the International Space Station, and the astronauts can take all of the package and start the experiment. Again, the cells, uh, we are talking still of muscle cells uh, treated with these antioxidant nanoparticles, serum cyanide nanoparticles. Again, they came back quite uh, healthy. There were not a particular trouble. The experiments lasted for almost one week, so it was also a bit longer experiment. And what we performed again was a transcriptomic analysis on uh, the cells that uh, we retrieved. Here, the situation, as I said, was much more complex because we were dealing with four experimental groups just in the space, and then we have also to consider the control groups on the health. So the bioinformatics that studied this data had a very, very hard life in analyzing everything that came back. We performed also gene ontology following transcriptomics, but again, we were able to highlight which genes are switched on, which others are switched off, up regulation, down regulation, and how the, these nanoparticles are able, uh, at least partially, to uh, repristinate the physiological conditions uh, typical of uh, the health, uh, health culture. Uh, as I said, reactive oxygen species, so uh, oxidative stress, uh, play key roles in many kind of pathologies. I mentioned the simple inflammation, but most dangerous neurodegenerative diseases. This is why we focus our attention also on the central nervous system and the effects of these nanozymes, of these antioxidant nanoparticles, also on neuronal cells. And again, we have a possibility of application both for terrestrial medicine, but also for space medicine, because also the central nervous system and the nervous system in general is deeply affected by the permanence in the, in the space on board of the International Space Station. So we decided to propose another project the focus of which uh, was uh, this time the uh, assessment of the effects of the permanence in the space uh, on uh, neuronal cells. And uh, we proposed also another kind of uh, nanoparticles. Why another kind of nanoparticles? If you remember, I said that uh, cerium oxide is a ceramic. So it's a, a non-biodegradable material, or it is biodegradable at a very, very low extent. And so it can raise concern in terms of long-term accumulation, biodistribution, and also image if we want to translate one day the application of these nanozymes to humans, to have something that is not biodegradable, that is uh, uh, giving concern in terms of uh, bioaccumulation, is not very well considered by the regulatory agencies like FDA or EMA in Europe. So we started to think uh, to alternative solution based on biodegradable and more natural uh, uh, products. In this sense, uh, we proposed uh, polydopamine nanoparticles. Polydopamine nanoparticles are organic. 
they are, uh, they, they are derived from the poly polymerization of dopamine. I know most of you know dopamine is a neurotransmitter. Uh, and uh, so they are not giving any concern in terms of uh, toxicity and also in terms of bioaccumulation because they are biodegradable in a relatively short time. But why poly polydopamine nanoparticles? Because polydopamine nanoparticles are really smart and they have the same but even superior antioxidant properties that we saw for serum oxide nanoparticles. So we started to investigate uh, biomedical application of polydopamine nanoparticles. We proposed them, for example, as protective agent uh, in uh, uh, mitochondrial disease cells. In uh, mitochondrial disease, there is a strong overproduction of the reactive oxygen species at the level of mitochondria. Mitochondria are the powerhouses of the, of the cells. They are producing a lot uh, of reactive oxygen species, but they are also very sensitive to oxidative stress. So it's a very, very peculiar organelle. And so we demonstrated the possibility to protect this organelle with the polydopamine nanoparticles, even in... Uh, uh, cells that are coming from uh, individuals that are affected by mitochondrial uh, pathologies. Then they show uh, the strong antioxidant power in an uh, in vitro model of uh, uh, liver steatosis, fatty liver disease. There is uh, an overaccumulation of, of fat, of lipids in the, in the liver. And also in this case, uh, uh, oxidative stress is a marker. If we can reduce oxidative stress, we can also somehow slow down the progression of the pathology. And the results were very interesting because uh, with the, the administration of polydopamine nanoparticles, we are indeed able to reduce the lipid droplets accumulation inside the hepatocytes. But uh, polydopamine nanoparticles are really interesting also because they are reactive to the light. As I, I mentioned in the very first slide, that we are studying also nanomaterials that are reactive to the light. Indeed, the polydopamine nanoparticles not only are powerful antioxidant nanotechnological agents, but if we are illuminating these nanoparticles in the near infrared, we are able to induce a local increment of the temperature. And as I said, it is opening interesting perspectives in biomedicine because we can use this increment of temperature to perform cancer therapy, but we can use also this increment of temperature to activate cells. This is an example of uh, uh, treatment of uh, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma in vitro with the polydopamine nanoparticles that are loaded with the chemotherapy drug. At the same time, we are performing also this uh, irradiation with the near infrared laser, and we have a combination of therapy provided by both the chemotherapy drug and uh, by the local increment of temperature. The local increment of temperature is uh, indeed very helpful because uh, uh, from one side uh, is uh, directly inducing cellular death, apoptosis. On the, but on the other side, makes uh, the cells also more sensitive to the chemotherapy drug. In this way, we can decrease the amount of uh, chemotherapy drug, and we can also the reduce uh, uh, chemo-resistance phenomena in, uh, in, uh, in cancer cells. And this is instead another application of uh, this uh, local increment of temperature within physiological range. In this case, we exploited the polydopamine nanoparticles as nanotransducer to induce muscle contraction. So in, we incubate muscle cells with the polydopamine nanoparticles, then we illuminate a, a little part of the cytoplasm of the cells with the near-infrared laser, and as you can see here, the sarcomers inside the cells start to contract. Without any chemical agent, without any drug, this is just a physical mean. This is why I say that we are studying nanotransducers, because we are exploiting these nanoparticles as a sort of nanorobots at the end that are able to perform some actions inside the cells just by physical means, without addition of any drug. This is a control where we blocked 
everything with the blebistatin that is a toxin that is blocking the contractile system of the muscle. In this case, we don't have any, any, any contraction. I will not go into the details, but uh, really polydopamine nanoparticles are very, very smart. They can be exploited also as contrast agents. This is an example of photoacoustic imaging, and they have a very, very strong uh, signal, uh, photoacoustic signal, so they can be exploited also to perform diagnosis. In this sense, we can talk about teragnostic applications of polydopamine nanoparticles, because they can combine into a single platform therapy and, uh, and uh, diagnosis. And as I said, also with these nanoparticles, we performed experiment in space. Uh, this is a very, very recent project, still ongoing. Uh, we went uh, on board of the International Space Station in November 2022, so last, uh, last year. And uh, we cultured neuronal cells with uh, polydopamine nanoparticles. We sent in space. Again, we performed different controls also inside the centrifuge. This is a very nice image where there is the Japanese astronauts that was handling our bioreactors, the bioreactors that I described to you some slides ago. And he's inserting these bioreactors inside the cubic incubator in order to, to start the, the experiment. Um, this project was again granted by the Italian Space Agency, ASI, is the Prometeo project. Cells came back very, very healthy, so we didn't have any technical trouble, and we just started the analysis. So we don't have yet any results about this because we collected back the cells in February, so we are performing a quality check on nucleic acids that we extracted. We have to create the libraries for transcriptomics and so on, so it will take a bit of time. But technically, everything went very, very well. So, um, concluding, and then I will leave also some minutes for questions or curiosity if uh, you have. Uh, what uh, I wanted to show you today is uh, that uh, smart nanomaterials, so these uh, physically active nanoparticles, can uh, have a lot of uh, opportunities uh, for biomedicine, for terrestrial biomedicine, but also for uh, astronautics uh, uh, biomedicine. And in particular, I showed you as uh, reactive uh, oxygen species and oxidative stress uh, is uh, a marker of many, many different kinds of pathologies. And so nanotechno nanotechnology can indeed help us in counteracting these uh, um, overexpression, overproduction of reactive ocean species with very, very powerful tools. I showed you two examples, cerium oxide nanoparticles that are historically very studied, but they are uh, not biodegradable and they can uh, raise some uh, biocompatibility compatibility concern, and then I intro introduced you a possible alternative, polydopamine nanoparticles, that are even better, in my view, because as, I, as I, you uh, have appreciated, they are indeed smart uh, under several points of view. So we cannot just perform free radicals depletion, but we can perform also other kind of therapy and uh, of uh, di diagnosis. So I should conclude, this is uh, our group uh, in uh, Pontedera at the Center for Materials Interfaces of uh, Italian Institute of Technology. Some of our granting funding agencies, in particular ERC, uh, as Ludovica mentioned during my introduction, and also IRC, Fondazione Italiana per la Ricerca sul Cancro, that is supporting us with the research grants, but also with the scholarships for young PhD students and postdocs, and this is indeed very important. Thank you very much. If you have any question, I will be happy to try to reply. Thank you, Professor Gianni Ciofani, and uh, for the interesting presentation, really thanks. And if someone has question or curiosity, it's time to open the discussion. Maybe come here and briefly introduce yourself. Oh, okay. Thank you, Professor, for the wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it. Good morning, everyone.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Udo Dimo um, My question or curiosity is on the basis that these nanoparticles are non-biodegradable. So my question is, what happens after they have affected the, the, the objective of their function? How are they being eliminated? Just thinking that probably after their work and they remain in the system, they may do extra work, which may cause damage. So I'm thinking, is there in your research group, are you thinking in the direction, since they can, they are non-biodegradable, so they can degrade, they remain in the system, how are they being eliminated from the system? Thank you. Thank you for the question. This is indeed why we moved from cerium oxide nanoparticles to polydopamine nanoparticles. Polydopamine nanoparticles are perfectly biodegradable. So after 30, 40 days, they are, you cannot find any more in the cells. Yes. <laughs> Thank you a lot. Uh, for this amazing presentation. We have met a lot of time, but actually I didn't know, I, I, I couldn't imagine all your work. So really congratulations. And um, I have uh, some questions about your uh, polydopamine nanoparticles. I mean, um, first of all, it's okay. I understand your uh, change in mind, I mean, for degradation uh, issues, but the point is, actually, it is, they are formed by dopamine. So first of all, my question is, uh, which is the dose that you use, first of all? And then I explain also why I'm uh, asking this. But the second question is, uh, okay, we know that actually dopamine uh, or better, um, this equilibrium between neuromediators like dopamine, adrenaline, is uh, one of the causes of different neurodegenerative diseases. So how can you be sure that the distribution, for example, can reach some organs and not others, not going into the brain? And this is related to my first question, which is the dose. So, first of all, thank you. And I have another question, but then it's more like economical. <laughs> I reply to this one. Uh, for the moment, I can tell you the um, concentrations that we are using in vitro, because for the moment, all these experiments we are performing in vitro, we are about uh, 100, uh, 500 microgram per ml. They are very biocompatible. You can even increase the concentration, but it's actually not needed because they can make their job even at lower concentration. Concerning the uh, localization in specific uh, area of uh, the bodies, uh, we can simply functionalize them. The surface is very uh, reactive. We can easily attach uh, aptamer antibodies, and we can direct them in the desired site. So it's quite simple chemistry. Yes. System, okay, okay, okay. And the other question is more like a curiosity. Just sorry for that. <laughs> I'm not an expert. But I was thinking that, uh, and I think, I suppose, that astronauts uh, follow like several training uh, in microgravity rooms or something like that. Uh, based on the cost of your experiment in the space, can you reproduce those experiments also in this kind of rooms? It is like cost less costly, maybe? I don't know, really. So it's not a term of cost, but it's a, a term of uh, real microgravity and the long duration of microgravity. Because, for example, uh, astronauts are performing uh, training on uh, parabolic flights. But parabolic flights are granting just 30, 35 seconds of microgravity. So it is almost impossible to perform biological experiments. In the lab, you can have some simulators of microgravity. In our lab, we have, and we are exploiting uh, this equipment to perform a control where the cells are undergoing microgravity, but not space radiation. 
because it is another internal control. It is called the random positioning machine. Uh, it's a machine that is uh, rotating randomly, and so the average uh, uh, gravitational vector is almost zero. But of course, uh, it's a very simulation, simulative situation, and uh, you cannot uh, recapitulate what uh, is uh, happening indeed uh, in space. That if we have uh, to tell clearly, even the microgravity on board of International Space Station is a, a sort of simulation because they are experiencing microgravity not because they are in the uh, far space. They are just 300 kilometers from the Earth. So they are experiencing very well the, the gravity. But uh, they are in, on orbit, so it is like they are continu continuously falling down, like a lift that is uh, falling down. And so in this sense, uh, also that microgravity is a, a sort of simulation but uh, is the best uh, simulation that uh, we can obtain so far. Yes. Hi, hello Gianni. So first of all, I want to thank you for having come to Urbino and I really hope that there will be the occasion during the lunch time or during the aperitivo to talk and maybe find some, uh, you know, collaboration or working together. So, thank you very, very much. You're welcome. Uh, I have just a curiosity, since I'm working with neurons, so sometimes we are afraid even to move from the incubator to the microscope because like for the floor, the medium that can yes. uh, impact them. So, Technically, how you like made all the equipment, uh, the, the platform to move them from Earth to space? Like, uh, first of all, just a we, curiosity. First of all, we have to say that uh, I, I didn't give all the details uh, because of the general audience, so I, I, I didn't go into details. These are pseudo neurons. I mean, mm -hmm. these are immortalized cell lines. SH S5, uh, mm -hmm. uh, S5, if you know them. Mm -hmm. They are differentiated into neurons with the retinoic acid, okay. but they are immortalized as cell lines, so are much more robust with respect okay. to primary neurons. And so the main problem is not uh, sending the space, it's sending to America. So we have to send uh, <laughs> frozen vials, uh -huh. Uh, hoping that uh, the DHL or whatever it is is not uh, making any trouble at the custom for custom clearance. So we are working uh, well in advance uh, with the NASA in order to obtain import permission and so on. So this is really the, the most difficult step because we have to be sure that they are always kept with the dry eyes, that there are not trouble during the travel. And then uh, once in the lab uh, you are towing them, uh, you propagate a bit, uh, they are quite robust, uh, and we didn't have a particular problem okay. to send abroad. In any, in any case, as far as I know, this uh, experiment, this, uh, experiment was one of the first ones that mm -hmm. uh, sent uh, neurons on board of the ISS. Mm -hmm. So we were not sure what yeah. uh, could have come back. I can imagine. Fortunately, yeah. they were healthy, but uh, it's... Uh, a bit uh, mm. by chance. Yeah. <laughs> we, we cannot know because there are a lot of question marks. So for, for example, we don't know how much uh, can last the travel mm -hmm. because if there are some problems, uh, the dragon cannot attract the ISS. So they put uh, waiting uh, outside of the space station, but uh, the cells are alive there mm. and uh, they are depleting uh, media and so we don't know for yeah. how many hours they can still survive. So there are many, many uh, variables <laughs> that we have to consider. So I wish you very good luck for Let's your see. experiment. Uh, at least they arrived uh, in a perfect condition. Yeah. It was already a success. Because yeah. really, uh, we didn't know when we opened the box yeah. what we could find. Yeah, yeah. It was also possible that we could not find no cells, uh, mm. completely detached, completely dead. Mm or fungi, because there can be yeah. some contamination. Also. I feel you, because sometimes, yes. really, we are moving just from yes. the tissue culture so, to the confocal, and then maybe it's, it's we a, have problems. Yes. <laughs> it's not simple. Yeah. Thank we will you. see.
technically went well. Mm. Let's see now. Okay, good luck, Gianni. Grazie. <laughs> More questions or curiosity? Thank you very much for your presentation, very fascinating. Just a general comment I'm asking to you. I mean, you, uh, from the biological point of view, assume that the scavenging agent is beneficial. Uh, from the biological point of view, I must comment that this is not true. I mean, there is a balance in yes. scavenging and not scavenging action within the cells and the organism. So, uh, What's your experience and have you really evaluate whether the effect you see is due to something that by the end of the day is beneficial to the system or, or not? Yeah, yes, it is absolutely true because uh, indeed the reactive ocean species sometimes are necessary to the cells because uh, they are also some, uh, let's say, intermediate communication system in the cells, they can uh, provide uh, differentiative cues and so on. We have to say that we tested uh, our nanoparticles just on extremely stressed cells, so where the level of uh, oxidative stress was extremely high, and uh, despite uh, the great uh, antioxidant power of our nanoparticles, we never came back uh, to the physiological level of reactive oxygen species. So if you are giving these nanoparticles to diseased cells, to cells that are extremely stressed, you don't risk uh, the problem of overdepletion because you have so many reactive oxygen species uh, that uh, even the nanoparticles are, able, are not able to scavenge all of them. The problem is that uh, if, uh, if you give these nanoparticles to healthy cells, and so we are coming back to the off-target administration, and so the necessity to target these nanoparticles where it is needed. So, um, by replaying shortly, I think this is not a problem if uh, you are giving the nanoparticles to the correct target. This can be a problem if you are giving nanoparticles to cells that don't need uh, antioxidants. Yes, yes, of course, of course. Of, of course not, but we are generally working with the models where the oxidative stress levels are extremely high. So we are not particularly concerned in the depletion of the reactive ocean species that are conversely needed to the cells. This is the point. Thank you very much for... for Thank you very much for, for your amazing presentation. I have only, only a, a curiosity. Do you have any information about the um, anti-inflammatory properties of the uh, polydopamine? We didn't test so far, uh, but it's something that uh, surely we would like uh, to investigate in the future. For example, for... Uh, inflammatory disease like Bowel, chronic disease, and so on. It is something that we are thinking about. And uh, starting with the, the hepatic steatosis was a step in that direction. Yes, yes. Thank you. If there are no more questions, we can end the session. And thank you again, Professor. And a little present from the university. Thank you again. Thank you again, Professor Ciofani and Ludovica. Uh, let's move on to the PhD student session. Uh, we'll start from the doctoral course in biomolecular health sciences, and then we'll, we will move on 
to the Global Studies um, PhD course, then we'll have a break, and then we will resume our meeting at 3 o'clock p.m. Uh, there will be a slight change in the program because we will anticipate the poster session at 4.30 and also the aperitif and social event will be anticipated at about um, 6 p.m. Okay. Okay, so now um, I invite here Arianna Scardino, one of our PhD students, who will um, chair the first session. Welcome, Arianna. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So, let's start with the first year PhD student session. Guys, I remind you that you have only three minutes to talk. The first PhD student is Barbara Cla Barbato Claudia. Is he here, Barbato Claudia? No. Okay. The, so, the first PhD student is uh, uh, Alessia Bartolacci. Thank you for the presentation. Good morning, everybody. Today, I'd like to explain an overview of my study, Sweet Movis preliminary results, breast cancer survivors, glycemic and nutrition mo monitoring for a lifestyle intervention, which is part of uh, a greater project called Movis Movement and Health uh, Behind Care. This study started uh, three years ago, and uh, it's a partnership uh, be, be agreement between uh, the University of Urbino and uh, the Unit of Oncology of Urbino Hospital. As you all know, breast cancer is the most common cancer in women, and the movement, the Movis Research uh, Project aims to investigate a lifestyle intervention on non-physically active postmenopausal breast cancer survivors. So the uh, project team has already collected the preliminary data of uh, 70 women. Sweet Movis uh, started because uh, postmenopausal breast cancer survivors are at increased risk for developing diabetes and metabolic syndrome compared to cancer-free uh, women. In this context, aerobic exercise is an effective adjuvant treatment um, uh, but the association between exercise and uh, glucose homeostasis has remained inconclusive and even understudied among this type of patients. And uh, most studies have uh, quantified glucose homeostasis using fasting glucose and insulin concentrations only. So, Sweet Movis aims to evaluate the effect of 12-week aerobic exercise training intervention on glucose homeostasis measured by continuous glucose monitoring device and their correlation with food intake and within one day of a high glucose standard meal at pre and post intervention. The devices that we have applied uh, started uh, at uh, pre and post intervention uh, and uh, during for uh, 14 days. And uh, at the same time, the Mois women had to compile the food diaries using photodiatometry as a benchmark, and then we uploaded on a WinFood software. So, we have obtained preliminary results through a qualitative uh, analysis of food diaries at T0, which were assessed 
with the Mediterranean Diet and Healthy Eating Plate of Harvard Principles. As you can see, patients' eating habits do not align with the Mediterranean Principles. In fact, uh, as you can see, grain consumption needs to be improved and the fruit and vegetable intakes are insufficient. Furthermore, fish intake is uh, not enough. So, what should we do in the future? First of all, we have to complete the qualitative analysis of the food diaries on the T1 and match with the pre-intervention analysis. And then we have to perform statistical analysis of the food intake, glucose modulation and exercise parameters and analyze the effect of glucose intake with a standard meal. Thank you all of you for your attention. Thank you, Alessia, for your presentation. The next is Riccardo Benedetti. Good morning, my name is Riccardo Benedetti. My tutor is Professor Sara Montagna and my co-tutor is Professor Stefano Papa. My project is about the design and the development of an intelligent system for flow cytometry data processing and analysis. The key point under my work is that improvement in flow cytometry technologies allow us to obtain high dimensional data set. This high dimensionality has forced researchers to depart from model gating strategies and to try different strategies like, for example, the application of machine learning algorithm. And uh, so we decided to face the problem in uh, two different steps. The first step is the design and development of the software for the visualization of flow cytometry data. And the second step is the design and development of an intelligent tool for flow cytometry data analysis using machine learning techniques. For what concerns the first step, and I wrote a, a, a software, a software that can be launched using the terminal of the computer, in which we can select the feature that we want to show in the final graph, and to insert, uh, um, to, to insert manually gra uh, values to manually, compensate, to manually correct the compensation matrix. On the right, we can see an example of the output of our um, of, the, of our software in which we can see the two features that we manually select in the terminal. And uh, for what concerns the second step, we have already written a work in which we tested three different machine learning algorithms into three different uh, experiments, like uh, the classification of lymphocytes of type T, lymphocytes of type B, and lymphocytes of type T cytotoxic. And for, all, for all of those experiments, we, we obtained very high performances of classification, and this is a good thing because it means that um, machine learning algorithms are very good in working with this kind of data. And this work has already been accepted at the CIB conference that will take place in Padova in September. That's all. Thanks for the attention. Thank you, Ricardo, for your presentation. Okay. The next is Chiara Della Franca. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. During the first period of my PhD project, 
I focus my attention on the evaluation of blood cells response, mainly platelets, to histones, to analyzing uh, their qualitative and quantitative alteration. Briefly, histones are internuclear cationic proteins that participate in packing the neutrochromatin and regulating expression. But in pathological conditions, they move in the extracellular space, where they exert direct cytotoxicity. They act as damage-associated molecular pattern protein by binding toll-like receptors. They induce platelet activation, aggregation, and thrombin generation. And they promote the activation of PBNCs. High levels of extracellular histones have been demonstrated in a plethora of clinical settings with high inflammatory impact, such as uh, in sepsis and COVID-19 patients. In this regard, uh, therapies against extracellular histones may represent a potential strategy to reduce tissue and organ damages, in particular heparin and the paranoid that we tested. Studies of our teams uh, have already shown that histones contribute to monocyte alteration. And then our attention has also shifted to platelet behavior. In this regard, several literature data highlight that histones induce platelet activation in both TLR2 and TL4, and that histones platelet interaction could potentially contribute to thrombosis. In our experiments, we use wool blood, platelet rich plasma, and washed platelet as models from uh, six healthy donors to analyze at 30, 60, and 180 minutes platelet index alteration after histones and danaparoid and heparinoid treatment. Our results in wool blood show that platelet count have already significantly decreased at 30 minutes of 72% after histone treatment, and that the paranoids prevents it protecting the against platelet depletion um, through complexation of histones. And the platelet grid followed the same trend of platelet count. In specific model, PRP um, and uh, platelet-rich plasma and wash platelet, we obtained the same results. And in particular, in wash platelet, the absence of plasma protein exacerbates the, the platelet reduction of 83%. Uh, at uh, five minutes after some treatment. And even in this model, the paranoids prevents it. Then, uh, through the evaluation of platelet distribution width and mean platelet volume increase, we demonstrated that histones also induce morphological alteration on platelets because of their activation, and the paranoids prevents it. In conclusion, we proved that circulating histones are critically involved in the thrombocytopenia, promoting platelet volumetric index increase that reflects platelet activation. We demonstrated that the paranoid's complex histones, preventing the histones induced platelet aggregation and morphological alteration. And our future perspective for the second year are the assessment of platelet aggregation with an aggregometer, the analysis of other coagulation parameters, the study of monocyte alteration due to several stimuli, and the evaluation of inflammatory mediators. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Chiara, for your presentation. The next is uh, Stephanie Fondi. Hi everyone, I'm working with Professor Guescini Research Group and my PhD is focused on the isolation of uh, extracellular vesicles or AVs from accessible biological fluids such as saliva to identify new exercise biomarkers. And the benefits that exercise has on muscle health are well known. Unfortunately, not all individuals respond the same to an exercise protocol. Some are highly trainable, while others, uh, also known as non-responder, respond poorly or marginally. Uh, to investigate this interpersonal variability in exercise trainability on a molecular level, uh, saliva would represent uh, an ideal biomarker source. 
because it's easier to collect and to process than other biological fluids. However, it contains proteins such as uh, amylase that can mask other proteins with low level expression. Uh, salivary extracellular vesicles could um, represent uh, a complex and dynamic biomarker because their cargo includes proteins, lipids, nucleic acids, and also organelles with metabolic properties. With this in mind, the aim of the present project is to develop a protocol for the isolation of uh, AVs from saliva sample, which were collected from 18 athletes pre- and post-exercise. These samples were processed by serial ultracentrifugation and then characterized by nanotracker analysis for AV size distribution and concentration. Then uh, um, a BCA assay was performed for total protein content. And finally, dot blot uh, was employed for the antibody based detection of uh, AV marker CD63 and HSP60. NTA results showed the typical AV size and distribution, and dot blot assessed the different CD63 and HSP60 positivity levels between MBOS and EXO suggesting that the protocol was able to properly uh, isolate AVs. Moreover, there is a tendency of the highest AV marker positivity at 15 and 24 hours post-exercise, um, suggesting that uh, uh, there is an increase in AVs after exercise, which could uh, reveal metabolic changes and muscle adaptation to physical activity. In conclusion, salivary AVs could represent an innovative source of exercise biomarker that would allow the development of standardized exercise protocols, uh, both in a clinical and athlete setting. And uh, for this purpose, further experiments would require to add more subjects and to employ more markers, such as HSP70 and L1CAM. Thanks for the attention. Thank you, Stephanie, for your presentation. The next is Veronica Gentilini. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Cancer is uh, an important problem for public health. In the last decades, considering progress in tumor treatment, early detection through screening, and also considering aging, there has been a decrease in cancer death rate. At the same time, it means that the number of cancer survivors has increased. It's estimated that in Italy they are 3.6 million and that 23 percent of them are people who survived breast cancer. That's why it's important to consider the prevention of tumor recurrency. Tumor recurrency is based on a biological phenomenon called clinical dormancy, as this slide shows, or also cancer dormancy. In vitro, we can reproduce this process by adopting 3D culture models. This um, study um, is based on the use of these models because uh, they can uh, mimic cancer growth after dormancy and in these models uh, can, uh, cancer cells grow on a same solid medium. With um, these models we can better represent uh, the hallmark of carcinogenesis and also um, with the 3D co-culture we can better represent the tumor microenvironment. We want to adopt these models because they can help us in reaching the aims of the study. The first aim is the evaluation of the role of chemopreventive compounds in different culture conditions that can mimic physiological changes. At first, we are going to test high cosonide oil and metformin at different concentrations. And the second aim is the evaluation of the biological effects of physical activity. Um, regarding this second aim, we can start from some preliminary results. Our research team has already demonstrated the anti-proliferative effects of physical exercise on cancer cells. 
we wanted to go in deep analyzing uh, the type and the intensities of exercise also in combination with the chemopreventive compounds. This uh, study is based on a translational research approach and it wants to identify novel chemopreventive compounds and the exercise to administer to cancer survivors. That's why it could have an important impact on the context of tertiary prevention to reduce cancer relapse risk and mortality. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Veronica, for your presentation. The next is Martin Perio. Good morning for everyone and uh, thank you for being present uh, this morning. So I will to present uh, the Sweet Movies study uh, beyond fasting sugar level in postmenopausal women with previous breast cancer enrolled in the Movies trial. So uh, you can see in this first slide the experimental design. Um, we enrolled 16 breast cancer survivors and uh, uh, this uh, patients who were uh, randomized into, group, into groups. Uh, the intervention, the control arm, received only the healthy lifestyle guidelines uh, regarding physical activity and Mediterranean diet, while intervention arm, um, in addition to the same healthy lifestyle guidelines, uh, followed a 12 week of aerobic exercise training um, characterized by incremental duration from 20 to 60 minutes and uh, intensity from 14 to 70 percent of uh, earth rate reserve. Um, on the left you can see uh, the principal assessment that we have performed at baseline and after a uh, 12 week period intervention and the principal aim of this study is to evaluate the um, 12 week of aerobic exercise training program, the effect, of, or the effect of this exercise in breast cancer survivors. Um, so now you can see an example of uh, um, continuous uh, flash continuous glucose device monitoring because uh, um, the um, glycemic variabilities uh, were analyzed in the first and the last 14 days of uh, uh, intervention period. And now I want to show you some preliminary results regarding anthropometric and cardiorespiratory measurements. You can see that how, uh, we expect that there is a cardiorespiratory fitness improvement all in intervention arm <coughs> due to the aerobic exercise training program. Uh, so, um, you can see that uh, uh, fasting uh, uh, blood glucose uh, did not change uh, in both groups after intervention, but uh, uh, some important uh, indices of uh, uh, insulin resistance as uh, OMA index and insulin changed in both groups, uh, probably because uh, also control arm received uh, the same guideline uh, of lifestyle intervention. In the last table, you can see uh, some analysis uh, regarding the time spent in uh, hypoglycemic, uh, um, physiologic uh, ranges, and uh, hyperglycemic range of uh, blood glucose level. And uh, you can see that uh, the control arm uh, tends to slightly decrease the time spent in physiological ranges and tends to increase the time spent in uh, hyperglycemic ranges. Uh, especially uh, glucose level above uh, 116 milligrams per deciliter, and while the intervention arm um, tends to decrease the time spent in hyperglycemic ranges and tends to keep stable the uh, time spent in normal glycemic ranges. And thank you for attention. Thank you, Marta, for your presentation. And the next is uh, Sara Maestrini. Good morning, everyone. Okay. 
So good morning, everyone. My PhD project concerns the drug discovery in human leishmaniasis, where human leishmaniasis is a complex of vector-borne parasitic disease caused by protozoa of, Leishma of Leishmania genus that affects large population in vast areas of the world and also the Mediterranean region is endemic for Leishmania infantum. Leishmania is a dimorphic parasite that develops as promastigote in the insect vector and has a mastigote in the host macrophages. There is no vaccine against Leishmania disease yet and the therapeutic options are limited and highly toxic, showing moreover emergic drug resistance. So, in this context, the aim of my project is to find a new or existing molecule that can be used as a new therapeutic option for human leishmaniasis. So, we started testing the gallium protoporphyrin, which is a protoporphyrin that, instead of iron, contains gallium. And because of the importance of iron for leishmania metabolism, the molecule could offer the parasite a substance similar to iron, but ultimately harmful to the, to the parasite itself. Then we test the vitality of Leishmania major promastigotes through MTSCA, which is a colorimetric method to monitor the activity of, enzyme, of the mitochondrial enzymes after 72 hours of treatment with different concentration of the molecule, concentration ranging from 0.08 micromolar to 50 micromolar. Before doing that, we analyzed the growth of Leishmania major promastigotes in RPMI medium at different concentration of FPS, seeing that the growth of the parasite in this medium is very slowly and in any case dependent on the concentration of FPS. Then we performed the MTSSA with two different media, RPMI and RPMI-PY, seeing that RPMI-PY was the best option not only for the growth of the parasite, but also in highlighting the effect of the molecule, as we can see in this graph. In fact, with this medium, we, uh, we saw that so the MTS results showed that the molecule causes parasite growth inhibition in a dose-dependent manner and also dependent on the concentration of FBS, as we can see with an EC50, so an half maximal inhibitory concentration of 0.6 micromolar, as we can see from the curve of inhibition. In conclusion, we can say that the gallium protoporphyrin seems to be effective against Leishmania major promastigotes and to have a cytostatic effect. Further studies are on the way to validate these results, but also to investigate uh, in vitro antiparasitic activity of the molecule in infected cells. I want to thank you everyone for the attention, Professor Emanuela Frangipani and Dr. Sari Zani for providing us the galloprotoporphyrin to test against the parasite, and also for providing us the scientific advice to do that. Professor Luca Galluzzi, Professor Mauro Magnani, Dr. Aurelio Tallevi, and Dr. Marcello Ceccarelli. Thank you, Sara, for your presentation. The next is Ludovica Montesi. Good morning, good morning to everyone. Um, I'm Ludovica Montesi and I'm a first year PhD student. My PhD project is titled Shear Stress and Neuronal Pathologies, Organ and Chip Model to Study Neurovascular Interaction. Cerebrovascular disease are disorders that affect the blood flow and blood supply to the brain, causing around 9 million deaths each year. Recent research has found an association between cerebrovascular disease and neurological disorder, such as Parkinson, dementia, and Alzheimer. Despite decades of research, the link between blood flow alteration and brain expansion remains elusive. One of the main reasons is the, the complexity of the neurovascular unit, a unique structure composed by multiple cells, neuron, astrocyte, pericyte, and endothelial cells. Because of this complexity, there is a scarcity of adequate models that recapitulate brain physiology in health and disease. Actually, uh, the most common techniques are in vitro cell culture, which are study culture, and animal culture, which differ from human beings. 
With the advent of new technology, a new platform was developed called Organ on Chip. Between the advantages of the Organ on Chip, there is the possibility to reproduce the human brain, the possibility to hot flow, and last but not least, it has low cost features. During my PhD, I have three main aims. The first one is to develop a human relevant NVU organ on chip platform, identify the metabolic interaction in the NVU components under she stress, and target this interaction to damage the neural dysfunction. During these first eight months, we achieved the first aim, that is to say, the creating of the first organ on chip. This step including the choose of materials and the biocompatibility test. In the meantime, we create the first NVU building blocks composed by endothelial cells and neuronal cells. Regarding the future step, the target is to evaluate the cells under shared stress, in particular endothelial and neuronal cells. I would like to end my presentation by thanking my, the, my supervisor, Dr. Rossana Rauti, co-supervisor Riccardo Cuppini, and the collaborator uh, Casettari and Dr. Mattia Tiboni for the precious self uh, during this month, and thank you all for the attention. Thank you, Ludovica, for your presentation. The next is uh, Giorgia Piccioni. Good morning, everyone. My PhD project is focused on the role of enterococci in the spread of uh, antibiotic resistance in human through the food chain. Enterococci are comments of human animal gastrointestinal tract that have become uh, pathogens of primary importance to the circulation of worry, vancomycin resistant enterococci. The circulation of worry outside the nosocomial area was caused by the use of avoparchin in animal as boundary, uh, a structural analog of vancomycin, uh, and then banned because suspected by the cause of cross resistance to um, vancomycin. Then, in the same way, uh, the, our the use in veterinary medicine of orphanical is selecting for cross-resistant to uh, linezolid, an antibiotic used only in clinic to treat worry infection. Indeed, the, the two antibiotics uh, share the same resistant genes, CFR, OPTRA, and POXTA. The aim of this research is to evaluate the actual risk of spread of antibiotic resistance through the food chain. The samples were collected during different phases of the wine supply chain, and we are able to confirm the presence of enterococci in all phases with a greater uh, predominance in the first two phases. Then we uh, evaluate the genomic variability of our sample by PFG and the endograms. We are able to confirm that enterococci have a high genomic plasticity that allow them to easily acquire new R genes. Then we want to evaluate phenotypic and genotypic antibiotic resistance to vancomycin and linezolid um, by uh, agar diffusion, MIC, and PCR. All 92 samples were uh, sensitive to vancomycin and 15 were resistant to linezolid. The detection of uh, antibiotic resistance uh, uh, genes to linezolid were all present with a greater predominance of OPTRA. Then we want to evaluate the ability to transfer linezolid resistant determinants by conjugation, and three out of 15 strains were able to uh, transfer antibiotic determinants, and they uh, belonging to Enterococcus fecalis. The transconjugants uh, were confirmed by STREC, PCR, MIC, and PFG. In conclusion, we can say that meat animal farm continue to be an hotspot for onset and spread of antibiotic resistant microorganisms that can reach human through the food chain. In uh, this day, we are uh, um, testing the persistence of plasmin carrying antibiotic resistant genes in relation to exposure to a, a gastrodenal digestion in vitro to confirm the effective involvement of food chain in the spread of antibiotic resistance. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Georgia, for your presentation. The next uh, is uh, Javeira Rias. Good morning, everyone. I am pleased to be part of this meeting. I would like to share something about my research project. 
my research project is antimicrobial resistance and virulence factors in salmonella species isolated in the last 18 years from market region Italy. First of all, the introduction to my project is as it's a gram negative bacterium and is a food borne pathogen. And salmonellosis is the second most reported food borne gastrointestinal infections in humans and is a major cause of food borne outbreaks in Europe. Here we can see the clinical manifestations and transmission mechanisms of human salmonellosis. My major aim of study is to assess the distribution and trends of antimicrobial resistance and virulence genes in a wide salmonella strain panel from the poultry chain according to whom. Here I will share some materials and methods. First of all, the collection of salmonella strains from market region, followed by phenotypic detections of antimicrobial resistant profiles provided by Reference Center for Enteric Pathogens and phenotypic detections on XLD. And the third step is genotypic detections by DNA extraction followed by genus-specific PCR with TTRC gene and P25 probe, and PCR analysis for virulence genes, and finally, the statistical analysis. These are my virulence factors. My targeting genes contain Salmonella pathogenicity island 1, Salmonella pathogenicity island 2, and some other genes performing different functions like flagellar proteins, survival in host, and outer membrane proteins. I would like to share some of my preliminary results. Here we have a huge panel of strains collected that is from 50% wet food, 25% from human clinical samples, and 25% from surface water. We have seen a highest resistance in tetracycline followed by sulfixazole and ampicillin. Here are the results for genotypic characterization and distribution and trends of antimicrobial resistance. It's showing its resistance uh, of different strains towards similar results towards same antibiotics. And the second graph is showing the graphical representation over three periods of from three different sources. I would like to conclude my results. A wide screen panel has been studied and confirmed by genus-specific PCR. And preliminary statistical analysis showed an increasing trend of resistance, as you can see, in human and surface water. But a declining trend in surface water should be better investigated. Preliminary test with positive control has allowed the optimization of PCR-based methods for other strains too. My future perspectives are rendered as testing a full strain panel for virulence genes distribution and statistical analysis of significance to investigate AMR features and virulence genes distribution to, uh, for better understanding of pathogenic potential of salmonella in market region. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Javera, for your presentation. The next is Enrica Sordini. Good morning, everyone. I'm Enrica Sordini, and my supervisor is Stefano Amatori, and my co-supervisor is Mirko Fanelli. My PhD project is focused on studying uh, the biological effects of uh, new synthetic molecules derived, derived from kojic acid. Kojic acid belongs to hydroxypyrons, a family of molecules exhibiting antiproliferative activity against different cancer models, in particular hematopoietic models, and demonstrated the uh, ability to modulate the expression of genes having key roles in um, cell cycle progression and apoptosis. First, we screened in vitro the antiproliferative efficacy of four different subgroups of kojic acid derived compounds uh, for a total of 12 molecules synthesized by um, the chemistry laboratory of the professor Fusivieri on U937 cell line at 10 micromolar concentration for 48 hours of treatment. The same condition used in the NCI60 human tumor cell line screen from NIH. The results demonstrated that Akenam group induces a strong reduction in cell of the cell survival in U937 cells. 
In the light of this, uh, we decided to uh, investigate the uh, biological effect, uh, biological eff effect, yes, um, of uh, Akenam group at the same condition of the screening, extending the evaluation to 24 hours of treatment. The results confirm that this group of molecules exerts an antiproliferative anti effect by reducing uh, the cell survival in unitary seven cells. Subsequently, we focused on the most biologically active molecule in a dose-response experiment to define the best optimal con subletal condition for uh, conducting uh, subsequent uh, studies. At uh, 0.1 micromolar, we observe a significant uh, reduction in, uh, of the cell survival that decreases in a dose-dependent manner until higher concentration where the percentage of uh, um, viable cells are dramatically reduced. The IC50 at 24 hours is 1.25 micromolar. Further analysis will be useful to deepen the antiproliferative mechanism of the kojic acid derived compounds in study. Thanks for the attention. Thank you, Erika, for your presentation. The next is uh, Angelo Squarti. Good morning. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Angelo Sparti, and uh, uh, the main goal of my research project is to understand the molecular mechanisms uh, that allow Ewing sarcoma cells to uh, proliferate and survive apoptotic cell death. Um, to support these studies, we are using a fully human monoclonal antibodies uh, produced by Diativa. Uh, that recognize CD99, uh, which is a, a membrane glycoprotein uh, with multiple functions such as uh, cell adhesion, um, cell cell communication, and trafficking. <coughs> okay. No. Um. <laughs> From the scientific literature, we know that CD99 triggering by monoclonal antibodies uh, can cause caspase independent cell death uh, called metwosis. Uh, metwosis, according to these studies, uh, would um, represent an inability of these cancer cells to uh, counteract the micropinocytosis um, that uh, um, inuring uh, sarcoma cells. Uh, this suggests that there is an alteration of the endosomal lysosomal system that, uh, in the case of CD99 triggering, um, it, uh, doesn't allow to digest micropinosomes uh, that accumulate within the cell. Uh, first, uh, we started studying uh, the antibody kinetics uh, to identify the best times to um, study the cellular response to uh, treatment with antibody. Uh, preliminary results show 71% of internalization uh, of the antibody of the complex, um, the antibody antigen complex, after three hours of treatment. An interesting feature of this uh, uh, process is that when the complex internalized, there is at the same time um, a new CD99 uh, membrane export. Um, additional preliminary results um, support our initial hypothesis. In fact, uh, in this slide we see images obtained in confocal microscopy uh, where there is a decrease of acid compartments um, um, of in a TC71 cell line after the treatment with antibody. Although the study method is still to be optimized by flow cytometry, um, if we compare the acid levels of uh, this line to uh, MOL13, which is a, a cell line of acute myeloid leukemia characterized by high expression of CD99, exactly like um, Ewing sarcoma, uh, we see that Ewing sarcoma cells, um, even um, um, uh, without treatment, uh, have a significantly lower level of acid compartments. Uh, the next studies uh, will be carried out following three different strategies. 
uh, use of selective inhibitors, um, gene silencing using uh, uh, interference RNA, and antibody labeling with new probes with a common goal to understand the um, interactions between antibodies, D99, and other key mediators, mediators of these uh, uh, particular cell death, that is metosis, and to define the intracellular environment, such as the acidic state, with a, um, a final goal to uh, design new uh, therapies. Thank you. Thank you, Angelo, for your presentation. The next is Davide Torre. Oh, thank you for the presentation. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, the title of the presentation is the Analysis of Cellular Immune Response Against SARS-CoV-2 in Vaccinated and Convalescent Patients. Okay, uh, the vaccination has played a critical role in, uh, during the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic and uh, um, a critical role in the pandemic just a second and uh, and as everybody know the main uh, aim of the vaccination has been um, induce a strong humoral response but everybody have to take in account that also a cellular response comes into play in fact, we know that uh, T cell and B cell cross talk uh, during an infection. That brought us to uh, start an evaluation of cellular response following a, a different profile of vaccination. And uh, the profile that we anal analyzed were the homologous, homologous vaccinated uh, with uh, two doses of AstraZeneca or Pfizer and uh, the heterologous vaccinated with uh, one uh, dose of uh, AstraZeneca and the second of Pfizer. Um, okay, to assess this analysis, we started from uh, mononuclear cells of, uh, perifer uh, from peripheral blood of uh, donors, and we analyzed the B cell and T cell activation. Um, okay. To perform the first, we start exposing a cell to antigens coming from the spike or nucleocapsid protein of the virus. And um, these antigens were tethered to a um, fluorophore that led us to uh, calculate the percentage of antigen-specific memory B cell. Regarding the T-cell, we used uh, peptide pools, also in this time uh, with the peptides from uh, the nucleocapsid or the spike protein, and we stimulate the T-cell and measure the cytokine production and activation market expression. Preliminary results have shown a distinct activation profiles between patients, and uh, we will for sure uh, investigate, investigate uh, more this aspect in order to try to understand if there is any correlation between the uh, in state of the immune cellular response and uh, the vaccination profile. Um, but unfortunately, uh, we had also high variability inside the vaccination group. And to overcome this problem, with, uh, we'll, we will continue the analysis and uh, add more data and generate more solid results. Thank you for the attention. Thank you, Davide, for your presentation. Okay, well, I'd like to thank all the first year PhD students that contributed to this first session. Thank you all. And now we can move to the second year PhD students. So I invite Marta Imperio, who will chair this session. Thank you very much, Marta, for chairing this session. 
So, uh, the first speaker is uh, Abbas Faiza. I'm Faiza Abbas and I'm working with characterization of artificially produced red blood cells drive extracellular vesicles by flow cytometry. So uh, RBCs, EVs can be used for the therapeutic application because of uh, several reasons, because they are safe, biocompatible and not immunogenic. RBCs, EVs can be used, uh, like, uh, drugs can be encapsulated in such kind of EVs and can be used for the therapeutic applications. Uh, characterization of such artificially produced drug-loaded EVs is highly needed as well as their intracellular uptake, which is the current uh, aim of, of my study. So, so to proceed with this, uh, I started with the purification of RBCs, then I loaded my drug inside uh, our red blood cells. Finally, with, from the red loaded uh, RBCs, we produce extracellular vesicle by physical vesiculation method. Finally, by serial ultracentrifugation, we uh, isolate our uh, EVs, and finally, we perform flow cytometric analysis. For the flow cytometric analysis, we label our uh, RBCs EVs with the anti-glycophorin antibody, with the LCD, then with an exin, and anti-CD47 antibody, and phalodine. We also check for the uh, fish taxprin to monitor the tracer inside the vesicles. And then we also check for this uptake, but to follow the uptake uh, in the cells, we label our EVs with the PKH 20, 26. Something about results. On the left panel, you can see that high expression of the LCD, glycophorin A and CD47 was observed in our both loaded, loaded and unloaded sample. Uh, however, uh, anaxin was low, that was 15%. In the panel B, you can see that uh, fish dextrin uh, signal can be clearly detected in our loaded sample. Uh, however, the MFI was critically low. 30% uh, of our sample were positive for the phalogen. Something about the uptake. Here you can see that uh, Hubex cells were uptaking over uh, EVs at 4 hours, and the cells were even viable at 24 hours. So, uh, at, for regarding PPNs MC, you can see that uh, over um, at, f at four hour, uh, monocytes were uptaking the uh, EVs. Like around 30% uh, of, of the monocytes were uptaking EVs. At 24 hour, 90% of, of, of the monocytes were taking uptaking the EVs. So I would like to conclude my study that this flow cytometer can detect and characterize such artificially produced EVs. High positive to LCD and the glycophorin and um, low percentage of lenexin can mm, indicate that this proposed method of production maintain the lineage membrane receptor as in the natural EVs. Uh, analysis of the HUEC show that this kind of EVs are non-toxic element to the cells. PBMC analysis show that uh, at uh, four hour monocytes were uptaking, uh, uptake by the monocyte was moderate, which indicate that uh, uh, this this can be linked to the late EV immune clearance, and this may be linked to the high expression of the CD47. So I would like to conclude my study that this kind of produced accessory vesicles can be used as a novel drug delivery system. However, the uh, protocol optimization is still needed. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. So the next speaker is uh, Abdallah Passant. Good morning everyone, I'm Passant Abdallah and today I'm going to talk about the use of new superparamagnetic nanoparticles in human red blood cells for potential diagnostic applications. So a little step back, last year we obtained very promising results using LS249, an iron oxide synthesized by our collaborators from CNR Lecce that can be efficiently encapsulated in the red blood cells without adhesion to their surface, does not alter the cell's morphology and leads to a strong decrease in milliseconds in NMR analysis of T1 and T2 relaxation times. So we decided to try to co-encapsulate it with fludarabine monophosphate, also known as Fludara or FMP, a representative antitumoral drug often used for the treatment of leukemia and non-Hodgkin lymphomas. 
The possibility to co-entrap nanoparticles and drugs at the same time could open up to a new theranostic approach able to improve treatment and diagnosis of tumors. The HPLC results demonstrated that a 10% of fluidar encapsulation corresponding to one 1.5 micromoles was obtained. And this table shows how the T1 and T2 virus of both LS249 fluidar loaded red blood cells and LS249 loaded red blood cells are similar, meaning that the presence of the drug did not alter the encapsulation of the nanoparticles. Also, we can say that we have no significant differences in the biological parameters between the uh, nanoparticle plus drug loaded red blood cells and the nanoparticle loaded red blood cells, since they are comparable to the unloaded red blood cells used as control. Also, the TEM images confirmed the effective presence of the iron oxides inside the cells and that we have no alteration in the cell's morphology. So after trying with Lurbin, we decided also to try to load and encapsulate for the first time three new and sever platinated guanosine derivatives. And we evaluated the biological parameters to verify the cell's viability. This table shows how the loading of the three complexes did not alter the hematological properties of the erythrocytes, since all the results are comparable to the unloaded red blood cells, also in this case used as control. In particular, we have a pretty high cell recovery for all the samples analyzed. After the encapsulation, our collaborators performed NMR spectral acquisition to assess the amounts encapsulated. Here we have a representative uh, spectra obtained for complex one. On the left, we have the unloaded red blood cells with their uh, met uh, endogenous metabolites. And on the right, we have in A, the unloaded red blood cells, in B, the complex one loaded red blood cells, and in C, complex one loaded red blood cells added with known amounts of uh, complex one. We can say that the loading was successful since these two peaks here are higher when the complex one is added to the erythrocytes, and these two peaks are not present in the unloaded sample. Also in this case, the TAM confirmed that we have no alteration in the cell's morphology, and the loading procedure was successful for all the three complexes, resulting in 0 0.35, 0 0.43, and 0 0.16 millimolar. If you want to know more about my work, please, you're welcome to my poster, and special thanks to Dr. Antonella Antonelli and to Mauro Magnani, my supervisor. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next speaker, Agostini Rachele. Good morning, everyone. I'm Rachele Agostini, and I'm in my second year of the PhD pro program. My PhD project is focused on the characterization of the vesicular secretome in an in vitro cellular model of rhabdomyosarcoma. For this study, we have employed the three cell lines, three cancer cell lines, RD control cells that are transfected with an empty vector, and RD CAV1, FO, and F2 cells that are transfected with a plasmid that allows the overexpression of Cavolin 1. Cavolin 1 is an integral membrane protein that is uh, widely involved in the process of tumor progression and in the process of signal transduction. Last year, I presented my very first results. Uh, we have uh, isolated the extracellular vesicles released by these uh, three cell lines by using um, uh, an ultracentrifugation protocol. And uh, we uh, characterized these vesicles by TEM analysis, nanoparticle tracking analysis, and Western blot analysis. TEM analysis show a rearrangement of the rd cav one plasma membrane and a greater number of protrusions compared to the control. NTA analysis showed that RD cells overexpressing CAV1 release more extracellular vesicles, and in particular more small extracellular vesicles compared to the control. And Western blot analysis shows that these small extracellular vesicles released by RD CAV1 cells do not express the tetraspan in CD9 and CD81, which instead are detected in the control. Uh, this year, we have confirmed these results by performing flow cytometry analysis, and we have extended the uh, extracellular vesicles characterization 
by performing proteomic and lipidomic analysis. In particular, flow cytometry analysis and proteomic analysis have confirmed the Western blot results, and in particular the findings on tetraspanin, um, highlighting the potential ability of Kavolin-1 to alter not only the amount of vesicles released, but also their composition. Likewise, lipidomic analysis showed a clear clustering of RD, FO, and F2 samples compared to the control. So taken together, uh, these data support the hypothesis of the involvement of Kavolin-1 in the process of vesicular loading. So uh, further studies will be conducted in order to um, complete the extracellular vesicles characterization uh, by performing uh, myrnomic analysis and to directly test these vesicles on those cells that are typically present in the tumor microenvironment, like uh, UVEX and monocytes. For all the details, you can come to visit my poster at the poster session. I want to thank uh, Guescini's research group and all of you for your attention. Thank you. Um, the next speaker, Ayum Rui. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ruhi Anjum. I'm from India, currently a second year PhD student. So my research is focused on the UBC gene knockout strategy by using CRISPR-Cas9 technology. As we all know that gastric cancer is one of the most uh, common and lethal cancers, and it was found that previously alteration in the ubiquitin proteasome system play a very important role in the carcinogenetic processes. Also, uh, ubiquitin genes were found upregulated in the various cancers. So in the previous studies, the knockdown of the ubiquitin genes in the lung cancer cells and few other cancer cells found to be inhibit the cell growth. So in our study, we were trying to focus, can the same effects be found in the gastric cancer also or not? So before my arrival to Urbino, our lab was working on the two gastric cancer cell lines in, in where they compared the primary and metastatic gastric cancer cell lines. And they found that serina-based mediated knockdown of both the ubiquitin genes has caused reduced cell viability and have induced apoptosis induction in the primary cell line only. But uh, the knockdown was not efficient in the UBC gene. So to solve this problem, I, uh, uh, I started working on another strategy that was uh, the CRISPR-mediated knockout of the UBC gene with the aim of uh, deletion the complete UBC codon and then found the effects of the deletion in the ubiquitin pools and then further study the proliferation in the gastric cancer cell lines. So first of all, we started with the guided RNA design and then we performed cloning. And then the uh, transfection of the positive clones into the gastric cancer cells. And then the next uh, step was to, val to do validation of the selected guided RNAs into the gastric cancer cells. So for the results, this image uh, shows the transfection of the um, guided RNAs into the gastric cancer cell lines. And this is the one primary. And this one is the metastatic cell lines. Transfection was acceptable. This uh, uh, PCR amplification of guided RNA confirms that deletion of the ubiquitin gene. These are the bands that correspond to the deletion uh, in the primary cell line and here in the metastatic cell line. We also checked the ubiquitin gene expression in the guided RNA transfected cells and we found significantly reduced ubiquitin messenger RNAs in the cells that were treated with CRISPR-Cas9 guided RNAs in both of the cell lines. Then we also uh, perform Western blood analysis to quantify ubiquitin, free ubiquitin into the cell pools, and we have found uh, reduced free ubiquitin in both of the cell lines here with these bands you can see. So in summary, what we, we have concluded that UBC messenger RNA levels was reduced in the CRISPR-treated cells, also with the reduction of the total ubiquitin level. And currently, we have made a clonal expansion of the transfected GC cell lines with a further aim to perform further future analysis. And hence, now I can conclude that this strategy of using UBC gene knockout can be very useful in the cancer treatment in future. Thank you so much, everyone. 
Thank you so much. The next speaker, Bagherlo Nazanin. Hello everyone, uh, my research uh, project uh, focused on this title, Clozapine causes mitochondrial dysfunction during the autobiogenic uh, process in human liposarcoma, SW872 cells. Uh, clozapine belongs to second generation, uh, second generation antipsychotic anti drugs, and it's uh, widely used for treatment of uh, for treatment of uh, schizophrenia, particularly in patients uh, in patients showing resistance to first generation antipsychotics. There are some advantages and also some disadvantages related to this uh, drug. And for uh, disadvantages, we can see, uh, we can uh, say metabolic side effects, uh, such as uh, weight gain and uh, dysregulation of glucose. And there are also, uh, in uh, literature, uh, there are some uh, reports uh, in um, correlation between metabolic syndrome and mitochondrial dysfunction in patients treated with second, uh, second uh, generation antipsychotic drugs. Around the background um, in uh, our um, group, uh, according to previous uh, results uh, in our lab, uh, they characterized the autopogenic process in human SW cells uh, in uh, the following uh, 10 days, and also uh, they evaluated effect of clozapine during autopogenesis in this cell model. If I want to uh, explain some uh, results, we can say that clozapine uh, reduced, um, redu uh, uh, clozapine 50 micromolar uh, significantly reduced uh, mitochondrial biogenesis and, ma uh, and mass. And uh, if you want to explain more uh, for uh, mitochondrial Biogenesis, um, we evaluated uh, for mitochondrial biogenesis. Uh, we evaluated uh, empty DNA uh, and also um, expression of uh, PGC1 alpha, also MTG, and uh, um, another. Um, sorry. Uh, if, we want, uh, if we want to also uh, explain more about um, sorry. I can explain more, sorry. Okay, we have to post the session. You know, these are why these meetings are for. You know, to just have the, it's an opportunity just to talk about your work. There's no pressure. Thank you for your talk. Uh, the next is Gubitosa Federica. Hi everyone, uh, today I would like to talk about the importance of callus culture. 
What is a callus culture? Callus culture is an in vitro technique that allows us to propagate fragments of plant tissue. In plant biology, the term callus refers to a mass of undifferentiated cells that form on the surface of plants following an injury. These cells can then differentiate in any part of the original plants. Callus can also be obtained in laboratory to propagate any part of plants we are interested in. To do this, three steps are required, an induction phase, a division phase, and a differentiation phase. Thanks to this technique, it is possible to produce also secondary metabolites, which we know are an important source of active drugs capable of exerting a wide range of biological activity useful for human health. To do this, it is necessary to maintain cells in a relatively low growth state, corresponding to a higher accumulation of secondary metabolites. It's important to do this to establish conditions that allow the cells to remain in a phase of the cell cycle, where they don't divide, but at the same time, they don't die. In this project, we use the callus culture technique to produce high quantity of secondary metabolites. In particular, we use the pulp of an apple to produce uh, two callus culture, one grew in the light and one grew in the dark. Then, to emphasize the callus properties, a comparison was made between the biological activity of the hydroalcoholic extract obtained from calluses, peel, and pulp of an apple. In the first phase of the project, the optimal condition for callus culture were identified. Once calluses were obtained, they were dried and then resuspended in a 70% ethanol solution to make the hydroalcoholic extract. After that, the chemical characterization was performed, which revealed that uh, compared to pulp and peel, the polyphenols content of calluses was lower, while on the other end, the triterpenic acid content was extremely abundant. Uh, then we evaluated the biological activity and first through cell-free assay we demonstrated that calluses have a lower scavenging activity and a higher lipoxygenase inhibition activity compared to pulp and peel. Nicking assay revealed that callus grow in the dark can protect DNA in a better way compared to callus grow in the light, although the best protection is provided by the pulp. Finally, through cell-based assay, we evaluated the anti-inflammatory and antioxidant activity. Before proceeding, we selected the non-cytotoxic concentration. Then, uh, through the dichlorofluorescein assay, we found that pulp and peel have a strong antioxidant activity compared to calluses, while on the other end, calluses have a greater anti-inflammatory activity. Further research is in progress to best understand the calluses properties. Thank you for your attention, and uh, you are welcome to my poster. Thank you so much. The next, uh, Manzini Sofia. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Sofia Manzini, and I'm a second year of the uh, PhD program. Inflammation is a physiological response of the immune system to various stimuli and represents a crucial mechanism of defense, but its exacerbation can lead to tissue damage and can favor the onset of inflammatory pathologies. Moreover, inflammation is strictly dependent, uh, correlated to oxidative stress. In fact, uh, as inflammation can uh, induce oxidative stress, also oxidative stress can cause inflammation through the activation of uh, multiple pathways. In, uh, in this study, we focus on the modulation of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines provided by a small thiol molecule called I-152 in LPS-stimulated THP1 macrophages. In particular, um, I-152 uh, was used at a concentration of 0.25 millimolar um, as a pretreatment before the stimulation uh, with the LPS. Firstly, we decided to evaluate uh, cytokine expression, and we found that the I-152 decreased um, both at the transcription and secretum level the expression of uh, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, and in particular interleukin-1-beta and interleukin-18. 
Uh, these two last cytokines um, are released in, in the mature form after the cleavage uh, from um, NLP3 inflammasome uh, that uh, is a multi-protein complex uh, it, uh, that contains a protein, a sensor protein that is NLP3 and a effector protein, the uh, caspase, uh, caspase 1, uh, that makes uh, the cleavage. So we started uh, evaluating the, the uh, NLP3 uh, level, both uh, at the transcription and uh, protein level. And we found that uh, I-152 decreased both of them. And that could lead to a uh, dysregulation of uh, inflammasome uh, assembly. Then uh, we uh, investigate if our molecule could also modulate uh, to measure uh, pro-inflammatory transcription factors such as NFKB and AP1, and we found that uh, I-152 didn't affect uh, NFKB pathway, but it downregulated uh, AP1-mediated signaling. And uh, since uh, it's known that um, are both uh, two, uh, two redox trans uh, sensitive uh, uh, transcript factors, we evaluate uh, ROS uh, production, and it's evident that uh, I-152 uh, decrease uh, the, loss, uh, the ROS level. Finally, in this figure, we can summarize I-152 molecular target by which that molecule could modulate at the concentration test the inflammatory response. And about future perspective, we, can, we would like to evaluate the anti-inflammatory effect of that molecule, but use a higher concentration, and also investigate the, the is its anti-inflammatory activities again uh, in a SARS-CoV-2 infected models because um, this molecule uh, um, resulted uh, able to, to inhibit the SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection in an in, in vitro model. Thanks for the attention. Thank you. The next uh, Monito La Francesca. Good morning, everyone. So we are studying the uh, changes in proteostasis focusing on the proteasome system uh, during senescent macrophages. And to do that, we performed an in vitro model of aging uh, that involved the isolation of peripheral blood mononuclear cells from human buffy coat. Uh, monocytes were separated from lymphocytes and inferiorated into macrophages by plastic adhesion. On day six, monocytes were differentiated into macrophages because they expressed uh, the macrophage differentiation markers such as CD11, CMB, and TORAC receptor 4. Macrophages were maintained in culture until day 30, and we observed that on day 12, macrophages started to become senescent, and on day 30, uh, they show a senescent phenotype. In fact, the cells on day 12 and uh, on day 30 were enlarged and flattened, so acquired a morphology typical of the senescent cells. They were positive to the sudden black staining that detected the lipofuzzing, that is an accumulation of oxidized proteins, lipids, and metals that is known to accumulate in aging. And uh, they were positive to senescent society beta-galatosidase activity. Moreover, the upregulation of P21 protein and the co-expression of P16 protein that are irreversible cell cycle inhibitors enhanced the uh, onset of senescence. In this model, we study uh, the proteasome system. Proteasome is a proteolytic complex that is made up of alpha and beta subunit rings. Three of the beta subunits show different catalytic activity, beta 1, 2, and 5. These three subunits are replaced by the counterpart immunosubunit, beta 1i, 2i, and 5i, in the immunoproteosome, that is an alternative proteasome constitutively expressed in immune cells. It is related to the immune function. This 20s corp can be associated to regulatory particles such as the 19s and the 11s regulatory particle. By native page analysis, we analyze the incorporation of subunits into active complexes. Uh, with panalpha staining, uh, we recognize two different molecular weight complexes, 
um, panalpha recognized both constitutive and the monoproteasome. So the lower molecular weight complex is the 20th score associated with the 11S regulatory particle, as demonstrated by the staining of PA28 antibody that is a subunit of this regulatory particle, and decrease in senescent macrophages. Meanwhile, uh, the higher molecular weight complex is the 20S associated with the 19S regulatory particle, as demonstrated by the staining of a PT4 that is a subunit of this regulatory particle, and this proteasome is called the 26S proteasome. Also, the 20S score composition changing during macrophage senescence. In fact, on the seven mac differentiating macrophages contained the 20S score in which the immune subunits were preferentially incorporated. Um, on, in, uh, in, on day 30, oh, see, 30, uh, senescent macrophages incorporated mainly the constitutive subunit beta 5 and beta 2. Also, the chemotrypsin-like activity decreased during senescent macrophages, and it is mainly associated to the 26S proteasome. So, these changes in proteasome and monoproteasome may be relevant to understand the macrophages' function in aging, and we have been programmed to, we have been programmed to uh, modulate, uh, to study how redox modulation can affect the proteasome system, and to analyze also the macrophages from old and young mice. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much. The next speaker, Osman Riam. Good morning, everyone. My research project is entitled Synovial Fluid Derived Extracellular Vesicles, Isolation and Characterization. What are the extracellular vesicles? EVs are a group of submicrine membrane derived vesicles. They can be broadly classified into three main classes the exosomes, the microvesicles, and the apoptotic bodies, displaying a diverse range of size, composition, and uh, cell sources. They have been detected in a variety of biological fluid, such as plasma, the urine, and the synovial fluid of inflamed joint. Since the studies on the synovial fluid-derived EVs are still limited, we thought about further characterizing and studying these EVs. So the first thing we did was collecting the synovial fluid from patients at the Rizzoli Orthopedic Institute in Bologna, where they aspired the synovial fluid from patients classified as having low inflammation, high inflammation, and osteoarthritis. Then we moved to, the, uh, to studying or evaluating the level of interleukin assay, which is a pro-inflammatory marker in the synovial fluid. And further, we start by separating these EVs using the ultracentrifugation. It's an approach that reflects particles that sediment uh, based on the ultracentrifugation forces. At the end, we can obtain basically three pellets, the MVS, the exosomes, and the contaminant. First, we start by quantifying the particles that we, we have in these pellets using the nanoparticle tracking analysis. Further, we need to see if the separation went well and that we obtain our pellets in our pellets, the EVs. So uh, this was confirmed by the positivity to the CD63, which is an exosomal typical marker. And further confirmation as well was done with the transmission electron microscopy observation our preliminary data showed that the level of interleukin assay, as you can see here, is different between the low inflammation, high inflammation, and lower condition, so letting us using the interleukin assay as a biomarker to classify the patients with different level of inflammation. Uh, further, the CD63 expression can be uh, showed that it is, has the highest level in the OA and the high inflammation level, suggesting that the synovial fluid-derived EVs are somehow implicated in the process of the inflammation. Further studies are underway uh, with the highest number of patients, first to confirm the data that we obtained, and second uh, to study the cell sources of these uh, synovial fluid-derived EVs. At the end, I need to thank all the persons who are contributing in the process of our work, and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Next speaker, Palma Francesco.
hello to all. So, um, the, okay. The viable but not culturable states is a particular survival strategy that many bacteria adopt in response to adverse environmental conditions. As we know, Bubiancy bacteria can be cultured on plates, remain viable, maintain the virulence, and also can resurrect if favorable growth conditions are given. Um, okay. And, sorry, and uh, moreover, many bacteria, human pathogen bacteria, uh, have been reported to enter in this kind, in this kind of um, state. So this is a very big problem for public health. And also some, um, some studies reported that uh, the use of UVC radiation, especially at UV doses up to 300 millijoules per centimeter square, can induce uh, um, this uh, kind of uh, state, um, this viable VBNC state in some kind of bacteria, including E. coli. So considering this, our aim was to identify uh, and evaluate the ability of um, a mercury UVC lamp used for air and surface sanification to induce a VBNC state in E. coli. And to reach our aim, first of all, E. coli suspension were subjected to two different stress factors that were UVC radiation and to the heat, where they later as used as a control. The protocol used to identify possible VBNC bacteria included uh, several analysis stages, which aim was to evaluate the culturability, the metabolic activity, and the enzymatic activity of our sample. Our preliminary results show that after, um, although the culturability tests were negative after heat treatment, um, resuscitation was achieved. And also, some results were obtained after UVC radiation, in which we also demonstrated the presence of enzymatic activity in our sample by a p-test. In conclusion, our preliminary study showed that uh, AVOBNC states have been induced in E. coli after UVC radiation, even at uh, UV doses above 300 millijoules centimeter square. But to confirm this, it will be necessary to perform some bioluminescence tests. And then lastly, a comparison with exposure to UVC LEDs and testing on airborne bacteria will be carried out. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. The next speaker, Panza Giovanna. My project is uh, a part of uh, PhD PON uh, in a green topics, um, which aim um, is um, found uh, a rapid test um, for environmental diagnosis. Um, our study focused on uh, hepatopancreatic cells of uh, Armadillidium vulgare, a uh, crustacea, and um, um, on tissue disaggregation in particular. And um, uh, another uh, goal, uh, a principal uh, goal, is uh, setting up uh, um, of uh, staining protocols uh, with the goal to establish a rapid and uh, reproducible test for the assessment of um, environmental quality. Um, this research is uh, divided in two parts, the ecological environmental and the biological one. Um, I support the samples collected uh, from uh, sites with different levels of uh, environmental stress were prepared uh, in the laboratory um, for uh, analysis by flow cytometry. And uh, for selected uh, uh, staining, the flow cytometric analysis uh, are uh, coupled to microscopic analysis. Um, thanks to data obtained in our analysis, we can affirm that uh, the best tissue disaggregation, sorry, the best tissue disaggregation uh, is a mechanical automated procedure. And um, the frequencies of S and B cells is approximately similar. 
Um, but uh, the most interesting data uh, came from the samples collected at uh, the Ginestreto landfill sites uh, that confirm that uh, samples from uh, sites uh, subjected to greater environmental ecological stress show an uh, alteration in uh, cellular function. Um, our study uh, would uh, allow hepatopancreatic cells of uh, Armadillidium vulgare to be efficiently analyzed by flow cytometry to design uh, useful tests for assessing the environmental quality. Another goal is, the, um, is to extend the sample size and to continue the validation of uh, specific protocols with the support of uh, other techniques uh, complementary to um, thanks to everyone, uh, in particular my supervisor, my co-supervisor and uh, my colleagues. And uh, if you are uh, curious uh, to know more, um, you are welcome uh, to my poster. Thank you so much. The next Scardino Arianna. Good morning, everyone. Okay. A my, a microbiological Influenced Corrosion, or MIC, is a complex biogeochemical process involving interactions between microorganisms, like bacteria, metasubstrates, such as steel, iron, and copper, and the related environmental conditions, and affect, in particular, the gas and oil industries, causing significant economical and environmental damages. Sulfate-reducing bacteria, or SRB, like the sulfovibrio species, are anaerobic bacteria, and their metabolism leads to the production of hydro hydrogen sulfide, highly corrosive to metal substrates. Recently, uh, bacteriophage recombinant endolysins has been, uh, have been uh, proposed as a novel class of innovative antibacterials. So the purpose of my PhD project is to use a recombinant endolysin to counteract bacterial growth and therefore MIC. In particular, my PhD project started from published evidence about a recombinant endolysin called artilysin encoded by a Pseudomonas aeruginosa bacteriophage. And this protein was used as a model to, uh, for um, the experimental design. Artilysin was induced, expressed, and purified by affinity chromatography and tested in vitro against Acinetobacter baumannii and Pseudomonas aeruginosa to confirm its bactericidal activity. Therefore, artilysin was tested against the Sulfovibrio vulgaris plantonic cultures, and we have obtained the promising results indicating uh, although this protein is encoded by a Pseudomonas aeruginosa bacteriophage. Uh, as you can see uh, by uh, epifluorescence microscopy experiment uh, that shown a good killing activity of artilysin against the Sulfovibrio vulgaris uh, with a 70% uh, decrease in cell numbers compared to untreated controls. Thank you for your attention, and I would like to thank uh, the microbiology group of UNIURP, in particular my supervisor, Professor Emanuela Frangipani, and uh, all uh, collaborators. And uh, I'm waiting uh, for you and my poster. Okay, I'd like to thank all the students, all the second year students and the chairs. Thank you very much. Uh, we now can have a little break. Actually, there's a coffee break upstairs. We'll be open throughout the lunch break. So uh, I would say let's resume in 20 minutes, so at 12.30, okay? Thank you.
Okay, well, thank you, welcome back. It is now time to resume the meeting. I invite here Passant Abdallah, who is the chair of this session. Thank you very much. So our first speaker will be Barattini Chiara. Okay, so thank you, Pazant. Today I will talk to you about uh, a comparison between two different methods to conjugate antibodies to fluorescent silicon nanoparticles. This is because uh, uh, the aim of my PhD project is to deliver a multimodal tool for targeted drug delivery in which antibodies and drug are covalently bound to fluorescent silicon nanoparticles. So the final idea is to deliver the drug directly on the side of action thanks to the presence of the antibody and to monitor this journey thanks to the presence of fluorescent silicon nanoparticles. The conventional method used to conjugate antibodies to nanoparticles uh, involves the use of the uh, TOLS group available on the reduced antibodies and the uh, melamide groups on nanoparticles to have a final thiosuximide product. This is a well-known reaction, also well characterized, but uh, unfortunately it suffers for several drawbacks such as poor yields and long working time, which was a very important parameter in an industrial environment. And so we decided to uh, look for a different approach. We decided to try with click chemistry, which is um, a technique developed uh, in the late 1990, which they, with the aim to simplify chemical reaction. In particular, our approach is a strain promodal kind azide uh, cycloaddition, in which the antibody were conjugated to a cross-linker ending with an azide group, and the nanoparticles to uh, a reagent called DBCO, which allows for the conjugation in absence of the cytotoxic copper catalyst uh, often used. This is very important because this, is, this kind of reaction can occur even on cell surfaces, in cell cytosols, and also in bodies. So it is very important to avoid the use of cytotoxic components. So we decided to use the same purification method for both the conjugates product to avoid a possible bias. This method has been optimized on the conventional uh, conjugation protocol and includes a preliminary size exclusion chromatography step followed by an affinity chromatography. So the quality of both the reagent has been tested in flow cytometry, also compared to the golden standard non-nanoparticle based. And as you can see from the histogram in the slide, the results uh, of the three reagents are almost comparable. Of course, as I previously told you, uh, from an industrial point of view, there are other parameters to be taken into account. For example, the final yield, the final purity degree, and also the working time. So, To see who is the winner uh, of this competition, I wait for you uh, in front of my poster. And I want to thank uh, both my teams uh, and also you for your attention. Thank you, Chiara. Our next speaker is Biancucci Federica.
Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Federica Biacucci, and the, to the topic of my project is multiomics approaches for therapeutic developments in ataxial injectasia. Ataxial injectasia is a rare autosomal recessive multisystemic disorder caused by biallelic mutation in ATM gene that codes for ATM protein. AT patients have a very complex phenotype. The aim of the study was to discover a new impaired pathway in AT and the possibility of ATM variants in reverting AT phenotype. For this, we performed a multiomics approach on well type and untransduced and transduced AT cells with four different ATM variants, ATM352, ATM453, ATM Synth, and MinATM. Um, the first step was the metabolomics experiment. Uh, metabolites were extracted, they were analyzed by HPLC-MS system. Data were acquired in data-dependent mode and were analyzed by compound discover software. The second step was the proteomics experiment. Uh, protein, uh, peptide obtained from protein digestion and uh, derived from the same cell lines were analyzed by uh, nano HPLC MS system. Data were acquired in data dependent mode and were analyzed by uh, protein discover software. Um, Primary results not shown have revealed the impairment of glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and redox metabolism in AT. ATM variant, variants were able to restore these impaired pathways. It should be noted a new altered pathway in AT, that is polyamine pathway. It is involved in different biological functions, such as uh, oxidant effect and uh, protein and acid nucleic synthesis. Our results have shown that uh, um, uh, the improvement of this pathway in AT cell uh, is probably due to the low level of s adenosyl methionine and high levels of ornithine. Moreover, we uh, found an improvement of this pathway in AT cell line transduced with variant ATM synth. In addition, uh, we found uh, uh, this regulation in a post-translational modification named iposination on EIF5A factor in AT, confirmed by Western blot. Additional studies are needed to clarify the biological significance of this path and the role of AT invariants in modulating this, uh, this pathway. Uh, more information are available on my poster and see you in the, the next section poster. Thank you, Federica. Our next speaker is Blandino Giulia. So good morning. Uh, the topic of our current research is the evaluation of reactive oxygen species formation during adipocyte differentiation and more specifically the mechanisms by which second generation psychotic drugs in particular clozapine are able to induce some effect related to the metabolic syndrome. So as I said before, clozapine is a second generation psychotic drug and it is used for the treatment of schizophrenia in those patients which are refractory to other treatments. And finally, the main side effect is related to the metabolic syndrome. So the results that I'm going to show today describe the effect of clozapine during the lipogenic process and um, using a liposarcoma cell line, which is SW872 cells. So first of all, uh, OVRED and the Western blot analysis and also PCR analysis of the CBP beta shows that clozapine slow down the lipogenic process and this effect is already evident at the beginning of the differentiation. Uh, Piper gamma expression doesn't change in terms of protein expression, but we have also other results showing that clozapine inhibited the nuclear translocation of these transcription factors. 
So as known, ROS and more in general, in general oxidative stress is related to several differentiation processes as the lipogenic one. So for this reason, reason we decided to investigate also the, um, the impact of ROS after treatment with this compound. And as we can see in the panel A, clozapine uh, slow down the DCF signal. And maybe this um, effect uh, um, is related to the inhibition of the phosphorylation of P47-FOX, um, which is uh, um, a NOx2 subunit. In order to investigate the consequences of the inhibition of NOx2, we decided also to check not only the protein level, but also the RNA of an RF2, and also the thalidoxine system, which is one of the most important antioxidant machinery in cell cells. And as we can see in, the pa in these panels, uh, clozapine uh, inhibited, inhibited all of these responses, uh, not only in terms of protein expression, but, but also in terms of, of um, activity of the thalidoxine enzymes. So finally, um, in order to investigate if clozapine could have some uh, impact uh, on uh, the activities of these um, pure recombinant proteins that belong to the aditaridoxine system, we decided also to investigate uh, the effect of this compound using these uh, recombinant proteins. But as we can see in these panels, uh, clozapine never modulates in vitro the activity of the taridoxine uh, reductase 1 and the taridoxine systems. So finally, what we can say in conclusion is that clozapine, through the inhibition of NOx2 activation, blocks the RF2 signal and the consequent antioxidant response. The lack of the antioxidant response generates an anticipation of the mitochondrial ROS production already at time 3, which leads to the mitochondrial dysfunction. This mitochondrial dysfunction could explain these metabolic impairments uh, um, induced by clozapine in these schizophrenic patients. And I would like to say thank to my supervisor, Mara Fiorani, and also to the other collaborators, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Giulia. The next speaker is Casanova Elena. So good morning. My research project uh, is focused on uh, uh, the characterization of uh, B cells non nocine lymphoma by multiparametric uh, um, flow cytometry analysis uh, implemented by uh, artificial intelligence model to analyze uh, a wide case series. We previously demonstrated how machine learning could uh, be helpful to distinguish essential from useful from useless surface marker uh, to analyze um, a big database of uh, uh, leukemia and lymphoma. Now we implemented our panel with a non-conventional and intracellular marker. We focused our attention uh, on a, an homogeneous group of tissue biopsies, and uh, we apply a predictive uh, power score in Python to assess the impact of each um, of each uh, of markers uh, I told you in defining each lymphoma category. All uh, uh, cases, uh, we have uh, 615 cases, uh, are um, um, received uh, diagnosis uh, confirmed by uh, histopathology referred to the eight major category of B cells lymphoma. And uh, uh, considering uh, as uh, um, significantly uh, statistic uh, um, predict power score uh, that uh, we have a value uh, greater than 0 to 2, uh, that the baseline score, we identified uh, um, the 10 markers more important uh, for the diagnosis and uh, surprisingly um, some of them are intracellular markers. To validate uh, the um, role of this marker, we uh, combine each of, one, each of uh, them 
uh, with all the other, and uh, we build a classification tree to separate the entire database in quasi-homogeneous groups of lymphoma. And finally, we applied the uniform manifold appro uh, approximation and projection, the UMAP dimensionality reduction technique, to divide the eight categories of lymphomas in cluster. Uh, as you can see on the left, uh, when uh, we applied the UMAP only to the 10 uh, markers assessed to have a greater impact on, on diagnosis, we obtained a uh, great separation between clusters, but we don't uh, uh, distinguish very well the um, categories of lymphoma while using uh, all the markers we have in our panel, independently to their importance uh, in diagnosis, we have a better distinction in uh, between the categories. Then in conclusion, uh, the implementation with arti artificial intelligence to flow cytometer could uh, contribute uh, significantly to an opti optimal diagnostic process, but uh, it is still being investigated whether it could be useful to um, predict uh, categories of uh, alteration useful to uh, have a new therapeutic purpose for our cases of uh, lymphoma. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. The next speaker is Giacomelli Luca. Hello everyone, my name is Luca Giacomelli and today I would like to explain the present studies about, about the secretion of extracellular vesicle from C2, C12 myotubes during a low frequency or high frequency electrical pulse stimulation. Recently, electrical pulse stimulation, named also EPS, has been suggested as an in vitro model to reproduce uh, different types of exercise in uh, skeletal muscle cells. Here, we proposed two different EPS models to reproduce uh, a low load exercise using a low frequency electrical pulse and a high load exercise using a pulse strain in high frequency. These EPS models allowed us the isolation directly uh, from uh, uh, in, see, cell medium of two fractions of extracellular vesicles, uh, which are called 10 kilos EVs and 100 kilos EVs, using differential ultracentrifugations. Then we have quantified and characterized these two fractions in their exosomal tetraspanin CD81 content. The LTH activity in condition at the cell medium uh, was measured to assess uh, a potential EPS-related damage, and it does not uh, increase uh, during a six-hour or also an 80-hour EPS sessions in both low-frequency or high-frequency sessions, indicating non-damaging contraction activity in C2, C12 myotubes. In nanoparticle tracking analysis, only 100 kilos EVs uh, 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 released from uh, myotubes uh, contracted during uh, an 80-hour high-frequency EPS session showed a small increment respect to the negative control, with no significant variations in other conditions. In NTA mode size data, it is not worthy that uh, EPS derived 100 kilos EVs present a typical exosome dimensions uh, around 100 nanometers. Using fax analysis, uh, CD81 positive particles were detected in 10 kilos EV pellet uh, released in both low frequency and high frequency session of 18 hour duration. And moreover, Western blood results uh, showed a faint CD81 signal in 18-hour high-frequency 100 kilos EV sample, which was absent 
in the control and in low frequency 100 kilos EV samples. Altogether, these results uh, of CD81 expression and uh, NTA analysis uh, could reveal a uh, secretory activity in the skeletal muscle cells uh, modulated by exercise, especially in high load session. And for any question, you are welcome to my poster. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luca. Our next speaker is Maricolo Elisa. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my project focuses on a fundamental protein of the plant kingdom, Clavada 3 that is a part of the cleft family characterized by a common structure um, which consists in the presence of a signal peptide, a variable domain and a clade domain. This protein, Clavata 3, acts in meristematic tissues, establishing a negative feedback control against the transcription factor Buschel. In this way, these two proteins regulate the plant uh, development and um, the normal growing of the plant both upwards and down in the ground. Clavata 3 is commonly considered a secretory protein due to the presence of the signal peptide. Therefore, the protein is secreted in the apoplast where some proteolytic enzymes are able to cut it into the active uh, dodecapeptide form, able to bind the receptor complex. However, uh, previous experiments conducted with the Clavata 3 GFP tobacco protoplasts have shown a total absence of the wall protein outside the cells, which is in contrast with the model I've already described. So, uh, previous experiments and uh, bioinformatic predictions have helped us to confirm a possible involvement of uh, ERAD mechanism in the Clavata 3 maturation process. According to this model, the protosome would be responsible for the uh, cleavage of the wall protein uh, with the release of the active dodecapeptide, which would be then secreted in the extracellular space. Nowadays, what I'm trying to study is uh, to try to step back in time and uh, in this way, I would like to understand if uh, in an organism that doesn't show any Clavata 3 expression and uh, meristematic tissues organization, Clavata 3 is able to turn back to behave like a, a secretory protein. According to the strategy, uh, the, we can uh, demonstrate that the um, Clavata 3 maturation process could be evolved together with the conquest of, of uh, emergent lands by the plant kingdom, in particular with the development of uh, vascular plants. To do it, I selected the unicellular microalga Chlamydomonas reinarti, which was uh, transformed for Clavata 3 YFP. And in, in this biosystem, I confirmed the presence of the wall protein, both uh, at intracellular, but also extracellular level. Uh, and in this way, we demonstrate that probably this protein is secreted as we expected. We are currently um, verifying these previous experiments through nano-HPLC analysis and other strategies that you see listed here. But please, to find out more, come to visit my poster. Thank you. Thank you, Elisa. Now it's time to Ranocchi Bianca. Good morning, everybody. Today I present to you our project role and potentiality of bacteria associated with truffle, experimentation on quark conciliate seedlings, mycorrhizae with tuber melanosporum bitted. Tuber melanosporum is an advolector mycorrhizal fungus that produces hypogeous black floating bodies with high economic value. Its natural production in forests is strongly affected by climate change and anthropization. And nowadays, most of the truffles harvest worldwide are produced uh, in orchards uh, with seedlings previously manipulated in controlled conditions in the nursery. 
and uh, um, one of the main objectives for the researchers is to find out uh, new strategies able to improve and increase the production of natural truffle ground or truffle orchards. And why uh, study um, the association, association uh, truffle with bacteria? Uh, among uh, uh, cultivation strategies, it has been shown that uh, the um, uh, combination of inoculation of uh, plant growth promoting rhizobacteria and the ectomycorrhizal fungal uh, is an effective practice for improving uh, uh, plant growth, plant survival, and mycorrhization. And uh, um, uh, in um, this context, the research uh, has, have uh, uh, the aim uh, uh, to assess whether inoculation uh, between uh, Bradrizobium or Pseudomonas or uh, both um, influences the tuber manospore root colonization rate of Quarkus helix seedlings and observe the effect on plant and root development. And uh, uh, we have performed microscopic and microscopic analysis of the morphology uh, molecular analysis, uh, measures of the roots, uh, and uh, mycorrhization degree. And uh, uh, tuber melanosporum has been validated both by morphological and molecular analysis. Pseudomonas inoculum um, has been shown that uh, uh, it is the, the greater um, uh, inoculum for the uh, plant uh, uh, development, and uh, in particular in the root, because uh, uh, fibrous uh, uh, root density was uh, higher uh, than uh, uh, pioneer root density, and uh, um, the mycorrhization degree, uh, in particular, um, a major effect uh, has been shown with uh, also pseudomonas. And uh, these results suggest that uh, uh, bacteria uh, are possible um, and new strategies for um, uh, improving uh, this. Uh, uh, production and uh, for more details uh, I attend you to my poster and I want to thank uh, all partners and thank you for your attention. Thank you Bianca. Now it's time to our remote made speakers. The first one will be Benayada Leila. Hello everyone. Uh, non posso condividere la mia presentazione. Please try to share your presentation and your screen before. Okay. Can you hear us? Okay. Good morning everyone. My presentation today is titled Green Extraction Methods from Plant-Based Materials. So after one year, Apple Potter is back. So you can imagine that our wizard is not friend with anyone. So he came with two special friends. The first one is Her Majesty the Queens, with whom he shares some powers like antioxidants, anti-inflammatory and enzyme inhibition. During this period, Apple Potter also discovered a new power. In fact, he is able to protect the plasmidic DNA from damage and allows it to maintain its shape. As part of my research period in Spain at the University of Valencia and with the support of the Neutralement Group, Apple Potter met his new special friends and our guest today, Orange Weasley. He defends with favor the green chemistry principles and ensures that the plant extraction is carried out in an ecological way. Orange is itself uh, the source of many extracts um, prepared using natural deep eutectic solvents. But what are they exactly? What does characterize them? These solvents are easy to prepare and does not require much. They are composed mainly of primary metabolites like amino acids, sugars, and organic acids. Due to their composition, their particularity is their biodegradability and non-toxicity. As a result, we obtain a recyclable extract that, once purified, can be used for other extractions. 
So here I am contributing to the study of the best method and the best conditions to purify orange extract made with different nades that will enable us to obtain a polyphenol enriched extract. In addition to the qualities previously described, nades offer a credible alternative to conventional solvents, providing better stability and greater uh, longevity for the biocomponents present in the extract, as well as increased solubility and bioactivity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Leila. The next speaker is Mohammadi Atefe. Can you please share your screen? Uh, yes. Can you see my screen? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Today I'll discuss the role of not signaling pathway and certain in the neuroprotective effect of melatonin following hypoxic ischemic brain injury. Uh, in fact, uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy happens when there is not enough blood flow and oxygen to the brain, and uh, uh, you know it's the main uh, cause of brain dysfunction in neonates. And studies show that uh, dysregulation of not signaling pathway and C2 uh, are involved in pathogenesis of this condition. However, the role of melatonin in modulating this pathway after hypoxic ischemic condition has not well understood yet. Studies report that melatonin can decrease brain injury in neonatal rest subject to hypoxia ischemia. Uh, in our project, we aim to evaluate neuroprotective effect of melatonin against uh, hypoxic ischemic brain injury by modulating not signaling pathway and sirtuin. For inducing ischemia, seven-day-old rats underwent unilateral ligation of right common carotid artery, uh, followed by three hours recovery under a heating lamp. And for subsequently for inducing hypoxia, they were exposed to a humidified nitrogen-oxygen mixture for two hours and a half. And five minutes after hypoxia ischemia, melatonin was injected intraperitoneally at dose of 50 mg per kilogram, and subsequently animals were sacrificed at three time points post HI. Uh, our immunofluorescence result localized notch one to the CA1 area of right hippocampus, and also it showed that notch one was main expressed in both neuronal and glial cells. And also, uh, ischemia increased notch expression significantly, and also melatonin further increased expression. And about the second protein of our pathway, cleavage notch or NICD. Uh, immunofluorescence result localized it to the CA1 area of right hippocampus as well, but it was mainly expressed in neuronal cells. And also, blotting results show that hypoxia ischemia increased its expression remarkably, while melatonin decreased its expression to control values. And about S1 and CMIC, notch target genes. They were also medicated after hypoxia ischemia and treatment with melatonin. And all of these medications were in line with our original hypothesis. And about last protein of our research, C3, immunofluorescence result localized to mitochondria and also 
Platin results show that its expiration decrease after hypoxia ischemia mm -hmm. and melatonin uh, increases its expiration to control values and also immunofluorescence results show that uh, surgery was overexpressed in neuronal cells after treatment with melatonin. Uh, our project showed that notch one signaling and uh, notch one signaling and uh, surgery are involved in neuroprotective effect of melatonin against hypoxic ischemic condition. Uh, which opens new doors to understanding melatonin uh, potential therapeutic role in brain injury. Uh, in the next step of my research, I will continue performing research on brain injury, but in a research period abroad, I'm involved in four projects aiming at identifying biomarkers in children with traumatic brain injury. And lastly, I would like to thank my supervisor, Professor Walter Baldoni, and my co-supervisor, Dr. Sidia Carloni. And thank you to all of you for your attention. Thank you, Atefe. The next speaker will be Palladino Silvia. Um, good morning, everyone. Or good afternoon in Italy. And... Atefe, please, can you stop sharing your screen? Yes, sure. Yes, I have some technical problems. Sorry for that. Okay, can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, as you know, the immune system is um, usually able to detect and kill tumor cells, but sometimes tumor cells mm -hmm. can prevent the immune system from doing so. And obviously, this will lead to tumor cell proliferation and cancer progression. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, in the recent years, checkpoint mm -hmm. inhibitors, also known as immunotherapy, mm -hmm. entered the clinic. And immunotherapy is able to antagonize tumor cells and to awake the immune system of a patient again. And this has led to um, a complete change, a revolution in the treatment of metastatic lung cancer patients that now can count on a better survival and quality of life. But unfortunately, not all of them can benefit from this treatment. And this is why uh, precision oncology is now trying to use liquid biopsy, so basically a simple blood collection to find new biomarkers, like for example, a circulating mRNA uh, that can be used for patient selection and monitoring during the course of immunotherapy treatment. So, in this context, the aim of our project was to use liquid biopsy to try to understand if the KRAS isoforms, KRAS4A and KRAS4B mRNAs, can be predictive or prognostic biomarkers for immunotherapy response in a population of metastatic lung cancer patients. And to do so, we collected 59 blood samples. From all of them, we extracted the RNA, and then we performed real-time PCR for uh, gene expression analysis. Then we used MedCard for our statistical analysis. And as expected from literature, in general, patients that have a high concentration of circulating RNA, they have a worse prognosis in terms of a shorter progression of survival and a shorter overall survival. Uh, but interestingly, uh, those patients that have specifically a higher expression of KRAS4A, well, they have a better prognosis because it correlates with a longer progression of survival and overall survival. While KRAS4B is not so informative, apparently, because it only correlates with a longer overall survival. And this is quite interesting because these two isoforms are supposed to be quite the same thing. But here in this contest, they are acting different, differently. So can it be that they are differently involved in tumor evolution and cancer progression? So, for now, what we can say is that KRAS4A, but not KRAS4B, 
can possibly be a biomarker for immunotherapy response. And we must confirm this data with further observations. But um, we should also try to focus our attention on the KRAS isotopes in order to better understand the different roles in cancer evolution and tumor progression, <clears throat> in order to also try to figure out how these molecular mechanisms go on. And so, for now, I would like to thank you and to um, um, and have a good one. Thank you, Silvia. The next speaker is Bocconcelli Matteo. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to stop my presentation somehow. Silvia, can you please stop sharing your yeah, screen? Yeah. Um, yes. Oh, oh my God, wait. Come faccio? Ah, no, I can't first first this is No. <laughs> There's a rectangular button you have to to click. No. On the top of your screen. Scusate. Qui? Aspetta. Scusate, sono un pochino. Aspettate. Dio. Dov'è? Perfetto, grazie. <laughs> <laughs> Matteo, you can start. Yes, you can. You can see the the screen, the presentation. Okay. So, uh, thanks for the um, uh, the opportunity here to share my preliminary results that I'm getting here in Paris, at the Cancer Center of the Gustave Rossi, about the. Oh, sorry, uh, I'm. Okay, about the functional impact of EGF-1 on cell differentiation and plasticity for tumor breast, uh, breast cancer cells. In particular, EGF-1 is a polypeptide growth factor involved in a number of physiopathological uh, processes like cell increasing cell proliferation, protein synthesis, inhibiting apoptosis. And all these uh, findings have been already well studied in 2D models, but there are not so many evidence about its impact that goes beyond cell proliferation, for example, on cell proliferation and plasticity. And uh, here I have the possibility and testing some 3D more complex model like 3D spherules and uh, using cellular matrix to uh, better mimic the tumor microenvironment and also biolog biological processes like uh, epithelial tumor synchromal transition and the losing of plasticity. The aim of my study is to investigate the effect of EGF-1 treatment, in particular on MCF7 breast cancer cell line, which is a breast cancer cell line belong to the subtype luminal A. So we can see this, the alveolar mammary tubular, the MCF7 uh, breast cancer cell line predominantly express the C keratin 8. So on the formation and on the organization in a 3D matrix and on the modulation of breast cancer phenotype and plasticity. To do that, um, breast cancer spheroid were cultured and were seeded in a low adherence 6 well plate, treated and not with recombinant EGF-1, and after seven days were collected and fixed with a paraformal date solution, and then processed here at the Gustavo C with a histological platform called Petra. Uh, the slide were uh, sectioned by microtome, then deparaffinized and processed for antigen retrieval and uh, analyzed with uh, immunofluorescent analysis using in particular a multiplex antibody panel, which consists in different markers, cytokeratin 8 and 5, to know and to assess the breast cancer phenotype, K67 for the proliferation marker, and slug there is a marker related to the epithelial to mesenchymal transition, which increase when the cell lose their plasticity and acquire a more mesenchymal state. Moreover, uh, the same cells were uh, embedded in a matrix of collagen and matrigel, and their growth and organization were followed for over seven days at the Bright field. The first result, uh, preliminary result that I'm obtaining uh, on the immunofluorescence staining is uh, about the, um, the EF staining. About we, we can observe 
in particular that uh, all both uh, uh, breast cancer spheres, so MCF7 control, the treated and the non-treated one, express, like I said before, cytokeratin 8 markers on their, on their surface. But what is interesting is that the treated one with EGF1 have a more heterogeneous phenotype, increasing the CK5 cell, uh, basal cell size subpopulation, like we can see with the green arrow, and also incremental expression of slug uh, marker, epithelial thromosenchymal transition, like K67, the proliferation, especially on the edge, on the perimeter of these spheroids, respect to the control. Concerning the, concerning the matrix one, um, uh, the fact of EGF1 on the matrix of this breast cancer spheroids uh, is uh, well visible here in the treated respect to the control because breast cancer treated are more compact, bigger, and also capable to forming this migratory invasion structure like uh, very organized and in particular like uh, tubal-like structures respect to the controls that were uh, de more dead cells and uh, um, with a little um, size. So we can conclude uh, saying that EGF1 potentially could impact on multiple aspects of 3D breast cancer spheroids on the phenotype, increasing the, sub, the subpopulation of basal-like, uh, increasing the CK5, on the proliferation in EMT transition, increasing the marker K67 and slug, and also in the plasticity, increasing the cell motility and the tubulogenesis. Uh, that is important for us because they can give us uh, uh, this this kind of aspect could be also used in the future for uh, uh, as a therapeutic target for breast cancer cells so thank you for attention thank you matteo the next speaker is cantatore francesco hi everyone so can you see the presentation Yes. Yeah, we see it. Okay. Okay. Uh, in the quest to find new possible compounds to be used in cancer therapy, uh, our laboratory and uh, um, a laboratory held by the professor we refuse here in Urbino have started a collaboration in which they start to design new compound based on malto, uh, a natural compound found in uh, pine needles and commonly used in industry for beverage and foods to be used to create uh, compounds that uh, present this um, molecule, uh, in particular on the arms uh, uh, of these compounds, and they have um, been, nom have been named as bismaltolite compounds. And in my PhD project, I have focused main my attention on the maltonis compound that is uh, that has shown to be the most promising among all the family of this maltol derived compound in particular because this molecule as it has been tested for um, its efficacy in different cancer cell lines and the most uh, sensitive to this treatment uh, are the leukemias ones and in particular in my phd project i have used mainly an acute chemolytic leukemia models of cells the mb4 cells in which we have seen an antiproliferative activity of this molecule in 24-hour treatment. And also this molecule presents a, a remodulation of the epige epigenomic uh, of these cancer cell types. Uh, we have investigated this epigenomic remodulation through mass spectroscopy, and we have seen a tons of post-translational modifications that have been um, remodulated by the treatment, and in particular, we have focused on three mains uh, uh, and mostly studied um, instant post modification, the most, the most significant ones. And through this kind of remodulation of the epigenome, uh, these cells also express uh, a reprogram of the, of the gene expression, in particular through uh, an upregulation of interferon-like pathways and a downregulation of semic uh, regulated pathways. So to conclude, um, this characterization of these compounds derived from maltol, it is huge because it is uh, related to epigenomic and transcriptomic remodulation of this cancer cell type. In particular, this uh, epigenomic remodulation happens through uh, a gene expression reprogramming related to CMIC downregulation that appears to be the master regulator of all the downregulated genes, and also this interferon-like response that it is to be investigated in the future. And then also, uh, what to do next? 
uh, this molecule needs to be uh, studied for possible delivery to be studied in in vivo animal models and also could be the base for study new compounds, uh, uh, bismuthalate compounds to be used in clinical uh, and in clinical therapeutic against cancer. But these early results uh, shed a light to be uh, a promising therapeutic agent to treat acute permelocytic leukemia. So given that, I conclude and I thank you all for the attention. Thank you, Francesco. Now it's time to our last but not least speaker, Catani Linda. Linda, could you please activate your microphone? Oh, sorry. No problem. Okay. Good morning, everyone. The intensive agriculture has overexploited natural resources and alterated the function of soil system. And this is mainly related to the abuse of phytochemicals used to uh, increase uh, high, um, to increase and guarantee high quality and, and quantitative yields. Among the new Green Deal goals stand out the reduction of the use of pesticide and the restoration of biodiversity. For this reason, it's important to find sustainable alternatives to plant protection products. The essential oil seems to be a possible and valid alternative to chemical products in agriculture. From uh, literature, we know that uh, there are many studies uh, that evidence their great efficiency and potential, uh, especially their numerous repellent effects uh, in vitro against pathogens and parasites afflicting crops and uh, uh, preserved foodstuffs. However, the possible effect on soil beneficial fauna are not still uh, studied enough, especially in field condition. Monitoring the soil of uh, uh, quality using a sustainable method is possible thanks to nematode. Nematode can be used as a valid bioindicator uh, for their characteristic, such as small size, great abundance, and source of information. Because thanks to uh, the taxonomical structure extra and structural function, it's possible to calculate uh, different uh, ecological indices uh, thanks to their abundance and diversity. So it was, uh, it was uh, carried out uh, an experiment directly in field uh, using chickpea seeds uh, tanned in the essential oil of basilicum at different concentration and uh, uh, with or without ketosan. The sampling was scheduled before and after the sowing. Then uh, we collect the data with the taxonomical identification and we turn to uh, the statistical approach. From the statistical analysis, uh, we notice that the community structure is more influenced by factor time rather than uh, the treatment of ketosan and essential oil. The abundance show uh, only a significant temporal effect, revealing a progressive increase over time, mainly due to the increases in temperature. While among the uh, diversity indices, significant differences were only found in taxonomical richnesses that was very high in the uh, seeds treats with essential oil and ketosan. Currently, we are finishing the um, experiment at lower concentration of essential oil, but these uh, preliminary results uh, um, corroborate the potential use of essential oil in sustainable agriculture, and furthermore, evidence that nematode can be used as an uh, um, important bioindicator uh, for further uh, environmental impact study. Thank you for your kind attention, and uh, I would like to thank uh, all the people involved in this project. Thank you, Linda. Now I would like to invite again on the stage Bagerlu Nazanin.
uh, hello everyone again. Uh, the um, title of my the title of my project is close up in causes a mitochondrial dysfunction during the acubogenic process in human liposarcoma SW. 872 cells. Uh, clozapine belongs to second generation antipsychotic uh, drugs and it's widely used uh, for treatment of schizophrenia, particularly in patients uh, previously refractory to first generation uh, antipsychotic uh, drugs and it presents some advantages. Uh, also some disadvantages such as um, metabolic side effects, uh, weight, uh, for example, weight gain and uh, uh, insulin resistance. Uh, in uh, literature, there are some reports uh, showing a correlation between a second generation antipsychotic drugs treatment, uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, and metabolic syndrome. And nevertheless, the mechanism responsible for these, uh, for all of these, are not completely understood. Uh, previous um, uh, previous studies, uh, which perform in overlap, characterize the adipogenic process in human SW872 cells. Uh, also, evaluate the effect of clozapine during um, early phase of uh, adipogenesis in this cell uh, model. Also, uh, the aim of my research is to investigate the mitochondrial dysfunction induced by clozapine during the adipogenesis in human liposarcoma SW cells. Uh, according, uh, as you can see in these slides, um, uh, clozapine 50 macromolar significantly reduced uh, mitochondrial biogenesis and mass uh, as evaluated by mitochondrial, uh, mitochondrial DNA assay, MTG uh, cytoflomestric analysis uh, for mitochondrial mass and Western blood for expression of PGC1 alpha uh, as a mitochondrial marker and also Western blood for uh, two oxaglutarate carrier. And con uh, concerning mitochondrial functionality, we found that clozapine also, uh, clozapine 15 macromolar, uh, also significantly increase uh, uh, ROS levels and also membrane potential as detected by, uh, um, the, as you can see in this uh, first graph, by mitosucks, cytofluorometric uh, um, probes, and also with TMRA uh, cytofluorometric probes, uh, respectively. Uh, also, um, clozapine increase the expression of all of the ETC uh, complexes, uh, as you can see in these uh, slides. Uh, also, uh, uh, in, the, in the right side, HPLC, uh, HPLC analysis revealed that ATP level, uh, levels uh, were decreased in clozapine treatment cells. Uh, and also uh, ATP levels uh, were increased at day three of differentiation and also are sensitive uh, to rotenone. Uh, as you can see, rotenone is a pink bar, uh, and uh, this indicates that it's... Uh, um, uh, it's mm, indicating that it's mitochondrial or origin. And in conclusion, our data indicated that clozapine slows down adipogenesis, and this event is accompanied uh, by a mitochondrial dysfunction uh, associated with inhibition of uh, mitochondrial biogenesis, and also uh, the um, Increased expression of ETC complexes, mitochondrial membrane potential, and ROS formation also were observed for about uh, about uh, next experiments and next study. Also, uh, are aimed to better understanding and clarifying the molecular and biochemical processes 
uh, responsible for mitochond uh, mitochondrial uh, dysfunction and uh, its correlation to clozapine side effects. And thank you so much for your attention. Okay, let's thank all the students in biomolecular and health sciences who have contributed to this morning session. We now have a few uh, speakers from the uh, PhD course in global studies. I invite here Phoebe Mokdagi Ramaloko to introduce the speakers. Thank you very much, Phoebe, please. Um, afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll be introducing the cohort from the Global Studies. Um, Andrea ben Benassi will be our first presenter. He's in the first year, and he'll be in presence. Okay, Andrea? Yeah, yeah, come Uh, hi, I'm uh, Andrea Benassi. My voice is enough loud. Uh, my Andrea. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I'm Andrea Benassi. I graduate uh, in Roma 3 in juridical science uh, law. Uh, license to pro exercise the profession of uh, uh, lawyer, avvocato, uh, formerly project manager and researcher under uh, the Purin and Libyak uh, project Marie Curie Action uh, at uh, seconded uh, at the Beijing Normal University in uh, China. And now, obviously, I'm PhD student at the University of Calavo Urbino. Which is the main goal of the project? Uh, to raise the society awareness of the fact that the democratic nature of a legal system is, a result, is the result of a series of complex, in some, some cases, not inter interchangeable element of legal and extra-legal nature. In particular, it is intended to emphasize that the electoral phase is, not, is only, not only the one of the ways in which popular sovereignty is exercised. It is intended to stimulate a reflection, in the second point, in the academic field, in both juridical, political science and sociology to pay greater attention to the importance of the electoral system in relation to the nature of the form of government and the political system. Uh, what, which is the originality of the project? Uh, the jointly, to jointly analyze issues that uh, uh, are believably, according to me, to be closely, uh, closely related, but uh, uh, until now I have been uh, addressed in an individual and partial manner by the scholars. Okay, I'm going to speak about the project. Um, the main purpose of the project is to, know, is to analyze whether uh, and how electoral system condition the form of government. This topic can be analyzed from the perspective of different disciplines. Although sociology and political science may take an ancillary role, uh, the perspective from which the topic is addressed is legal constitutional. This means that the main object of research is the relationship, is the relationship between the juridical norms. Both in terms of the constitutional legitimacy of, of the norms, 
governing electoral system and the analysis of the overall system of constitutional norms. In the first respect, the par parameter norms are all those that help define the, the right of citizen participation and thus the exercise of sovereignty. In relation to the second aspect, the purpose is to understand whether any ability of the electoral system con to condition the norm of the system may alight, including uh, in light of factor partially exogenous to the legal system, a legal gap in the constitutional system consisting in the lack of constitutional regulation on an election system. In relation to the aims of the project, certain aspect, as a corollary to the main research question, assume relevance. Uh, one, the fair conditioning of the electoral system on the division and balancing of power. In particular, the question that arises is, can the electoral system cause an imbalance of power to the detriment of the body that should be the representative of the people, namely the parliament? Political party, given that uh, they should operate, operate as intermediary entities between society and institution. Uh, ah, okay, yeah, I am finished. And they enroll as a senior assigned in constitution and as concretely, concretely played in social reality. Uh, how the ter third, how the relationship between the electoral system and the personalization of politics may in fact change the relation between power and between them and citizens. For how some electoral system can increase the power of conditioning of the media. Uh, okay, okay. The word, <laughs> the word Richard provides. You. You're welcome. Um, the second presenter, who's a second year student, is H Hussein Mamadov, and he'll be presenting online. Um, Hussein, can you please share your screen? Uh, okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. Hello? Yeah, okay. Second. Do you see it well? Yes, we can. Uh, the first resort for in inappropriate and common in space, the being on a bus. So, uh, I'm a double degree PhD student from Urban University and Seville University. During this presentation, I will not just mention the paper, which I'll be taking to that you, it will be more easier to get into that standard. So, uh, uh, the, my paper is going to uh, be part of the four projects, the starting by the uh, TO model of the SMEs, where uh, e-commerce adoption according to the uh, INAPAS, and at the same time, research question to the, uh, the cover of the paper investigation drivers of obstacles in digitalization in SMEs, and uh, research question three, which try to cover the cybersecurity protection in SMEs. And when it comes to four, it will be uh, trying to cover the map, rule map of digitalization SMEs, particularly uh, innovation and organizational change. So uh, all in all, the papers, obstacles, and innovations of adoption, uh, digitalization in SMEs, precisely uh, as an innovation process, drivers of cybersecurity in SMEs, and recent digitalization uh, trend in SMEs, uh, precisely for Italian firms. So date is the base on the survey of the Spanish SMEs, uh, up one up to 200. The, the, they were chosen uh, at random from a uh, SEBI database where the certified representative, the sample uh, was uh, five person at the confidence level in 95, where the survey was employed from the, the computer assistant telephone interview. And all in all, uh, there are uh, all 802 observations that have been recorded. And uh, now just directly to the results where the, for the uh, adoption of uh, e-commerce in others the four, uh, in SMEs where the potential parent facilitators 
the affected adoption of e-commerce and the study attempts to fill the gap to from assessing the barriers to e-commerce adoption to from a holistic perspective and mainly uh, monetary implications for investment in human assets and instruction, precisely their education is an essential component and the importance of financing to where like access to funds and its availability in the ecosystem the, is the kind of necessary and the significance of interaction, the collaboration with other actors is also the kind of matter in this case. And uh, the uh, results of the paper too were digitalization of the transformation in SMEs and approach uh, as an innovation process where uh, we analyze the gap to, from the drivers and the barriers to digitalization in SMEs to, from a holistic perspective, uh, by uh, integrating the factors that have been attention in literature and been overlooked. And directly to the implications where uh, results indicate that investing in a human capital training necessary component, public administration at the same time contributes and objectives, in this case, all the most efficient and not directly involved in a carrying a training program, but coming to interact in a partnership within the digital ecosystem. And all in all, SMEs uh, they should strive, uh, strive into the to contribute towards the formal this. Likewise, second uh, uh, success. Uh, Unfortunately, you have a very bad connection. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Yes, okay, well, thank you, thank you. We have a bit bad connection, so, yeah, we can move on to the next one. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and our next presenter is Yaboa Gabriel Kwesi, who is in the second year. Okay. Um, Oh, okay, um, our next presenter is Yaboa Gabriel Kwesi. Sorry, I had muted myself. Um, Gabriel? Okay. Yeah, hello. I hope I can be here. Okay. Um, you can proceed. Okay. okay. So I would like to share my screen. Okay. Is my screen visible now? Can yes. you see my screen? Yes. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so I'll dive into my presentation. Um, the topic is patent and licensing in industrial growth, the case of the strawberry industry in the US. And basically I'm trying to examine um, the patent value of breeders and how it affects the growth of the strawberry, in the, in the, the strawberry industry in the US and also examine the license value of growers and how it affects the growth of the strawberry in industry in the US. And finally, to examine the role of plant patent, the role plant patent play in the strawberry industry to contribute to promoting the pillars of sustainability. So in, um, to go straight to my point, in this particular research, what I'm seeking to do is that I am trying to examine um, patent value as well as license value using um, st structural equation model technique. And um, patent value and license value are latent variables in this particular research I'm conducting. That is, they are variables that cannot be determined directly. And so I measure some observable indicators, which um, forms part of um, the indicators that I use to be able to determine um, the value of a patent and then the value of a license, and eventually see how this um, affects growth in the, in the industry. So some of the value, some of the indicators I am considering for the growers, I classify them 
as uh, non-licensed content and then licensed content. For the non-licensed content, I'm looking at some indicators such as the consumer, um, the consumer demand for the particular variety, the developmental stage of the variety, the reputation of the licensor, and for some licensed content, I'm looking at the duration of the license, the exclusivity of the license, the scope of the license, the financial terms in the license agreement. Now, these indicators, some of them are indicators that have already been tested, and some of the indicators are new indicators I'm, intro I'm introducing, trying to test to see how it affects growth. And as you can see, on the growth, growth is also being affected by um, the amount spent on adver advertisements, the change in profit and barriers to entry. Now, these three sets of um, indicators that also affect growth, together with the non-license and then the license content of the license agreement, these happens to be um, part of the, the structural concept. Because one of the structural concepts I'm using for this particular research is the structure conduct performance paradigm. And basically, the structure conduct performance paradigm, in summary, um, imp implies that the structure of an industry affects the conduct of the industry, which in turn affects the performance of the industry. And when you take a look at the structure of the SCP model, um, barriers to entry and exit happens to form be one of the components of the structure of an industry. The conduct of the industry, um, advertisement and then amount spent on research and development forms part of the, um, the conduct of an industry. And then the performance of an industry can be examined through its sales, profitability and other, um, other factors. And then again, as I already mentioned, the method I'm trying to use in this analysis is the um, structural equation model. And I'm also doing the path analysis and then the confirmatory and exploratory factor analysis. And below are the techniques that I'm using to collect my data through surveys, interviews, and then I'm also using secondary sources, such as the USPTO site. So I've already discussed the um, competing structural model for the growers. Now, the competing structural model for the breeders, I also have a set of variables that I am measuring directly to help me determine the value of a patent, which will in turn help me determine if it affects the growth of the industry. Now, mind you, these set of indicators are um, also applicable in several other industries, not only in the strawberry industry. The strawberry industry is just a case study for this particular research. But then these um, set of indicators can be used to measure the value of a patent or the value of a license in several under Gabriel, inter industries to determine if there is growth. My time is up? Yes, um, so please summarize. Oh, okay, so um, I think um, here are just a number of um, some of the um, the patent value indicators over there. And then below is the tax that I have to go on to complete. And um, thank you very much. My name is Gabriel Yaboa, and I'm being supervised by Dr. Um, Giovanni Marin and my co-supervisor is Dr. Samtani here in um, Virginia Tech in the US. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, we should just thank all the PhD students who contributed to the morning session. Now this session is over. We will resume the meeting at 3 p.m. I just want to tell you that the abstract book of the conference can be downloaded at the dedicated webpage of the event on the UniUrb webpage. And uh, so thank you very much, everyone, for participating in this morning session. I will see you again at 3 o'clock, 3 p.m. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to this afternoon session of this PhD day. Um, we are now ready to start with the PhD students in research methods in science and technology. So I invite here Daniele Lopez, one of these PhD students, who will chair the session. Thank you very much, Daniele. Uh, good evening, everyone. I would like to invite uh, to speak uh, the first uh, colleagues, uh, the Dr. Peters, uh, the Dr. Peter uh, Sonder. Thank you. Share your presentation. All right, so thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today about my first um, progress in navigating the orthosteric allosteric GPCR pocket tome for structure-based drug discovery. So I'm a PhD student of Giovanni Bottegoni, and we are interested in understanding allosteric sites, so sites which are distinct from where usually the endo endogenous substance binds, and what you can see here are G-protein coupled receptors. Those are membrane proteins, and they're very important as drug targets, as around 34% um, of all FDA-approved drugs actually um, target these um, class of superfamily. So on the left-hand side, you see the structure of all the FDA-approved drugs, um, which in stick are binding to the orthosteric side. And in spheres, you see allosteric binders. And if you compare um, the left to the right, you can really already see a lot of different binding sites that actually we know are um, ligandable, but there is not at the moment any FDA approved drug for it. So this is very interesting because that's um, novel chemical space. And um, within my PhD, we are looking into understanding these sites systematically. For that, we need kind of a roadmap to, to know where those binding sites are located. And we came up with our annotation scheme, which is based on GPCR class, sublocation, TM, and also where it binds in respect to the membrane. So you see here, for example, an FDA-approved drug in orange. Um, it's um, avacopan. And um, this is part of class A. It binds extrahelical TM345 um, in the mid-region of the membrane. So having this, we then um, collected all of the known um, allosteric binding sites from the PDB, um, and we um, analyzed retrospectively if we were able to use default settings um, to, to find these allosteric binding sites. And Yes, we were able for, for most of them to, to find these sites. And also the annotation scheme actually allowed us then to further investigate which pockets are class specific and also which pockets are state specific. So we saw that, um, especially in the intracellular site where the G protein would bind, there actually we have very distinct um, pockets. Um, whereas there, uh, the location where avacopam binds, which I showed you before, there, actually, these pockets also pop up in other classes and in other states. We can also look in, in the panel B below um, at pocket volume and also um, and the, these trends, which are very different when looking from allosteric versus orthosteric. Um, also, uh, from a ligand point of perspective, lipophilicity, which actually decreases um, from um, extrahelical allosteric to orthosteric, mm -hmm. and also for the allosteric sites, especially extrahelical, we have an enrichment in halogens. Mm -hmm. So where is the project now standing? We have a lot of different pockets, and of course we would be really interested now to validate some of these pockets experimentally. Um, and then the question comes, which ones do we actually pick? Um, and for that, it's very important for an allosteric site to have some kind of link to the orthosteric site. Mm -hmm. And we can use Pocketron, basically, um, to simulate uh, protein communication networks throughout the, the, the GPCR. So in green, those are pockets, and, in, and the edges are basically residues that are shared between two pockets. And um, this then gives some initial hint on which um, allosteric ligands actually have some functional indication. 
So with that, I want to say thank you again, especially to Professor Patagoni um, and the whole team, and also um, for you to give me the opportunity to present here today. Thank you, Peter. I introduce the. Okay. Thank you, Peter. I introduce uh, the new uh, speaker, Adriano Angelucci. So, hi everybody, I'm Adriano Angelucci, and my research is on green nudging and environmentally friendly beliefs. Sorry. Okay, so here, the project basically aims at bringing together two, several, two different fields, namely the behavioral literature on nudging on the one hand, and uh, psychological and philosophical literature on self-knowledge on the other. And in practice, the research consists in a theoretical and empirical investigation of the cognitive mechanisms which underlie the interactions between so-called green nudging and the formation of environmentally relevant beliefs, namely beliefs relevant to the environment. And in this regard, an emerging consensus in the literature has it that beliefs consciously help beliefs of people seem to be relevant for the nudging process. And as a consequence, most of the attention in the literature has so far been focused on the belief behavior link, namely in the way in which beliefs can have a measurable uh, impact on the effectiveness and replicability of behavioral interventions, that is, of nudges. On the other hand, the behavior belief link has been much less explored, and this happens to be the central topic of my research, in particular, my central question is whether and how nudging processes can have an impact on our conscious beliefs. That is, whether and how we can, in fact, nudge beliefs. And a relevant uh, empirical fact on this uh, matter is that it is uh, a well-established uh, empirical finding about human cognition that experimentally induced behavioral changes can often bring about mind changes. That is, they can bring about a shift in the content of the attitudes that subjects tend to ascribe to themselves. And what this means uh, from where I stand is that, at least theoretically, nudge beliefs seem a clear possibility. What we still need, what I think is still needed in the literature, however, is a theory, is an explanatory framework. That is a plausible story of how this can come about. And my proposal in this regard is that we could look at the current uh, philosophical and psychological debate on self-knowledge, that is, in the knowledge that we have of our own mental state. And the basic idea of my research is that a certain family of accounts of this phenomenon of self-knowledge that is known as self-interpretation accounts, and which hold that, which roughly hold that, we, the access that we normally have to our own mental states, in particular to our beliefs, is based on behavioral rather than introspective evidence. And my idea is that these family of counts can provide a useful explanatory framework to investigate the phenomenon in question. The central prediction of the research is the one that you can see in the slide, and it holds that green nudging could lead to the formation of environmentally friendly beliefs via uh, self-knowledge related mechanism, and I'm about to uh, test this hypothesis by means of an empirical study that will be run here at the University of Urbino, and which targets the recycling behavior and beliefs of uh, its students. And this is pretty much it, so thank you for your attention. Thank you, Adriano. I invite uh, Lorenzo Chemeri. Okay. 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is my presentation that uh, records the first findings of my PhD project. Uh, the province of Pesaro Urbino represents one of the most seismically active areas in central Italy since it is interested by the presence of two major seismogenetic sources. The first one located in the Umbria Marken Apennines and the second one running along the Adriatic coast. Indeed, <coughs> the area has experienced uh, both in past and recent history uh, a strong seismic activity. The last event was on November 9, 2020, uh, 2022, with a magnitude of 5.5 in the Richter scale, with its epicenter located in the Adriatic Sea. Um, since recent studies have shown the increasing potential of hydrogeochemical monitoring and the identification of possible seismic precursors, and since the scientific knowledge of, the, of this area is extremely little, we performed a large-scale sampling campaign um, that involved more than 80 points with the aim to define the main geochemical processes acting in the area, um, to investigate the possible interplay between deep originated fluids and the shallow aquifers, and finally to evaluate the possible use of selected geochemical parameters as seismic tracers for this specific area. Uh, here are our preliminary results that show how the groundwaters discharging in the province of Pedro Urbino are characterized by a wide compositional variability. We found five different compositional clusters, um, such as calcium bicarbonate waters that include the, the wide majority of the samples, calcium bicarbonate waters characterized by a strong enrichment in sulfate, sodium bicarbonate water that were characterized by alkaline pH and negative um, oxidation reduction potential, uh, calcium sulfate waters, and finally, sodium chlorine waters. Based on this finding, we have been able to define the major chemical processes acting in the area, and additionally, based on the, comp on comp on the compositional features, and based on the location of the sampling points with respect to the major uh, tectonic alignments and structure, for example, folds and trust, we have selected a restricted number of points, 18, that we are um, monitoring on a monthly or bi-monthly basis in order to see which uh, parameter may, may be more feasible and suitable as seismic precursors. Thanks for the attention. Thank you, thank you, Lorenzo. I invite uh, Dr. Dessa Certanisada. Thank you, Daniel. Um, good afternoon to everybody. <laughs> I'm Sara Ciattoni, I'm a structural geologist, and uh, uh, during my PhD I'm studying the uh, evolution of uh, and the Andean Cordillera above the Nazca Ridge subduction. Um, oh, okay. The, the study area is located in the southern part of uh, Peru, and this is a very characteristic uh, area because the um, in this area, the uh, oceanic crust is thickened due to the presence of the Nazca Ridge, and this thickening uh, influences the subduction uh, geometry and also the subduction uh, dynamics. And moreover, at the top of the Nazca Ridge, there are several volcanoes, and this, uh, this, the presence of these volcanoes uh, affect the uh, geochemistry of the subducting area and, uh, of course, also the geodynamics. And uh, the effect of the presence of the Nazca Ridge in uh, subduction in this area um, affects both the uh, area closest to the coast uh, till the Amazonian Basin, that is the uh, most internal part. 
And so, uh, during my PhD, uh, I want to investigate how the nuts carried subduction influenced the geometry and ge the geological evolution of the area. And in particular, I'm studying in general the geodynamics and the deformation, uplift, and subsidence of uh, the area, and the fluid circulation in the um, Peruvian forest system, that is the area close to the, uh, to the coastal area. And maybe good job. Okay. Um, uh, with this aim, we build a coastal section and a structural model. Uh, that is the uh, picture at the top of uh, this, this slide. Uh, the length of this section is uh, uh, 1,000 kilometers, and the depth is 130 kilometers. So uh, this is a coastal uh, model, and uh, the red balls, the beach balls, are the earthquakes that occurs in the area uh, during the last uh, uh, 30 years with a magnitude higher than uh, 6.5. And uh, uh, by using this uh, uh, coastal model, uh, we developed a, a geothermal model, and that is the picture uh, below. And so, uh, in, thanks to this uh, model, uh, we uh, are able to investigate the, structure, the thermal structure of the, of the area, and this is very important to un better understand the uh, di geodynamics and the fluid circulation. So next steps of, uh, this, uh, uh, of my project will be uh, build a... Um, oh dear, yeah. <laughs> the um, gravitational model, sorry and study more in detail the um, effect of the fluid circulation in the uh, forex system that is located uh, in the area um, close to the coastal belt. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sara. I introduce the new speaker, uh, Cupido Manta. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Marta Cupido, and uh, my PhD, PhD project faces the problem of the historic centers um, generated, uh, the resilience of the historic centers generated with the, um, the earthquake that struck uh, central Italy with the seismic sequence in 2016-2017, uh, which caused several damage. Uh, to buildings, uh, collapses, and loss of architectural and cultural heritage in tons uh, of municipalities. These buildings in these historic centers are mainly made of local stones, uh, in particular in my study area, which is in Camerino. Uh, the buildings are mainly made in sandstones, which is a sedimentary rock, and uh, these uh, different uh, degrees of damage in the same uh, historic center um, I have to find out uh, from, from which they come from. So does each historic building uh, have a different uh, vulnerability to seismic stresses? This is the question I'm trying uh, to answer. And uh, I'd like to find out uh, if this vulnerability of these buildings uh, depend on the construction stone material or uh, on the substrate underneath the uh, historic center. So to answer to this question, uh, we uh, apply the multidisciplinary approach which uh, uh, in the first year of uh, my PhD project, in my first part, we applied a micro-scale approach. So we characterize the stone in the load-bearing masonries and structural elements, such as uh, columns or uh, architraves, in single buildings, studying the intrinsic properties of the rocks and their alteration. Uh, however, these historic buildings are uh, protected uh, by the superintendents of cultural heritage, and in most cases, uh, it's not possible to use the classic methods of the investigation. To overcome this problem, uh, there's the need to involve innovative and non-invasive uh, expeditive techniques. 
So this first part of the PhD project is uh, concluded with the publication of an article, and this is the part I'm going to talk about you today, uh, while uh, the, the second part, we act at the mesoscale, and this is the part that I'm, I'm approaching right now. Um, with the second part, so in the future, we would like to characterize uh, the subsoil in the entire historic center, so we would act at uh, the mesoscale, um, and this aspect, uh, with this aspect, uh, we are going to deepen uh, the current microzonation studies that um, considering also the site effects. So, uh, we, uh, in the study area is uh, the Palazzo Ducale, which is one of the main historic buildings uh, in uh, Camerino, uh, which, is, uh, which was uh, deeply affected by the, the earthquake. And we characterize uh, these stone materials uh, through the investigation of the causes and the alteration of this rock uh, in order to find the best solution for the renovation and restoration of the entire historic centers, center. As you see in the, in the picture, the alteration of this rock uh, is, um, acts at very deep uh, levels and uh, also in adjacent points have different speed and different scale, so it's very difficult to, uh, to study. Uh, the methodology we used, we focused uh, on the sandstone uh, columns of uh, the palazzo. Uh, we started with macroscopic uh, analysis, so we analyzed first the surface and then we performed the mechanical test uh, with uh, an instrument uh, to study the rock hardness and then we find out uh, which, um, because why this rock hardness was so different through sediment ecological and mineralogical and physical analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marta. In this moment, I introduce uh, the online student, Malvika. Share your presentation. Yes. Uh, can you give me a minute? In the center, there is the green. Uh... Yeah, yeah, just a minute. Just a minute. There's a square green button to click on. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, just. Okay, it, perfect. Is it sharing? Yes. Okay, so... Okay, so I will start. Uh, good afternoon to everyone present there. Uh, I'm Malvika, so my PhD project was about the method development for the determination of PFAS using the HPLC, which was combined with a negative chemical ionization MS with the liquid electron ionization interface. So first of all, what is LEI? It's an innovative LCMS interface, which converts the liquid HPLC eluent into the gas phase in the MS, which is equipped with the electron ionization or the chemical ionization ion source. And vaporization microchannel is the heart of uh, the LEI interface where the transition from the liquid to gas occurs. And the advantages of this interface is a low matrix interference and reproducible spectra. So for our studies, this is the coupling that we had done. We combined the UHPLC with a CI, a triple cord CI uh, source with the LEI system. And uh, the uh, compounds of interest for our studies were uh, perfluoroalkyl substances, PFAS, and they are the family of uh, synthetic fluorochemicals, which are nowadays present everywhere. They are called as forever chemicals, and they have been very prominent in studies because they are being the major pollutants in the environment. So moving to the uh, study of the PFAS, we looked into many factors which was involved in the chemical ionization process in the LCMS. We looked into the different solvents. We looked into uh, different reagent gases used in the uh, chemical ionization MS. And we looked at different flow rates 
and uh, we look into the modifiers, how the modifier will affect the intensity of or the sensitivity of these compounds in um, in the analysis in um, chemical ionization. And then we also looked into the temperature of uh, the ion source and uh, vaporization microchannel. And after studying all these different uh, factors, and we, con uh, we optimized a method to analyze these compounds using our um, system. And we were able to um, separate these uh, compounds uh, we studied five different uh, PFAS compounds and we were able to separate them. Then uh, you can see in the uh, SIM, in the selected ion monitoring, we looked at these compounds to better understand them. And based on the study which we had done, we proposed a tentative fragmentation pathway for these compounds. And for uh, the further study, we want to look uh, into the uh, tandem MS or uh, the MRM study of these compounds and to look into the real samples. So this was the work we had done till far and um, thank you for your attention and uh, thank you for giving this opportunity to present the work on uh, PhD day. Thank you. Thank you, Magika. I invite uh, to speak uh, Gianni Grasselli. Thank you, Malvika. Good afternoon to everyone. In this presentation, uh, we'll give a brief overview of the interface developed in our lab, and then uh, I will show some results of my last work. The liquid electron ionization interface allows coupling the liquid chromatography with the high vacuum gas phase ionization techniques, uh, such as electrospray and chemi uh, sorry, <laughs> electron ionization and chemical ionization, normally used with the gas chromatography. The uh, LEI interface is formed by two parts. The uh, cooling gap is the room temperature part, uh, while the, uh, the vaporization microchannel is the heated part. In the cooling gap, the liquid stream and the analytes conveyed from the HPLC uh, flow through the smaller capillary called hillet capillary, um, while the helium flow uh, flows through the bigger, capillary, the bigger capillary, which is the orange one. Uh, while in the vaporization microchannel, the uh, liquid flow, the um, inlet capillary release the liquid flow and the analytes, which are mixed with the helium flow um, it is uh, uh, vaporized uh, uh, due to the high temperature and ionized within the ion source. The use, of, the use of LEI interface shows several advantages uh, uh, with respect to the conventional uh, um, ionization techniques used with the liquid chromatography. The advantages include the searchable spectra in library, generating a, a relable spectra, uh, negligible, um, the reduction of the matrix effect uh, and high versatility, uh, demonstrating to work very well with different kinds of detectors such as uh, single quadruple, triple quadruple and uh, uh, QTOF and uh, uh, proving to be compatible with any mobile phase composition allowing to switch from normal phase liquid chromatography to reverse phase liquid chromatography for uh, different uh, separation needs. In my last work, um, LEI was coupled with the uh, high resolution mass spectrometer, the QDOF, for the determination of an impurity structure present in a, complex, in a um, commercial formulation. Uh, due to the non-polar nature of this impurity, the chromatographic separation was performed using the normal phase uh, liquid chromatography. After the optimization of the separation, the molecular ion was determined um, acquiring the, spectra, the spectrum of the compound at different electron energies. Uh, in the last step, 
uh, the formula of the, the impurity was successfully uh, determined uh, using uh, the MSMS analysis and the molecular correlator software, the molecular structure correlator software. Uh, more details of this work is show, are shown uh, on my poster presentation. Thank you for the attention. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, now I have uh, the most difficult work that is to introduce myself. Hello everyone, uh, my name is uh, Daniel Lopez and my work uh, belongs to the National Operation Program and is part of collaboration between the Sopramolecular Chemistry Laboratory and uh, the Cytometric and Microscopy Laboratory of the University of Urbino, Carlo Bo. We know soil and water pollution is the most of the uh, uh, major environmental problem, indeed the number of polluting substances affecting water and soil and having potential health risk is constantly increasing. In particular, the most uh, problem comes from toxic metals. Uh, in particular, my project is the synthesis and study of a new fluorescent probe able to detect the content of heavy metals uh, in cell of organisms that have been considered an important environmental uh, bioindicators. My work is divided in two parts, in a chemistry part and a biological part. And uh, the first uh, synthesizing uh, probe is the L1, show the highest uh, fluor high fluorescence response to magnesium in both DMSO and ACN after uh, the formation once one metal complex for this reason. Subsequent analysis uh, are uh, cond conducted uh, in uh, flow cytometry and in vitro system. Unfortunately, uh, this uh, um, probe uh, can be performed not reproducible uh, uh, results over time. The second uh, uh, probe is the, uh, can be changed the open chain and fragment in L1 was replaced in L2, trying to move the fluorescence selectivity towards heavy metal science. The, the same analysis uh, in the in vitro cadmium pollution uh, model uh, on uh, li cell lines uh, are performed, but uh, uh, promising results uh, we have uh, seen. In the third is the L2, and the, the macrocyclic portion was maintained while the fluorophore was replaced. The same in vitro test was performed, but in this case, no fluorescence emission was obtained. The last one is L4. In L4, another macrocyclic scaffold has been chosen, linked to two NBD myotis. L4 traced the endolysosome organelles. The evaluation were performed in in vitro and in vitro samples, samples of Amarillium vulgare and Mitilus gallo provincialis. The analysis carried out by means of flow cytometry and confocal microscopy revealed the alteration of uh, endolysosome organelles upon pollution in the dye cell system. In conclusion, L2 and L4 represent promising candidates to develop fluorescent system able to assess heavy metal pollution and pollution derived by circulation in biological matrices. Uh, for the future perspective, we want to confirm the, uh, the preliminary result and identify possible chemosensor for toxic contaminants detection in bioindicators animals. I want to thank uh, all my staff and uh, thank you for the attention. And uh, I introduce the next uh, is uh, Giorgia Maurizzi. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Giorgia Maurizzi, a PhD student in uh, pharmaceutical technology at the Pharmatech Lab Group of Professor Luca Casettari. 
My research topic is the application of emerging technologies, including uh, microfluidics, solution blow spinning, and uh, 3D printing for the manufacturing of uh, cutaneous drug delivery systems. Emerging technologies are usually applied to produce uh, customized systems and also to overcome issues related to the traditional pharmaceutical forms. To better explain um, how these technologies work, I have selected three of uh, our recent works. In uh, this project, we employed the um, direct powder extrusion technique, which is an innovative uh, 3D printing technology, uh, which, allows the, um, which allows the preparation of solid pharmaceutical forms in a layer-by-layer -layer manner through the thermal processings of drugs and excipient in a single step. Specifically in this project, we investigated the um, processability of a new excipient, the EVA copolymer, as a new fixed stock material for the EDP technique, and also we prepared the transdermal patches with the customizable uh, drug uh, release profile according to the patient's needs. Let's move on to the second work in which we applied the solution blow spinning, which is a, um, an in situ fiber fabrication process. Uh, and um, we use this technique to prepare uh, regenerative skin patches made of interwoven keratin nanofibers loaded with a pomace extract endowed with antimicrobial activity. For this work, we collaborated with uh, the Department of Biomolecular Sciences, in particular with uh, Dr. Gianmarco Mangiaterra and Professor Barbara Canonico, who um, investigated the antimicrobial activity and uh, the cytotoxicity of the patches, and also with uh, Matteo Micucci, who supplied the pomace extract. Finally, the last technique I would like to talk about is microfluidics, uh, which allows the handling of fluids on a small scale uh, using channels to prepare uh, liposomes and uh, polymeric nanoparticles. In particular, in this work, we developed a microfluidic mixing technique uh, to prepare ketosan-based nanoparticles with the ability to easily convey peptides such as argireline through the skin. If you are interested in these techniques or, or if you have any question, I'm available at the poster section and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Giorgia. I introduce the new speaker, Murai uh, Siraj. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's get to, towards uh, something more computerized. So uh, actually, uh, I'm a computer scientist uh, by background, and uh, currently uh, we are working on uh, a framework for profiling uh, smart environments. And for in simple words uh, about smart environment, I could say any environment that has a capability to respond in some way. So. Just uh, to give a short glimpse, uh, we will be just. Uh, I would be introducing few term terminologies to get an idea, uh, and then jumping into the problem what we have identified, and then uh, what we are planning to, and uh, what we have achieved till now. So these are few terminologies uh, that I would like to introduce. Specifically, first knowledge graphs. What are they? And symbolic representation. What the thing it is complex network analysis, dynamic network analysis, and some more jargons. So uh, before getting into the uh, term knowledge graph, I would like to introduce graphs, uh, because uh, sometimes even computer scientists are confused uh, with the term graphs. When we see plots like uh, histograms or line graph or something else, we say this thing is a graph. No, a uh, graph uh, is anything that has node and relationships with, within it or holds any representation of, uh, of any concept by the help of nodes and edges. So this is the example of graph. And uh, uh, below we can see uh, the other two examples that are on left are basically plots. So uh, using this uh, terminology, let's jump to the terminology of knowledge graph. 
So basically, uh, knowledge graph uh, in simple words is a way to represent the real world entities and how they are connected with the help of relationships. And relationship like uh, in social life and or in social sciences we have a person knows another person is a relationship, a person studies at a specific uh, or University of Urbino is a relationship and so on. Symbolic representation in simple words basically is the representation of the information with the help of symbols. And uh, complex network analysis is a paradigm of uh, social sciences that is uh, utilized or that is used to analyze graphs uh, to identify what is uh, hiding inside the structure of the data we have in the graph representation. And uh, dynamic network analysis is just uh, uh, one more uh, block over the uh, network analysis, uh, which help us to identify or to analyze our network in contrast to time and its evolution. Uh, and uh, GNN are basically a type of machine learning algorithm or artificial uh, intelligence based algorithm that helps you to mimic the uh, concepts or the uh, mimic the uh, pattern that uh, we humans use to think or understand uh, any concept in real life. So GNN are just uh, another type of uh, artificial neural networks that are basically specific, uh, specifically focused on graph based data. So what is the reason uh, or what is the intuition to uh, behind this thing? Uh, because we want to have something uh, that is more expressive, reasonable, curable, available at every time, and uh, memory efficient. So we have proposed this solution. Uh, we have three, uh, basically, frame, uh, three parts of our framework. So in first fr uh, part, we are basically grabbing data from the real environment, which is our smart environment, then apply some machine learning or uh, artificial intelligence approach to analyze that data and extract useful patterns and with the help of uh, network analysis and algorithms uh, then represent them in a more fruitful or more representable way that is more uh, fruitful for the scientists, for fruitful for the industry and fruitful for the a common person. And then grab that all stuff and put it into the uh, whole of or capsule of uh, knowledge graph and then uh, provide an interface that could help people to access that thing. So this is, uh, we have uh, now, till now, we have uh, proposed two uh, subparts. Uh, this is the one. Uh, I, will, I won't go into details because I've already taken too much time. So this is just uh, to just to give an overview and I will be available in poster session. If anyone wants to have uh, in detail uh, talk, uh, I'm super, I would be super excited and uh, welcome. Uh, and thank you so much for having your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Siraji. I invite uh, to speak to Dodima Okeke. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dodima Okeke. I'm here to in introduce the motivation for my PhD. And for those who may be interested in the methodologies, we can discuss that outside in the poster sessions. So, the topic I want to discuss, which captured the theme of my PhD is food waste valorization, and the circular economy. And the motivation, as you can see, that 1.3 billion tons of food and food materials are wasted every year. And the value of this waste is well over 1 trillion US dollars, which is a very big amount of money. I don't I think if you give Ubino this amount of money, everybody here will be a millionaire. This amount of money is actually twice the GDP of my country, more than twice, because my country's GDP 
is at the range of 450 billion to 500 billion. So one trillion is twice the GDP of my country, which is a population of more than 200 million people. You can see the enormity of the problem of food waste. So without having this understanding, you may just eat and throw away and waste a lot of food without understanding the impact. If we look at the environmental impact, food waste constitutes about 18% of greenhouse gas emission, which has a very great impact on climate change. So having the understanding of this data gave me a motivation to contribute into finding solution to food waste. What is my interest and what am I contributing? My work involves developing a method, an innovative method, as you can see on on the quadrants, this innovative conversion using novel solvents and techniques. That is the, the point of my research. And we have had some results which are so uh, interesting and we would like to discuss that. Anybody who is interested, we can discuss that outside. I think, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Keke. I invite uh, to speak uh, Erika Palazzetti. Good afternoon to everyone. I'm Erika Palazzetti, a second year PhD student in chemistry. Now I talk about design synthesis and characterization of fluorescent thermosensor for selective recognition of metal cations in solution. I would like uh, to start this uh, brief presentation with a question. How do you design a fluorescent chemosensor? We need a receptive unit, fluorophore and spacer. A receptive unit must have a chemical structure similar to the light. And we need also a good specificity and selectivity between this receptor unit and the analyte. And the fluorophore must turn on, turn off, or change the emission color when the receptor is occupied by the gas or by another analyte. And the spacer must transmit the information from the receptor to the fluorophore. So, I personally synthesized these uh, seven types uh, uh, of chemosensors, uh, starting from uh, two different uh, fluorophores called uh, HMBO for uh, these uh, uh, five uh, types of ligand, and the HBO fluorophore for L6 and L7. This uh, animated image shows that uh, uh, both uh, fluorophore uh, participate in the interaction with this uh, magnesium, and uh, the fluorescence uh, intensity increases. Uh, in fact, uh, we, can, uh, we can see in uh, UV uh, spectrum that uh, as the quantity of magnesium increases, a new band appears, uh, and uh, this band can be uh, associated to the, uh, the protonation of the phthalic uh, growth of this uh, ligand. And the study also um, was uh, conduct uh, also in uh, emission, and uh, this uh, fluorescence emission increases uh, when the magnesium uh, add, added, uh, add, uh, with, when uh, the addition of uh, this uh, uh, metal. So in this last uh, uh, slide, uh, we can see that uh, L7, with, uh, in which uh, we have these uh, HBO fluorophores, we all uh, um, all uh, RE metals or rare metal ions uh, tested 
uh, exhibited this uh, fluorescent uh, quenching, uh, except for yttrium and cerium. In fact, cerium uh, causes this uh, uh, quenching, but uh, at uh, 0.5 uh, at uh, 0.5 equivalent, but uh, at one equivalent, we have this uh, increase of fluorescence intensity. And uh, to better understand this, uh, this trend, uh, we uh, also perform a titration with the serum, and we can see that uh, this uh, uh, fluorescence intensity uh, decreases up to 0.5 equivalent, but we have this linear increase uh, uh, after uh, the addition of serum uh, uh, after 0 0.5 uh, equivalent. So that's all. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, the attention. Thank you, Erika. I would like to introduce uh, the Giorgia Rivera. Good afternoon, everybody. Today, I will uh, briefly explain to you my PhD project, which is in the second year of uh, its development. And um, my project is about uh, toxic dinophysi species in aquaculture sites in the northwestern of the Adriatic Sea. And uh, so, to introduce the problem, uh, dinophysi is one example of toxic phytoplankton. So, uh, these natural occurring species of phytoplankton that can produce biotoxins and um, and so cause uh, different kinds of problems to the activities or human people in general. And uh, in particular, we focus on dinophysis because uh, it's present in the Adriatic Sea and the, um, the contamination from its toxins have been known since uh, 1989 and they can uh, cause uh, some symptoms in humans called uh, the diuretic shellfish poisoning. So the, when the accumulation in the muscles exceeds the regulatory limit, uh, this causes uh, the closure of the activity. So, of course, it's a problem for uh, all the stakeholders involved. So, uh, to attack this problem, we studied uh, the area in front of Emilia-Romagna region and Pesaro. So, we chose uh, 18 uh, shellfish areas and then two sampling points in front of uh, the coast of Pesaro. And from them, we collected the time series data from 1999 to 2022. And then we also tried to apply a molecular tool for the quantification of the species in the water, comparing it to the traditional molecular uh, microscopic uh, quantification. So concerning the time series data, we saw that even if today stakeholders are still um, complaining about this problem, it is actually a decreasing problem because uh, both the dinophysis abundances and the number of toxic events per year are decreasing. And uh, what's, is, what's interesting is that we found that the seasonalities of these two related events is actually very different because the species, the, the genus is more present during the last part of spring, while the toxic events are uh, mostly concentrating in the last, uh, in the autumn, uh, last autumn. So um, we are still trying to investigate this, uh, this, the, this thing. And uh, our best idea now is that uh, specific species of the genus are responsible for this toxicity, but we still have to work on that. And concerning the molecular protocol, I'll be, I'll, I'm going to be brief because it's the, um, the topic of my poster. So if you have any other thing to, that you want to know, you can come there and ask. But uh, briefly, we compared, as I said, the molecular, count, the molecular quantification and the microscopic count. And we saw that the molecular quantification usually is a better uh, equally or better instrument to quantify the algae in the water. So our, um, our proposal is to keep developing because this is just a preliminary result on a limited number of samples to, uh, with the objective to one day add it to the monitoring program in order to make it more uh, efficient, more quick, and more sensitive to the species. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. We start to the third year PhD student. I invite to share his presentation of uh, Galdi Giovanni. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm sharing my screen. Can you see it? We have very, very. 
We don't hear. Can you can you hear me? Yes, a little bit slow. Okay, well, um, thank you, thank you very much. Thanks for to the organ to the organization for this meeting. Um, uh, first of all, I, I apologize. I couldn't uh, attend this meeting in person. Uh, that's really unfortunate. And thank you to all the speakers and all the, the students that shared with us the, uh, their research. Uh, so I'm um, a PhD student in the RMS program. My supervisor is uh, Professor Vincenzo Fano, and I'm um, a part of the Synergia Research Group. So I would like to thank all the people working on uh, on our um, huge areas of issues, philosophical issues, mainly in the philosophy of science. Mm, the main uh, uh, leading question I'm working on are concerned with uh, scientific understanding, scientific realism, and mainly the epistemology of data science. And so uh, the three main questions are, what is scientific understanding? So what does it mean? What, what is it to understand in a scientific way, a model, a theory, a phenomena? And what are the realist issues concerning scientific understanding? And what is an epistemology of data science and why it is relevant in this area of study? Scientific understanding has um, a recent uh, um, development in the literature, and we can find two main families of theories about scientific understanding. The one is the reductionists, and they uh, claim that scientific understanding is conceived as a kind of knowledge of causes. And the other family are composed by pragmatists, and they uh, propose that scientific understanding is conceived as an ability uh, in a practical way. And they um, are committed to the idea that, that the aim of science on a normative level is to understand, namely, uh, to understand phenomena, model, and theories. And so we have uh, two main assumptions leading their research program. The one for the reductionist is that scientific understanding of a phenomena entails realist standards about this specific phenomena. And scientific understanding as a kind of knowledge leads to successful theories, models, or claims about this phenomena in question in virtue of the theories, the models, the claims being partially or approximately true. Um, while the pragmatist assumption uh, on the other side is that scientific understanding of a phenomenon can be decoupled from the realist standards about that phenomenon. And in, in that way, scientific understanding as a kind of ability leads to successful theories, models, and claims about that phenomenon from which scientists gain scientific understanding, but not in virtue of their being partially and approximately true, but due to the ability scientists must have to manipulate them in order to extract scientific understanding. In this year, I focused mainly on two kinds of uh, neural network models. Uh, one is the alpha fold two models, uh, deep learning neural network, which is um, able to predict the three-dimensional structure of proteins to great accuracy. And the, the other models is um, in the area of uh, natural language processing, uh, in particular, word to vec uh, In the case of the deep learning uh, models, uh, we, can, we can say that it is possible to disentangle some problems about the scientific understanding and scientific realism via an epistemology of data science, and it is why it is relevant. And an epistemology, then of, uh, an epistemological foundation of data science is then required to propose coherent conceptual framework with which these issues can be uh, addressed in a rigorous way. And at the end of the uh, of, of this project, the research project, 
uh, the conclusion, uh, the tentative conclusion, uh, would be to uh, build um, uh, a third way, so an alternative to the reductionist and the pragmatist way to conceive the scientific understanding, uh, which I claim to be preferable to develop a coherent framework of scientific understanding in such contexts, so in, in the uh, mainly in the deep learning models uh, context. Thank you very much for listening and enjoy the PhD day. Thank you, Giovanni. I introduce uh, the Dr. Malinkel, Nadia. Daniele. Um, I'm uh, Nadia, uh, a PhD student in uh, formal models uh, course, uh, and I'm working uh, with uh, protist uh, resting stages uh, in uh, superficial sediments uh, of Mediterranean Sea, and uh, I am studying them through um, environmental DNA and metabarcoding. Today, I would like to start uh, introducing a little bit uh, the molecular technique. Environmental DNA is uh, all the DNA present in an environment uh, and uh, can be captured uh, through the sampling activity. Um, the samples can be taken from uh, what is called a modern environment. Uh, so samples uh, uh, will give uh, information uh, on uh, the living uh, community. While uh, if uh, we are sampling uh, cores, uh, uh, we will have uh, information also on past uh, communities, and these uh, are called ancient environment. So the deeper layers uh, correspond uh, to older um, communities. While uh, metabarcoding is uh, the technique that uh, permits uh, the multiple uh, taxonomic assignment of the target organisms in the sample. And, um, it requires uh, laboratory and uh, bioinformatic uh, steps. Uh, the application of environmental DNA metabarcoding are many. It, uh, it can be used uh, for uh, ecological uh, studies, uh, also uh, to monitoring. It can be used to study the interactions between uh, organisms and their diet. It has uh, some pros, uh, many pros, uh, because it's uh, cost-effective, uh, non-invasive. It captures uh, more diversity than the normal morphological-based approach. But uh, it also has uh, some cons uh, and uh, some biases. Uh, for example, the preferential amplification of some taxa over uh, others. And uh, I also spent some time dealing with this issue, and it's not easy. Uh, coming uh, to my project, uh, um, you can see some pictures uh, of uh, protist uh, resting stages. Uh, and uh, also in uh, the map, uh, you can see the, 90, the 94 uh, stations uh, that were sampled and uh, are all uh, around uh, the Italian Mediterranean subregions. My goals uh, are, first of all, identifying uh, the taxa of uh, protists uh, that produce resting stages. And uh, the second is uh, infer the ecological structure of these assemblages uh, in relation uh, with uh, physical and geomorphological features, uh, environmental parameters, and human activities. Uh, here are some uh, results. I investigated it uh, at uh, a high taxonomic level. And uh, what we saw is uh, that uh, Yonian has uh, different assemblages uh, from uh, the other Mediterranean subregions. Now, um, I will investigate uh, this uh, data on a lower taxonomic level, and uh, I will uh, integrate uh, them with uh, the environmental variables. Um, so, if you have any question or if you want to know more about uh, what I'm doing, I have a poster, so thank you. Thank you, Nadia. I invite to speak uh, Moroni Sofia.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sofia Moroni, a third year PhD student under the supervision of Professor Casettari. My PhD focuses on the application of 3D printing technology in the pharmaceutical field. To give you an idea about what we do, I've selected three projects. For all of them, you can find the QR code, so if you want to get access to the full publication, you can scan it. So the first project that I would like to show you aim to demonstrate the possibility of employing polyhydroxybutyrate as an alternative biopolymer for 3D printing. And this is because at the moment, one challenge in 3D printing is to find suitable but also specific material for this technology. So polyhydroxybutyrate is a thermoplastic aliphatic polyester, and thanks to its characteristics such as the biodegradability or the biocompatibility, it can be employed in the production of delivery forms specific for a prolonged drug release. As you might know, 3D printing is strongly bounded to the concept of personalization, and to explore this area, we developed intravaginal rings. Intravaginal rings at the moment are commercialized as uh, contraceptive devices, but we wanted to outline uh, the advantages of their application also as antifungal therapy. So for this purpose, we employed bifonazole or crotimazole, and we tested their efficacy against candida albicans in collaboration with the microbiology lab. The continuous evolution of 3D printing has led to the introduction of a fourth dimension. And maybe you're wondering, what's the fourth dimension? Well, it's time. So with 4D printing, we can produce dynamic objects um, using what are so-called uh, smart materials. So upon the application of an external stimulus, such as a variation in the pH or uh, in the temperature, but also in the presence of the magnetic field, the material can undergo to a change a change that can be in the size, in the shape, or in the color. So with this project, we um, produce multipurpose implants that were programmed to change the size to better fit in the tissue void of the breast that can result from the surgical removal of the tumor. So the idea was to have these multipurpose implants loaded with doxorubicin to provide anti-cancer effect without underestimating the final aesthetic outcomes. So thank you so much for your attention. I'm here all day. Uh, if you want to come to visit us, we are in the School of Pharmacy, so you're more than welcome to see what we do. Thank you, Sofia. I invite to speak the next speaker, Veni Alessio. So, uh, sorry, thank you uh, to be here. I'm uh, Rainer Alessio, third year PhD student at uh, University of Urbina. Uh, we're gonna talk about organic synthesis. So a briefly introduction to organic chemistry, essentially is a field divided broadly into main parts. One is metallurgy, that is uh, focused on the development of new reactions. The other one is organic synthesis. So it's uh, taking that direction and makes molecules. Uh, more in details, we're going to talk about organic synthesis applied to natural product synthesis. So, um, why natural product synthesis? Um, this field is really important for different aspects. I just selected uh, three of them in these slides. Uh, the first one is structuralization. Sometimes when uh, a new molecule has been discovered in nature, it's kind of tricky to determine exactly the structure of it. So, uh, using total synthesis, you're able to identify in an accurate way uh, that molecule. Another important application is to uh, have ac uh, access to a large quantity of these molecules. And uh, this is an example of Pacletax cell, also known as a taxol. And uh, using total synthesis, we were able to make all biological uh, analysis to bring in the, in the market the famous drug. And um, least, but not, uh, for last but not least, uh, the we are also able to modify selectively one part of the molecule, changing a bit the, the root of total synthesis. So uh, let's uh, go into Urbino Lab. We are focused on synthesis of this family of uh, alkaloids. They are really uh, famous ones. They are really correlated to human history from centuries. You can imagine this molecule uh, was the cause of St. Anthony's fire on the Middle Age. 
but also in the more recent time, uh, when this guy, uh, Albert Hoffman, synthesized for the first time LSD, this is a member of, of this family. Um, this interesting story about this guy. Uh, the first time he synthesized this molecule, uh, it was used to go home, uh, go to the work, go back home by bicycle. He synthesized LSD and, and uh, one drop, uh, from some case, touched his skin, touched his skin. And uh, the way back was really tricky and a really fantasy one, uh, <laughs> showing the particular effect of this molecule and also the bioactive uh, properties of it. And uh, after uh, this uh, event, there was a really la uh, large uh, investigation about this molecule that brought some uh, really important drugs on market. For example, treatment of really important diseases, uh, migraine, depression, and so on and so on. There is also a huge problem of the abuse, but this is uh, another argument. So uh, making a long story short, this is uh, what we've done on uh, one of our projects. Essentially, we synthesized uh, in an entropy way, these molecules here. There are like, we made some biological studies here, so they're really interesting properties of on the uh, binding and also activity in the serotoninergic receptors. And um, yeah, yeah, with this study, we saw that uh, in entropy synthesis of this molecule, also the possible characterization, diversification, they're really interesting tools for fight different important diseases, in this case. Um, I mean, this is a very preliminary study, but just for show you uh, how it's important this kind of field. So after that, I want to thank you all and also my lab. And if you have any question, please reach me on the, on the post of the session. I will be more happy than nicer. Thank you, Alessio. I invite uh, to speak uh, Sufyan Mohamed. Thank you, Daniele. Hello, everyone. I am Muhammad Sufyan. I am a PhD student in uh, formal models and data analysis in Ramist. And uh, today I am going to introduce you with uh, our solution for a problem in artificial intelligence that is a black box. So let's go into the deep. So actually, in, uh, in the field of uh, artificial intelligence, it's actually revolutionizing all the aspects of our lives uh, in medical, healthcare, in finance, in uh, transportation, and beyond. So the problem is whenever humans interact with such artificial intelligence-based technologies, so the problem is these type of systems are so complex and they come up with some solution or decision that is not uh, interpretable for a general audience or you can say for humans, a common human person. So uh, whenever artificial intelligence based systems are deployed in the market, in the industry, the problem is how the user will interact with them and uh, if such systems are deployed in, in critical systems, for example, in judiciary, in healthcare. So the problem is, uh, whenever such systems will make decisions, so the problem is the human will not understand and can ask how such systems are coming up with this decision. So the system is, as a whole is a black box. So our this is a real problem in the field of artificial intelligence. So we are uh, solving, we are going to solve uh, with our, our strategy and there are a number of types of uh, approaches that actually provide explanations for the underlying such complex systems. So um, the other problem that we are going to handle is the human centered or we can say human in the loop. So whenever such systems are, uh, are going to deploy, the humans can converse can talk with such systems and can understand, can learn, can interpret easily how the underlying artificial intelligence based system is working. So our strategy is actually falls in one of the type of explanations that is counterfactual explanation. So that is actually, uh, a counterfactual explanation is actually uh, one type of explanation where uh, we actually provide a solution to the human user that if 
you can make some changes or if you have used different type of input probably you can get your desired decision or you can get your desired outcome so this strategy has been uh, developed with by by different researchers and there are a number of uh, approaches and methods available as a utility you can use everyone can use but the problem is these utilities are very technical again the problem of black box is solved with another black box so uh, we come up with the human centered approach that humans can interact can provide an input and at the same time they can interact and can learn from that system so our approach is making the human at the core so the human can interact and can understand the different underlying models this is a one type of interpretable system so the audience can understand so just just taking one example uh, for example you are going to apply a loan uh, i don't i hope that you go to apply for a loan but uh, for example you apply and the online system of the bank just reject your loan so you are in a situation that why this system has rejected for me so you want to know underlying mechanism so our approach if our approach is there to explain that model you can easily get some hints you can easily get some type a sort of interpretation that uh, how the underlying complex network or you can say neuron based neural network based system is working so i'm just going to uh, just shortly discussing uh, architecture because we i don't have time so uh, the idea is very simple you can easily understand with this diagram that on the very right the human is there can interact with our method and the method is a black box so you can get easily uh, integrated with it uh, you can talk i mean you can interact with this and you can customize your explanations for yourself with yourself so the idea is this one and uh, just uh, some results a uh, one minute results uh, because these were the most simple to interpret so that's why uh, we, we we evaluated our approach on six evaluation matrix so these are here and our approach has produced promising results and actually outperformed one of the benchmarking method so that's all and you are invited to our poster so there is also qr code and you can directly go on the web page of our work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mohamed. Uh, I invite the last uh, speaker of this uh, department, uh, Davide Torre. Okay. Thank you, Daniele, for the introduction. Uh, hi. To all uh, and uh, I am a, I am David, a PhD student of the uh, Earth Science, and uh, I will present to you my research that focus on the uh, geomorph role of the geomorphological assessment uh, on coastal slope instabilities. Um, um, coastal slopes and in particular rocky coasts are 80% uh, of the coast costs worldwide 50% uh, of the mediterranean coast uh, and uh, have high economic social cultural and touristic values uh, in the northern part of the uh, marke region we have uh, a great opportunity for uh, better, better understanding the the dynamics at work in this uh, type of environment uh, we have the Monte Conero uh, near Ancona and the Monte San Bartolo uh, near Pesaro study areas uh, with different types of rocks uh, and consequently different types of uh, evolution. Uh, this is one example on the Monte San Bartolo uh, with a, a geomorphological uh, map. Uh, reporting all the uh, landslide areas, deposits, and all uh, the processes active and inactive um, on the coastal slope. Uh, we compare uh, this uh, map with, uh, with a um, special analysis on ArcGIS environment 
um, com comparing two parameters, the slope gradient and the roughness index of the landforms. And uh, through this uh, relationship, we were able to uh, distinguish, uh, to determine the um, landslide areas, uh, distinguishing uh, between landslide areas, non-landslide areas, and detachment areas. This is a drone photo uh, of the coastal slope of the Monte San Bartolo, and uh, there is a useful platform uh, for uh, the study of this type of environment. Uh, on the Monte Conero, uh, this is a, a similar uh, technique, a similar study, uh, but uh, in this case, uh, we were able to uh, also determine uh, the, um, the range uh, in which the uh, large landslide Porto Novo uh, event uh, occurred. Um, namely uh, between uh, 60 and 25,000 uh, years ago. This is another ex ex example, uh, another photos uh, on the Due Sorelle uh, coastal uh, slope, uh, Due Sorelle beach at the Monte Conero, uh, in which uh, uh, many people every day are brought uh, in and taken out uh, in the evening, and uh, this is a factor that uh, increases the risk uh, here. So in conclusion, in conclusion uh, there is a lot of work uh, to be done. Uh, all these things clearly for, the, um, for, the, for a correct uh, assessment of the natural risk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Davide. Well, I'd like to thank all the PhD students from the Research Method in Science and Technology PhD course, and uh, Daniele to you too, who you, you served as chair today, so thank you very much. Um, we are now ready to move on to the last PhD course of our university, which is the PhD course in Humanities. I invite here Francesco Parente, who will serve as chair for this session, Thank you very much, Francesco. Okay, can you hear me? Maybe too close. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for attending uh, this. Thank you, this fantastic event. I kindly ask to Emiliano Vargas to come here and be first to present for the Humanities PhD program. Welcoming with an applause. Okay, good afternoon to everyone. My name is Emiliano. I'm from the first year of the PhD. And my work uh, for the moment is called on the cultural media coevolution of contemporary black music semiosphere human-machine interaction in specific environments. Uh, okay. The work aimed to investigate contemporary cultural forms in the context of black music culture in digital era. We understand black uh, music culture as a uh, diasporic phenomena based on the study of social uses and practice of media platforms and generative model of artificial intelligence applied to music in virtual environments and your urban music circuits, starting from the notion of affordance as an operative category of the socio-semiotics of mediatizations, musicology, ethnomusicology, and popular music studies. The, the works aim to understand how digital mediatizations affect the forms of life of popular music in the present moment. For the one hand, it is online dimension, for example, through the creation of virtual communities with specific features and or the social representations circulating about this phenomena. For the other hand, in its offline and online interactions, 
That is to say, in terms of the process that impact on the improvisation, composition, and performance triad due to the increasing influence of the digital culture in everyday life. The proposed work is based on a review and operation, operational update of the concept of affordance and a description of the ways in which these elements operate in one, virtual and non-virtual communities of users and musicians, starting with an analysis of media platforms for music consumption, for example, Spotify. The next month, for example, will be published the first uh, article of this re research that focuses on how the uses of certain Spotify technical device affects the music production in a specific circuit of jam sessions. And two, human-machine interaction with artificial intelligence applied to music. We refer specifically to the study of generative models uh, of high-fidelity music, specifically uh, music LE, that is um, an artificial intelligence developed by Google, and Bebop net models. In summary, the research is based on understanding the traits that characterize the co-evolutionary link between culture and media in the synchronic current moment, focus, focusing on interactive features in environments related, related to music production, circulation, and fruition. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emiliano, for being in time. Now I kindly ask to uh, Ambar Saud to come here and present his research. Thank you, Saud. very much all of you, including our professor, Professor Fabio, our chairman, Giovanni, and my other colleagues, including you all. So my topic is user engagement with Facebook reaction during COVID-19 in India. So my, <coughs> the PhD uh, is related to user engagement with Facebook reaction during COVID-19 in India. So basically I introduce myself, okay, I am South Anwar from India. Right now I am studying in the Urbino University in second year. Okay. Are you okay? So what happened in the COVID-19, we all have uh, faced too much problem regarding identity and India, we have faced too much problem. And what happened during the period of uh, COVID? We have laser period, we have sat down, and we use Facebook and Facebook and other social networking site. We have known that during the period of COVID, the Facebook and other social networking site become popular and getting more popular day by day. And India is, you know, very large country and mass user is already there and is still going up. So we have known that uh, February 1916, Facebook launched the reaction a reaction is nothing, it's just like a symbolic aspect of emojis. And these emojis are the nothing but the extension of like button. And the, when we have the interact with any post, what's the post? Post is nothing just like a picture, something like news and something like that. So when we are going to interact with the Facebook post, we, we put one click and one click is uprise into five, 
five extension of like button which is which are the love ha ha wow sad and angry duration uh, during the period of covid we have divided into two main period which are the lockdown in india which are march march 2022 to february 2021 it's the first phase of covid and second phase of covid is the march 2021 and first week of april 2021 so here we will find the many post okay and we have to divide into sub categories and these are around five political news with covid 19 far right and extreme parties racism hate speech and covid 19 health and health related advisory with covid-19 psychological and emotional post with covid-19 and business customer and engagement because at that period we have found that there's a lot of things happen including marketing fake news and something like far right and some okay so how can we get data the research methodology is there crowd tangle you have seen and you know very well it is a tool is related to the <coughs> meta and we have to extract the data region is already known is india and the language is specify that is uh, english okay india is a vast country having many language but we have to take only english language numerous uh, type of studies has been already done and on the base of we have to do uh, we have to interpret uh, the post and uh, categorize in the same one and six uh, six uh, six categories and we have to do uh, something like quantitative analysis and statistics tools we are going to use and analysis is carried out by the uh, capturing the sum calculation variable and data set and these are the few which are the special reactions are revealed by each post proportion of each special reaction received by each post and the intensity of a special reaction uh, received by each post the valence of each post and the popularity score of each post Okay. Yeah, I am going to summarize. Okay, what we will have? Okay, the problem is there. The complex uh, relationship between Facebook, uh, face, uh, complex uh, relationship between COVID-19 reaction and emotions, understanding of Facebook reaction as expression, and political news mainly during the period of uh, COVID phase one and phase two, and including the other area. and evaluating how positive versus negative on the facebook special reaction that mainly categorized into two sad and angry and negative versus positive which is the haha and wow and there's the haha and wow are the classified something like ambiguity also and love is always considered as a positive reaction so thank you very much all of you thank you saud now i ask to my dear colleague nicolo sirleto to come here thank you Hello everyone my name is Nicolò Sirleto and my project is Climate Change Skeptics a study on the online narratives in the Italian context This study aims to analyze skeptical narratives towards climate change in the Italian online context testing the categories found in literature The term climate change skeptic serves as an umbrella term for individual expressing doubt about anthropogenic causality of the current climate crisis unlike the term denialist which carries an ethical connotation 
Skeptics is a self-descriptive name chosen by these actors by themselves. Skepticism is linked to a matter of social division of labor, where scientists are no longer seen as separate from politics. In the literature, there are various categorizations of skepticism toward climate change, but they can be attributed to three types of doubt. Doubt regarding the reality of climate change, doubt about the urgency, and doubt about the credential of a climate scientist. Here are my starting uh, hypothesis. Not all skeptics are manipulated by malevolent, malevolent actors. Some of them seek information, but have a distrust in science. And this is my goal. Um, which issue and topics uh, can we find in the online context? And those contexts, uh, how can be placed on the spectrum of position uh, towards climate change? Then, who are the claim makers, uh, the actors spreading the content, and the actors referred to? Which are the motivation of skeptics? And uh, most important, what is the attitude uh, towards science from skeptics? To reach such an objective, uh, I made a preliminary explore explorative phase using uh, Facebook. Uh, selecting news concerning the topics of climate change and ecological transition, uh, selected from six Italian fact-checking check sites. Then uh, uh, I formulated queries from uh, news-related keywords with CrowdTangle and created a list with Facebook pages and groups that publish or share fake climate news or uninformative content. Then, uh, it's still ongoing, a uh, covered ethnographic observation period on those group pages that uh, have shared the most content about uh, uh, climate misinformation. And uh, are scheduled some interviews on the uh, um, administrators of those pages. Here are some preliminary results. There is a discussion and debate uh, on the online platform. Uh, user share experience, information, and share in-depth analysis. Certain skeptic groups avoid conspiracy theory label and present scientific evidence to support the, their arguments. And there is also a complex interplay between skepticism and the scientific community. And this is much interest. And thank you for the attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicolò. I already see Camilla Folena coming here. Welcome her with an applause. Okay. Yes? Okay. The floor okay. is yours. Hello, everybody, and good afternoon. My name is Camilla Folena. I'm a third year PhD candidate uh, in humanities, uh, specifically sociology of culture and communication. Uh, the topic of my research, uh, uh, of the research I'm brought here today, concerned the invisibility and marginal marginalization of women in digital, uh, in digital news models, uh, specifically observed during the um, uh, uh, reporting of the russian ukraine conflict. Um, in fact, it's widely addressed by the literature that um, there is an unfulfilled expectation of increased spaces of freedom for women in the digital public space. And uh, in fact, literature on the other side uh, highlighted how uh, digital ecosystems rather tend to reproduce and normalize um, pre-existing uh, relation of power uh, inside the society. So moreover, in the, in the specific context of war, mm, the literature indicates also how the, um, the woman appears to be uh, usually um, represented in an opportunistic and rhetoric way with the aim of supporting, uh, building the support, the military support from a side or another of the, uh, of the conflict. So the study uh, that I presented here um, took place on Google News 
uh, with Mixed Method, we collected 4,600 of headlines and leads um, uh, from the conflict uh, reporting from an East Russian perspective, so from five states, Georgia, Italy, Poland, Serbia, and Turkey. Uh, the results um, um, fr from, the, from a content and discursive analysis show, firstly, an over, uh, overall limited presence uh, of women in the whole corpus, equal to 4.46% of the whole corpus, so pretty narrow. And uh, then, uh, from a qualitative point of view of the analysis, what emerged is like is there, there is a wom uh, big woman representation uh, on the, on the political and institutional figures. And then we have uh, an interesting part of narratives, stereotyped um, stereotyped narrative um, uh, representing women as mother victims, elderly women, girls, and then we have a little limited uh, number um, uh, of representation which talk about women in terms of professional or authors or expert that commenting the war. Uh, so the recurrent, what, what, what we can say about the, the research briefly is that the recurrent qu uh, qualities that emerge in narrating women during the conflict in media discourse are emphasizing fundamentally the humanitarian action uh, of women, uh, the, the, uh, the human attention that woman has toward the, the other, but especially even if it's the enemy. For example, there are some news talking us about um, an Ukrainian woman which feeds and helps uh, a Russian soldier. Uh, so this is the, the role of caregiver is always like a stereotype and narrative that emerged a lot. Then there is this frame continuously of fragility and delicacy, so this protecting scenario. scenario. From another side, the interesting thing is that the, the only different role that emerged is the role of Ursula von der Leyen in the, in the, uh, in the, in the narratives. The European Union seems to be, from a, from a media and sociology point of view, masculinizing itself. Uh, much more uh, in, uh, in comparison to its relation to USA, which is usually in the literature the counterpart, uh, the masculinized counterpart. Uh, so from the other side, the last, uh, the last one, uh, the last figures that emerge um, are um, the first lady of, uh, for example, Zelensky, the spokesperson of, of Federation of Russia and and, Federation, and USA, and they appear to be just functional to the to the to the discourse. So just to reaffirm the the ideologies and the opposition, the opposition opposing position of, in the conflict. So uh, this is just a part of my PhD uh, dissertation. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much, Camilla. Now I ask to Irene Bianchi to come here and present a recently discussed PhD thesis. Welcome her with an applause. Good afternoon to everyone. As Francesco just said, uh, I recently discussed uh, my PhD dissertation entitled Images and Functions of the Feminine in Archaic and Classical Greek Lyric Poetry. Women's studies have witnessed a significant increase in interest among scholars, especially since the second half of the past century, mainly because of the expansion of feminist ideas among scholars. Many publications appeared during these years, explored the condition of women on a chronological basis and on a thematic basis, with a focus on themes such as law, marriage, children, abortion, property, dowries, and occupations. In most cases, they did it by analyzing female literary representations, mainly derived from epos and dramatic productions. As you can see, there is a gap in the literature. Greek lyric poetry has really been considered a primary source for the social historian. Generally speaking, there are few cases in which female representation in Greek lyrics sparked the interest of the scholars. So, the purpose of this dissertation is to analyze how women were represented in archaic and classical Greek lyric from the 7th to the 5th century BCE, ranging from authors to Alkman and Pin, Alkman to Pindar and Bacchylides, this dissertation aims to show how the representation of women varied across poetic genres and their different contexts of execution. 
Although literary representations by male authors are inevitably biased, the sources are always analyzed, taking into account their level of reliability and representativeness in order to see what the conceptions of women were. As far as the method is concerned, all the relevant fragments somehow connected to a female presence have been collected. Within this group, it has been possible to identify nine categories, arranged according to a quantitative principle, from the most recurring to the least common. And these categories are, as you can see, women and rights, mulieres loquentes, that is, speaking women, beloved women, mothers, wives, women for male pleasure, evil women, daughters, and mirror women. As you can see, some of these categories are related to stages in a woman's life, as in the case of daughters, wives and mothers, while other categories are original, as in the case of mirror women, that, that is, uh, women mentioned as a, a foil for a man's qualities or weaknesses. Most of the categories are further divided into three sections devoted to female deities, mythical heroines, and mortal women. Each fragment is commented on from a literary, philological, and stylistic point of view. Since Greek lyric cannot be confined into sections, cross-references provide the reader with connections between the categories investigated. Even though the interest in female characters varies from one author to another, Greek lyric poetry displays a great variety of characters. Since many poetic genres are involved, it is impossible to get a homogeneous image of women. A possible common thread that runs through these different categories may be identified in the political dimension that is to be intended as a generic involvement of women in the life of the city, the polis, not as an involvement in the decision-making process. Thank you for your kind attention. So, last but not least, uh, let's welcome Lorenzo Pizzoli, which has, Irene has just graduated. Thank you. Good evening, uh, everyone. As Francesco just remember, I've recently discussed my PhD dissertation that focused on a new edition of the minor Homeric hymns. Now, the Homeric hymns are 33 axiometric poems that are attributed to Homer and addressing the Olympian gods, narrating generally their deeds and mythology. Despite this unifying definition, there are still some elements that are up for debate. Their genre, for example, is difficult to ascertain, being a mixture of epic and religious poetry, and their reception is problematic as well, as they have been largely neglected throughout all antiquity. In order to try and provide an answer to these questions, I have decided to focus on a new edition, um, a new Italian edition, um, 50 years after the last Italian one curated by Castellan in 1975. In the introduction, I've decided to focus on key aspects, such as terminology, genre, performance, use history, and reception. The text and translation then follows, and a commentary um, that focuses on dating and localizing the text, as well as analyzing the inlink devices, rhapsodic language, and the, the phenomenon of genre hybridization. I have tried to take on um, a new, um, to innovate on the Parian approach that dominated uh, last century scholarly debate, in order to show that the Homeric hymns are not just a mere byproduct of the Greek epic, nor are they aesthetically inferior to the Iliad and the Odyssey, which are, of course, more well known. Now, as for the results, um, paradoxically, modern scholars consider today the Homeric hymns to be neither hymns nor Homeric. Um, going against this approach, I've decided to take a look at the sources and try to understand what the ancient actually believed in these regards. So as for the genre, we have said that, the, um, that modern scholars do not think of the Homeric hymns as hymn in a strict sense. But if we take a closer look to ancient testimonies, their nature does in fact perfectly align with ancient definition of the hymnic genre. As for the authorship, they were actually considered um, generally Homeric, and it is precisely this authorship that um, was considered to be true from classical to the Byzantine era that made them uh, survive throughout the centuries. Um, as for the um, date and localization and the performance issues of the text, 
um, I've tried to take on an anti-Panhellenic approach uh, that is reevaluating uh, re the local tradition and cults that are attested in the hymns. And the results are summarized in the graph that you see here. Um, the Omer hymns seems to have been composed in a long time span, ranging from the 6th century to the 3rd century BCE, not only in mainland Greece, but also in the Aegean Islands and in Asia Minor, and have probably been written for both secular and religious use. In conclusion, uh, the Omeric hymn seems to be a lively and complex phenomenon that is definitely deserving of more attention. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, well, I would really like to thank all the PhD students who have participated in this session. It has been really interesting to get a glimpse of the diversity of all the research that are conducted in our university. So really, thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, before we close, I would like to thank the technical, um, uh, all the technical staff, Luca Polidori, Fabio Marangoni, for the excellent job for live streaming on YouTube. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. I would like to thank Nadia Bocancelli, Esther D'Amigo, and Sofia Fiorentini for the streaming through social networks. And Diego Gabellini for the photo reportage of the event. And of course, thank you all for being here today. Thank you. Well, um, it's now time to socialize, and uh, we can do this through the poster session, which is uh, outside. And also, we will have the opportunity to uh, share an aperitif through the poster session, and uh, which has been organized according to the sustainability guidelines of our university. So thank you very much. And maybe I'll see you next year.